Preface of Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds by Charles Mackay. Volume 1. Preface. In reading the history of nations, we find that, like individuals, they have their whims and peculiarities, their seasons of excitement and recklessness, when they care not what they do. We find that whole communities suddenly fix their mind upon one object, and go mad in its pursuit, that millions of people become simultaneously impressed with one delusion, and run after it, till their attention is caught by some new folly, more captivating than the first. We see one nation suddenly seized, from its highest to its lowest members, with a fierce desire of military glory, another as suddenly becomes crazed upon a religious scruple, and neither of them recovering its senses until it has shed rivers of blood, and sowed a harvest of groans and tears, to be reaped by its posterity. At an early age in the annals of Europe its population lost their wits about the sepulchre of Jesus, and crowded in frenzied multitudes to the Holy Land. Another age went mad for the fear of the devil, and offered up hundreds of thousands of victims to the delusion of witchcraft. At another time, the many became crazed on the subject of the philosopher's stone, and committed follies till then unheard of in the pursuit. It was once thought a venial offence, in very many countries of Europe, to destroy an enemy by slow poison. Persons who would have revolted at the idea of stabbing a man to the heart, drugged his pottage without scruple. Ladies of gentle birth and manners caught the contagion of murder, until poisoning under their auspices became quite fashionable. Some delusions, though notorious to all the world, have subsisted for ages, flourishing as widely among civilized and polished nations as among the early barbarians with whom they originated, that of dueling, for instance, and the belief in omens and divination of the future, which seemed to defy the progress of knowledge to eradicate them entirely from the popular mind. Money, again, has often been a cause of the delusion of multitudes. Sober nations have all at once become desperate gamblers, and risked almost their existence upon the turn of a piece of paper. To trace the history of the most prominent of these delusions is the object of the present pages. Men, it has been well said, think in herds. It will be seen that they go mad in herds, while they only recover their senses slowly, and one by one. Some of the subjects introduced may be familiar to the reader but the author hopes that sufficient novelty of detail will be found even in these, to render them acceptable, while they could not be wholly omitted in justice to the subject of which it was proposed to treat. The memoirs of the South Sea Madness and the Mississippi Delusion are more complete and copious than are to be found elsewhere, and the same may be said of the history of the witch-mania, which contains an account of its terrific progress in Germany, a part of the subject which has been left comparatively untouched by Sir Walter Scott, in his Letters on Demonology and Witchcraft, the most important that have yet appeared on this fearful but most interesting subject. Popular delusions began so early, spread so widely, and have lasted so long, that instead of two or three volumes, fifty would scarcely suffice to detail their history. The present may be considered more of a miscellany of delusions than a history, a chapter only in the great and awful book of human folly which yet remains to be written, in which Porson once jestingly said he would write in five hundred volumes. Interspersed are sketches of some lighter matters, amusing instances of imitativeness and wrong-headedness of the people, rather than examples of folly and delusion. Religious matters have been purposely excluded as incompatible with the limits prescribed to the present work. A mere list of them would alone be sufficient to occupy a volume. End of Preface Chapter 1, Part 1 of Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds by Charles Mackay, Volume 1. Chapter 1, Money Mania. THE MISSISSIPPI SCHEME PART One. Some in clandestine companies combine, Erect new stocks to trade beyond the line, With air and empty names beguile the town, And raise new credits first, then cry em down. 
divide the empty nothing into shares, and set the crowd together by the ears. Defoe The personal character and career of one man are so intimately connected with the great scheme of the years 1719 and 1720 that a history of the Mississippi madness can have no fitter introduction than a sketch of the life of its great author, John Law. Historians are divided in opinion as to whether they should designate him a knave or a madman. Both epithets were unsparingly applied to him in his lifetime, and while the unhappy consequences of his projects were still deeply felt. Posterity, however, has found reason to doubt the justice of the accusation, and to confess that John Law was neither knave nor madman, but one more deceived than deceiving, more sinned against than sinning. He was thoroughly acquainted with the philosophy and true principles of credit. He understood the monetary question better than any man of his day, and if his system fell with a crash so tremendous, it was not so much his fault as that of the people amongst whom he had erected it. He did not calculate upon the avaricious frenzy of a whole nation. He did not see that confidence, like mistrust, could be increased almost ad infinitum, and that hope was as extravagant as fear. How was he to foretell that the French people, like the man in the fable, would kill, in their frantic eagerness, the fine goose he had brought to lay them so many golden eggs? His fate was like that which may be supposed to have overtaken the first adventurous boatman who rowed from Erie to Ontario. Broad and smooth was the river on which he embarked, rapid and pleasant was his progress, and who was to stay him in his career. Alas for him, the cataract was nigh. He saw, when it was too late, that the tide which wafted him so joyously along was a tide of destruction, and when he endeavoured to retrace his way, he found that the current was too strong for his weak efforts to stem, and that he drew nearer every instant to the tremendous falls. Down he went over the sharp rocks, and the waters with him. He was dashed to pieces with his bark, but the waters, maddened and turned to foam by the rough descent, only boiled and bubbled for a time, and then flowed on again as smoothly as ever. Just so it was with Law and the French people. He was the boatman, and they were the waters. John Law was born at Edinburgh in the year 1671. His father was the younger son of an ancient family in Fife, and carried on the business of a goldsmith and banker. He amassed considerable wealth in his trade, sufficient to enable him to gratify the wish, so common among his countrymen, of adding a territorial designation to his name. He purchased with this view the estates of Lauriston and Randleston, on the Frith of Forth, on the borders of West and Midlothian, and was thenceforth known as Law of Lauriston. The subject of our memoir, being the eldest son, was received into his father's counting-house at the age of fourteen, and for three years laboured hard to inquire an insight into the principles of banking as then carried on in Scotland. He had always manifested great love for the study of numbers, and his proficiency in the mathematics was considered extraordinary in one of his tender years. At the age of seventeen he was tall, strong, and well made, and his face, although deeply scarred with the smallpox, was agreeable in its expression, and full of intelligence. At this time he began to neglect his business, and becoming vain of his person, indulged in considerable extravagance of attire. He was a great favourite with the ladies, by whom he was called Beau Law, while the other sex, despising his foppery, nicknamed him Jessamy John. At the death of his father, which happened in 1688, he withdrew entirely from the desk, which had become so irksome, and being possessed of the revenues of the paternal estate of Lauriston, he proceeded to London to see the world. He was now very young, very vain, good-looking, tolerably rich, and quite uncontrolled. It is no wonder that, on his arrival in the capital, he should launch into extravagance. He soon became a regular frequenter of the gaming-houses, and by pursuing a certain plan, based upon some abstruse calculation of chances, he contrived to gain considerable sums. All the gamblers envied him his luck, and many made it a point to watch his play, and stake their money on the same chances. In affairs of gallantry he was equally fortunate. Ladies of the first rank smiled graciously upon the handsome Scotchman, the young, the rich, the witty, and the obliging. But all these successes only paved the way for reverses. 
after he had been for nine years exposed to the dangerous attractions of the gay life he was leading he became an irrecoverable gambler as his love of play increased in violence it diminished in prudence great losses were only to be repaired by still greater ventures and one unhappy day he lost more than he could repay without mortgaging his family's estate to that step he was driven at last at the same time his gallantry brought him into trouble a love affair or slight flirtation with a lady of the name of villiers note one miss elizabeth villiers afterwards countess of orkney exposed him to the resentment of a mr wilson by whom he was challenged to fight a duel law accepted and had the ill fortune to shoot his antagonist dead upon the spot he was arrested the same day and brought to trial for murder by the relatives of mr wilson he was afterwards found guilty and sentenced to death the sentence was commuted to a fine upon the ground that the offence only amounted to manslaughter an appeal being lodged by a brother of the deceased law was detained in the king's bench whence by some means or other which he never explained he contrived to escape and an action being instituted against the sheriffs he was advertised in the gazette and a reward offered for his apprehension he was described as captain john law a scotchman aged twenty-six a very tall black lean man well shaped above six feet high with large pock-holes in his face big-nosed and a speaking broad and loud as this was rather a caricature than a description of him, it has been supposed that it was drawn up with a view to favor his escape. He succeeded in reaching the continent, where he traveled for three years, and devoted much of his attention to the monetary and banking affairs of the countries through which he passed. He stayed a few months in Amsterdam, and speculated to some extent in the funds. His mornings were devoted to the study of finance and the principles of trade, and his evenings to the gaming-house it is generally believed that he returned to edinburgh in the year seventeen hundred it is certain that he published in that city his proposals and reasons for constituting a council of trade this pamphlet did not excite much attention in a short time afterwards he published a project for establishing what he called a land bank note two the wits of the day called it a sand bank which would wreck the vessel of the state the notes issued by which were never to exceed the value of the entire lands of the state upon ordinary interest or were to be equal in value to the land with the right to enter into possession at a certain time the project excited a good deal of discussion in the scottish parliament and a motion for the establishment of such a bank was brought forward by a neutral party called the squadron whom law had interested in his favour the parliament ultimately passed a resolution to the effect that to establish any kind of paper credit so as to force it to pass was an improper expedient for the nation upon the failure of this project and of his efforts to procure a pardon for the murder of mr wilson law withdrew to the continent and resumed his old habits of gaming for fourteen years he continued to roam about in flanders holland germany hungary italy and france he soon became intimately acquainted with the extent of the trade and resources of each and daily more confirmed in his opinion that no country could prosper without a paper currency during the whole of this time he appeared to have chiefly supported himself by successful play at every gambling-house of note in the capitals of europe he was known and appreciated as one better skilled in the intricacies of chance than any other man of the day it is stated in the biography universelle that he was expelled first from venice and afterwards from genoa by the magistrates who thought him a visitor too dangerous for the youth of those cities during his residence in paris he rendered himself obnoxious to Darjenson, the lieutenant-general of the police by whom he was ordered to quit the capital this did not take place however before he had made the acquaintance in the saloons of the duc de vendome the prince de conti and of the gay duke of orleans the latter of whom was destined afterwards to exercise so much influence over his fate the duke of orleans was pleased with the vivacity and good sense of the scottish adventurer while the latter was no less pleased with the wit and amiability of a prince who promised to become his patron they were often thrown into each other's society and law seized every opportunity to instill his financial doctrines into the mind of one whose proximity to the throne pointed him out as destined at no very distant date to play an important role in the government 
shortly before the death of louis the fourteenth or as some say in seventeen o eight law proposed a scheme of finance to desmarais the comptroller louis is reported to have inquired whether the projector were a catholic and on being answered in the negative to have declined having anything to do with him note three this anecdote which is related in the correspondence of madame de bavière duchess of orleans and mother of the regent is discredited by lord john russell in his history of the principal states of europe from the peace of utrecht for what reason he does not inform us there is no doubt that law proposed his scheme to desmarais and that louis refused to hear of it the reason given for the refusal is quite consistent with the character of that bigoted and tyrannical monarch it was after this repulse that he visited italy his mind being still occupied with the schemes of finance he proposed to victor amadeus duke of savoy to establish his land bank in that country the duke replied that his dominions were too circumscribed for the execution of so great a project and that he was by far too poor a potentate to be ruined he advised him however to try the king of france once more for he was sure if he knew anything of the french character that the people would be delighted with a plan not only so new but so plausible louis the fourteenth died in seventeen fifteen and the heir to the throne being an infant only seven years of age the duke of orleans assumed the reins of government as regent during his minority law now found himself in a more favourable position the tide in his affairs had come which taken at the flood was to waft him on to fortune the regent was his friend already acquainted with his theory and pretensions and inclined moreover to aid him in any efforts to restore the wounded credit of france bowed down to the earth by the extravagance of the long reign of louis the fourteenth hardly was that monarch laid in his grave ere the popular hatred suppressed so long burst forth against his memory he who during his life had been flattered with an excess of adulation to which history scarcely offers a parallel was now cursed as a tyrant a bigot and a plunderer his statues were pelted and disfigured his effigies torn down amid the execrations of the populace and his name rendered synonymous with selfishness and oppression the glory of his arms was forgotten and nothing was remembered but his reverses his extravagance and his cruelty the finances of the country were in a state of the utmost disorder a profuse and corrupt monarch whose profuseness and corruption were imitated by almost every functionary from the highest to the lowest grade had brought france to the verge of ruin the national debt amounted to three thousand millions of livres the revenue to one hundred forty five millions and the expenses of government to one hundred forty two millions per annum leaving only three millions to pay the interest upon three thousand millions the first care of the regent was to discover a remedy for an evil of such magnitude and a council was early summoned to take the matter into consideration the duc de saint simon was of the opinion that nothing could save the country from a revolution but a remedy at once bold and dangerous he advised the regent to convoke the states-general and declare a national bankruptcy the duc de noyer a man of accommodating principles an accomplished courtier and totally averse from giving himself any trouble or annoyance that ingenuity could escape from opposed the project of saint simon with all his influence he represented the expedient as alike dishonest and ruinous the regent was of the same opinion and this desperate remedy fell to the ground the measures ultimately adopted though they promised fair only aggravated the evil the first and most dishonest measure was of no advantage to the state a recoinage was ordered by which the currency was depreciated one-fifth those who took a thousand pieces of gold or silver to the mint received back an amount of coin of the same nominal value but only four-fifths the weight of the metal by this contrivance the treasury gained seventy-two millions of livres and all the commercial operations of the country were disordered a trifling diminution of the taxes silenced the clamours of the people and for the slight present advantage the great prospective evil was forgotten a chamber of justice was next instituted to inquire into the malversations of the loan contractors and the farmers of the revenues tax collectors are never very popular in any country but those of france at this period deserved all the odium with which they were loaded as soon as these farmers-general 
with their hosts of subordinate agents, called maltotiers, note four, from maltot, an oppressive tax, were called to account for their misdeeds, the most extravagant joy took possession of the nation. The Chamber of Justice, instituted chiefly for this purpose, was endowed with very extensive powers. It was composed of the presidents and councils of the Parliament, the judges of the courts of aid and of requests, and the officers of the Chamber of Account, under the general presidents of the Minister of Finance. Informers were encouraged to give evidence against the offenders by the promise of one-fifth part of the fines and confiscations. A tenth of all concealed effects belonging to the guilty was promised to such as could furnish the means of discovering them. The promulgation of the edict constituting this court caused a degree of consternation among those principally concerned, which can only be accounted for on the supposition that their peculation had been enormous, but they met with no sympathy. The proceedings against them justified their terror. The Bastille was soon unable to contain the prisoners that were sent to it, and the jails all over the country teemed with guilty or suspected persons. An order was issued to all innkeepers and postmasters to refuse horses to such as endeavoured to seek safety in flight, and all persons were forbidden, under heavy fines, to harbour them or favour their evasion. Some were condemned to the pillory, others to the galleys, and the least guilty to fine and imprisonment. One only, Samuel Bernard, a rich banker and farmer-general of a province remote from the capital, was sentenced to death. So great had been the illegal profits of this man, looked upon as the tyrant and oppressor of his district, that he offered six millions of livres, or two hundred fifty thousand pounds sterling, to be allowed to escape. His bribe was refused, and he suffered the penalty of death. Others, perhaps more guilty, were more fortunate. Confiscation owing to the concealment of their treasures by the delinquents, often produced less money than a fine. The severity of the government relaxed, and fines, under the denomination of taxes, were indiscriminately levied upon all offenders, but so corrupt was every department of the administration that the country benefited but little by the sums which thus flowed into the treasury. Courtiers and courtiers' wives and mistresses came in for the chief share of the spoils. One contractor had been taxed, in proportion to his wealth and guilt, at the sum of twelve millions of livres. The Count Blank, a man of some weight in the government, called upon him, and offered to procure a remission of the fine if he would give him a hundred thousand crowns. "'Vous êtes trop tard, mon ami,' replied the financier. "'I have already made a bargain with your wife for fifty thousand. Note 5. This anecdote is related by Monsieur de la Ode in his Life of Philip of Orleans. It would have looked more authentic if he had given the names of the dishonest contractor and the still more dishonest minister, but Monsieur de la Ode's book is liable to the same objection as most of the French memoirs of that and of subsequent periods. It is sufficient with most of them that an anecdote be ben trovato. The vero is but a matter of secondary consideration." About a hundred and eighty millions of livres were levied in this manner, of which eighty were applied in payments of the debts contracted by the government. The remainder found its way into the pockets of the courtiers. Madame de Maintenon, writing on this subject, says, We hear every day of some new grant of the regent. The people murmur very much at this mode of employing the money taken from the peculators. The people, who, after the first burst of their resentment is over, generally express a sympathy for the weak, were indignant that so much severity should be used to so little purpose. They did not see the justice of robbing one set of rogues to fatten another. In a few months all the more guilty had been brought to punishment, and the Chamber of Justice looked for victims in humbler walks of life. Charges of fraud and extortion were brought against tradesmen of good character in consequence of the great inducements held out to common informers. They were compelled to lay open their affairs before this tribunal in order to establish their innocence. The voice of complaint resounded from every side, and at the expiration of a year the government found it advisable to discontinue further proceedings. The Chamber of Justice was suppressed, and a general amnesty granted to all against whom no charges had yet been preferred. In the midst of this financial confusion, law appeared upon the scene. No man felt more deeply than the regent the deplorable state of the country, but no man could be more averse from putting his shoulders manfully to the wheel. He disliked business, 
he signed official documents without proper examination, and trusted to others what he should have undertaken himself. The cares inseparable from his high office were burdensome to him. He saw that something was necessary to be done, but he lacked the energy to do it, and had not enough virtue to sacrifice his ease and his pleasures in the attempt. No wonder that, with his character, he listened favorably to the mighty projects, so easy of execution, of the clever adventurer whom he had formerly known, and whose talents he appreciated. When Law presented himself at court, he was most cordially received. He offered two memorials to the regent, in which he set forth the evils that had befallen France, owing to an insufficient currency, at different times depreciated. He asserted that a metallic currency, unaided by paper money, was wholly inadequate to the wants of a commercial country, and particularly cited the examples of Great Britain and Holland to show the advantages of paper. He used many sound arguments on the subject of credit, and proposed as a means of restoring that of France, then at so low an ebb among the nations, that he should be allowed to set up a bank, which should have the management of the royal revenues, and issue notes both on that and on landed security. He further proposed that this bank should be administered in the king's name, but subject to the control of commissioners to be named by the states-general. While these memorials were under consideration, Law translated into French his essay on money and trade, and used every means to extend through the nation his renown as a financier. He soon became talked of. The confidants of the regent spread abroad his praise, and everyone expected great things of Monsieur Lasse. The French pronounced his name in this manner to avoid the ungallic sound, ah. After the failure of his scheme, the wag said the nation was l'as de lui, and proposed that he should, in future, be known by the name of Monsieur Elas. On the 5th of May, 1716, a royal edict was published, by which law was authorized, in conjunction with his brother, to establish a bank under the name of Law and Company, the notes of which should be received in payment of the taxes. The capital was fixed at six millions of livres, in twelve thousand shares of five hundred livres each, purchasable one-fourth in specie, and the remainder in billets de tat. It was not thought expedient to grant him the whole of the privileges prayed for in his memorials until experience should have shown their safety and advantage. Law was now on the high road to fortune. The study of thirty years was brought to guide him in the management of his bank. He made all his notes payable at sight, and in the coin current at the time they were issued. This last was a master stroke of policy, and immediately rendered his notes more valuable than the precious metals. The latter were constantly liable to deprecation by the unwise tampering of the government. A thousand livres of silver might be worth their nominal value one day, and be reduced one-sixth the next, but a note of law's bank retained its original value. He publicly declared at the same time that a banker deserved death if he made issues without having sufficient security to answer all demands. The consequence was that his notes advanced rapidly in public estimation, and were received at one per cent more than specie. It was not long before the trade of the country felt the benefit. Languishing commerce began to lift up her head. The taxes were paid with greater regularity and less murmuring, and a degree of confidence was established that could not fail, if it continued, to become still more advantageous. In the course of a year, Law's notes rose to fifteen per cent premium, while the billets de tat, or notes issued by the government as security for the debts contracted by the extravagance of Louis the Fourteenth, were at a discount of no less than seventy-eight and a half per cent. The comparison was too great in favor of law not to attract the attention of the whole kingdom, and his credit extended itself day by day. Branches of his bank were almost simultaneously established in Lyon, Rochelle, Tours, Amiens, and Orléans. The regent appears to have been utterly astonished at his success, and gradually to have conceived the idea that paper, which could so aid a metallic currency, could entirely supersede it. Upon this fundamental error he afterwards acted. In the meantime, Law commenced the famous project which has handed his name down to posterity. He proposed to the regent, who could refuse him nothing, to establish a company that should have the exclusive privilege of trading to the great river Mississippi and the province of Louisiana on its western bank. The country was supposed to abound in the precious metals, 
and the company, supported by the profits of their exclusive commerce, were to be the sole farmers of the taxes and the sole coiners of money. Letters patent were issued, incorporating the company, in August 1717. The capital was divided into 200,000 shares of 500 livres each, the whole of which might be paid in billets de tat, at their nominal value, although worth no more than 160 livres in the market. It was now that the frenzy of speculating began to seize upon the nation. Law's bank had effected so much good that any promises for the future which he thought proper to make were readily believed. The regent every day conferred new privileges upon the fortunate projector. The bank obtained the monopoly of the sale of tobacco, the sole right of refinage of gold and silver, and was finally erected into the Royal Bank of France. Amid the intoxication of success, both law and the regent forgot the maxim so loudly proclaimed by the former that a banker deserved death who made issues of paper without the necessary funds to provide for them as soon as the bank from a private became a public institution the regent caused a fabrication of notes to the amount of one thousand millions of livres this was the first departure from sound principles and one for which law is not justly blamable while the affairs of the bank were under his control the issues had never exceeded sixty millions. Whether law opposed the inordinate increase is not known, but as it took place as soon as the bank was made a royal establishment, it is but fair to lay the blame of the change of system upon the regent. Law found that he lived under a despotic government, but he was not yet aware of the pernicious influence which such a government could exercise upon so delicate a framework as that of credit. He discovered it afterwards to his cost, but in the meantime— he suffered himself to be impelled by the regent into courses which his own reason must have disapproved. With a weakness most culpable, he lent his aid in inundating the country with paper money, which, based upon no solid foundation, was sure to fall sooner or later. The extraordinary present fortune dazzled his eyes, and prevented him from seeing the evil day that would burst over his head, when once, from any cause or other, the alarm was sounded. The Parliament were from the first jealous of his influence as a foreigner, and had, besides, their misgivings as to the safety of his projects. As his influence extended, their animosity increased. D'Aguesseau, the Chancellor, was unceremoniously dismissed by the Regent for his opposition to the vast increase of paper money, and the constant depreciation of the gold and silver coin of the realm. This only served to augment the enmity of the Parliament and when Dargensen, a man devoted to the interests of the regent, was appointed to the vacant chancellorship, and made at the same time minister of finance, they became more violent than ever. The first measure of the new minister caused a further depreciation of the coin. In order to extinguish the billet de tat, it was ordered that persons bringing to the mint four thousand livres in specie and one thousand livres in billet de tat should receive back coin to the amount of five thousand livres. D'Argensen plumed himself mightily upon thus creating five thousand new and smaller livres out of the four thousand old and larger ones, being too ignorant of the true principles of trade and credit to be aware of the immense injury he was inflicting upon both. The Parliament saw at once the impolicy and danger of such a system, and made repeated remonstrances to the Regent. The latter refused to entertain their petitions, when the Parliament, by a bold and very unusual stretch of authority, commanded that no money should be received in payment but that of the old standard. The regent summoned a lit de justice, and annulled the decree. The parliament resisted, and issued another. Again the regent exercised his privilege, and annulled it, till the parliament, stung to fiercer opposition, passed another decree, dated August 12, 1718, by which they forbade the bank of law to have any concern either direct or indirect, in the administration of the revenue, and prohibited all foreigners, under heavy penalties from interfering, either in their own names or in that of others, in the management of the finances of the state. The Parliament considered law to be the author of all the evil, and some of the councillors, in the virulence of their enmity, proposed that he should be brought to trial, and, if found guilty, be hung at the gates of the Palais de Justice. Law, in great alarm, fled to the Palais Royal, and threw himself on the protection of the regent, praying that measures might be taken to reduce the Parliament to obedience. The regent had nothing so much at heart 
both on that account and because of the disputes which had arisen relative to the legitimation of the duke of maine and the count of toulouse the sons of the late king the parliament was ultimately overawed by the arrest of their president and two of the councillors who were sent to distant prisons end of chapter one part one recording by sarah williams germantown maryland august two thousand eight Chapter One, Part Two of Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Volume One by Charles Mackay. Reading by Morgan Scorpion. Chapter One, The Mississippi Scheme, Part Two. Thus, the first cloud upon Law's prospects blew over. Freed from apprehension of personal danger, he devoted his attention to his famous Mississippi project, the shares of which were rapidly rising in spite of the Parliament. At the commencement of the year seventeen nineteen, an edict was published granting to the Mississippi Company the exclusive privilege of trading to the East Indies, China, and the South Seas, and to all the possessions of the French East India Company, established by Colbert. The Company, in consequence of this great increase of their business, assumed, as more appropriate, the title of Company of the Indies, and created 50,000 new shares. The prospects now held out by law were most magnificent, he promised a yearly d dividend of two hundred livres upon each share of the five hundred, which, as the shares were paid for in billet d'état at their nominal value, but worth only a hundred livres, was at the rate of about a hundred and twenty per cent profit. The public enthusiasm, which had been so long rising, could not resist a vision so splendid. At least three hundred thousand applications were made for the fifty thousand new shares, and Law's house in the Rue de Cancampoix was beset from morning to night by the eager applicants. As it was impossible to satisfy them all, it was several weeks before a list of the fortunate new stockholders could be made out, during which time the public impatience rose to a pitch of frenzy. Dukes, Marquises, Counts with their Duchesses, Marchionesses and Countesses, waited in the street for hours every day before Mr. Law's door to know the result. At last, to avoid the jostling of the plebeian crowd, which, to the number of thousands, filled the whole thoroughfare, they took apartments in the adjoining houses, that they might be continually near the temple whence the new Plutus was diffusing wealth. Every day the value of the old shares increased, and the fresh applications, induced by the golden dreams of the whole nation, became so numerous that it was deemed advisable to create no less than three hundred thousand new shares, at five thousand livres each in order that the regent might take advantage of the popular enthusiasm to pay off the national debt. For this purpose, the sum of fifteen hundred millions of livres was necessary. Such was the eagerness of the nation, that thrice the sum would have been subscribed if the government had authorized it. Law was now at the zenith of his prosperity, and the people were rapidly approaching the zenith of their infatuation. The highest and the lowest classes were alike filled with a vision of boundless wealth. There was not a person of note amongst the aristocracy, with the exception of the Duke of saint Simon and Marshal Villars, who was not engaged in buying or selling stock. People of every age and sex and condition in life speculated in the rise and fall of the Mississippi bonds. The Rue de Cancampoix was the grand resort of the jobbers, and it being a narrow, inconvenient street, accidents continually occurred in it, from the tremendous pressure of the crowd. Houses in it, worth in ordinary times, a thousand livres of yearly rent, yielded as much as twelve or sixteen thousand. A cobbler, who had a stall in it, gained about two hundred livres a day by letting it out and furnishing writing materials to brokers and their clients. The story goes that a hunchbacked man who stood in the street gained considerable sums by lending his hump as a writing desk to the eager spectators. The great concourse of persons who assembled to do business brought a still greater concourse of spectators. These again drew all the thieves and immoral characters of Paris to the spot, and constant riots and disturbances took place. At nightfall it was often found necessary to send a troop of soldiers to clear the street. Law, 
finding the inconvenience of his residence, removed to the Place Vendôme, whither the crowd of Agioter followed him. That spacious square soon became as thronged as the Rue de Cancampois. From morning to night it presented the appearance of a fair. Booths and tents were erected for the transaction of business and the sale of refreshments, and gamblers with their roulette tables stationed themselves in the very middle of the place, and reaped a golden, or rather a paper, harvest from the throng. The boulevards and public gardens were forsaken. Parties of pleasure took their walks in preference in the Place Vendôme, which became the fashionable lounge of the idle, as well as the general rendezvous of the busy. The noise was so great all day, that the Chancellor, whose court was situated in the square, complained to the Regent and the municipality that he could not hear the advocates. Law, when applied to, expressed his willingness to aid in the removal of the nuisance, and for this purpose entered into a treaty with the Prince de Carignan for the Hôtel de Soissons, which had a garden of several acres in the rear. A bargain was concluded by which Law became the purchaser of the hotel at an enormous price, the Prince reserving to himself the magnificent gardens as a new source of profit. They contained some fine statues and several fountains, and were altogether laid out with much taste. As soon as Law was installed in the new abode, an edict was published, forbidding all persons to buy or sell stock anywhere but in the gardens of the Hotel de Soissons. In the midst, among the trees, about five hundred small tents and pavilions were erected, for the convenience of the stock jobbers. Their various colours, the gay ribbons and banners which floated from them, the busy crowds which passed continually in and out, the incessant hum of voices, the noise, the music, and the strange mixture of business and pleasure on the countenances of the throng, all combined to give the place an air of enchantment that quite enraptured the Parisians. The Prince de Carignan made enormous profits while the delusion lasted. Each tent was let at the rate of five hundred livres a month, and, as there were at least five hundred of them, his monthly revenue from this source alone must have amounted to 250,000 livres, or upwards of 10,000 pounds sterling. The honest old soldier, Marshal Villard, was so vexed to see the folly which had smitten his countrymen, that he never could speak with temper on the subject. Passing one day through the Place Vendôme in his carriage, the choleric gentleman was so annoyed at the infatuation of the people, that he abruptly ordered his coachman to stop, and, putting his head out of the couch window, harangued them for full half an hour on their disgusting avarice. This was not a very wise proceeding on his part. Hisses and shouts of laughter resounded from every side, and jokes without number were aimed at him. There being at last strong symptoms that something more tangible was flying through the air in the direction of his head, the marshal was glad to drive on. He never again repeated the experiment. Two sober, quiet, and philosophic men of letters— Monsieur de la Motte and the Abbé Terrasson congratulated each other that they, at least, were free from this strange infatuation. A few days afterwards, as the worthy Abbé was coming out of the Hôtel de Soissons, whither he had gone to buy shares in the Mississippi, whom should he see but his friend la Motte entering for the same purpose? Ha! said the Abbé, smiling, is that you? Yes, said la Motte, pushing past him as fast as he was able, and can that be you? The next time the two scholars met, they talked of philosophy, of science, and of religion, but neither had the courage for a long time to breathe one syllable about the Mississippi. At last, when it was mentioned, they agreed that a man ought never to swear against his doing any one thing, and that there was no sort of extravagance of which even a wise man was not capable. During this time, Law, the new Plutus, had become all at once the most important personage of the state, the antechamber of the regent were forsaken by the courtiers, peers, judges, and bishops thronged to the Hôtel de Soissons, officers of the army and navy, ladies of title and fashion, and every one to whom hereditary rank or public employ gave a claim to precedence, were to be found waiting in his antechambers to beg for a portion of his India stock. Law was so pestered that he was unable to see one-tenth part of the applicants, and every manoeuvre that ingenuity could suggest was employed to gain access to him. Peers, whose dignity would have been outraged if the regent had made them wait half an hour for an interview, were content to wait six hours for the chance of seeing Monsieur Law. Enormous fees were paid to his servants, if they would merely announce their names. Ladies of rank employed the blandishments of their smiles for the same object, but many of them came day after day for a fortnight before they could obtain an audience. 
when Law accepted an invitation, he was sometimes so surrounded by ladies, all asking to have their names put down in his lists as shareholders in the new stock, that in spite of his well-known and habitual gallantry, he was obliged to tear himself away par force. The most ludicrous stratagems were employed to have an opportunity of speaking to him. One lady, who had striven in vain during several days, gave up in despair all attempts to see him at his own house, but ordered her coachman to keep a strict watch whenever she was out in her carriage, and if he saw Mr. Law coming, to drive against a post and upset her. The coachman promised obedience, and for three days the lady was driven incessantly through the town, praying inwardly for the opportunity to be overturned. At last she espied Mr. Law, and pulling the string, called out to the coachman, "'Upset us now, for God's sake, upset us now!' The coachman drove against a post, the lady screamed, the coach was overturned, and Law, who had seen the accident, hastened to the spot to render assistance. The cunning dame was led into the Hotel de Soissons, where she soon thought it advisable to recover from her fright, and after apologising to Mr. Law, confessed her stratagem. Law smiled, and entered the lady in his books as the purchaser of a quantity of India stock. Another story is told of a Madame de Boucher, who, knowing that Mr. Law was at dinner at a certain house, proceeded thither in her carriage and gave the alarm of fire. The company started from the table and Law among the rest, but seeing one lady making all haste into the house towards him while everybody else was scampering away, he suspected the trick and ran off in another direction. Many other anecdotes are related, which, even though they may be a little exaggerated, are nevertheless worth preserving as showing the spirit of that singular period. Note 7. The curious reader may find an anecdote of the eagerness of the French ladies to retain law in their company which will make him blush or smile according as he happens to be very modest or the reverse. It is related in the letters of Madame Charlotte Elizabeth de Bavière, Duchess of Orléans, volume 2, page 274. End of note 7. The regent was one day mentioning, in the presence of D'Argenson, the Abbé de Bois, and some other persons, that he was desirous of deputing some lady, of the rank at least of a duchess, to attend upon his daughter at Modena. But, added he, I do not exactly know where to find one. No, replied one, in affected surprise. I can tell you where to find every duchess in France. You have only to go to Mr. Law's, and you will see them every one in his antechamber. Monsieur de Chirac, a celebrated physician, had bought stock at an unlucky period, and was very anxious to sell out. Stock, however, continued to fall for two or three days, much to his alarm. His mind was filled with the subject, when he was suddenly called upon to attend a lady who imagined herself unwell. He arrived, was shown upstairs, and felt the lady's pulse. "'It falls, it falls, good God, it falls continually,' said he musingly while the lady looked up in his face, all anxiety for his opinion. "'Oh, Monsieur de Chirac,' said she, starting to her feet and ringing the bell for assistance, "'I am dying, I am dying, it falls, it falls, it falls!' "'What falls?' inquires the doctor in amazement. "'My pulse, my pulse,' said the lady, "'I must be dying.' "'Calm your apprehensions, my dear madame,' said Monsieur de Chirac. "'I was speaking of the stocks.' The truth is, I have been a great loser, and my mind is so disturbed, I hardly know what I have been saying. The price of shares sometimes rose ten or twenty per cent in the course of a few hours, and many persons in the humbler walks of life, who had risen poor in the morning, went to bed in affluence. An extensive holder of stock, being taken ill, sent his servant to sell two hundred and fifty shares, at eight thousand livres each, the price at which they were then quoted. The servant went and on his arrival in the Jardin de Soissons, found that in the interval the price had risen to 10,000 livres. The difference of 2,000 livres on the 250 shares, amounting to 500,000 livres, or 20,000 pounds sterling, he very coolly transferred to his own use, and giving the remainder to his master, set out the same evening for another country. Law's coachman in a very short time made money enough to set up a carriage of his own, and requested permission to leave his service. Law, who esteemed the man, begged of him as a favour that he would endeavour before he went to find a substitute as good as himself. The coachman consented, and in the evening brought two of his former comrades, telling Mr. Law to choose between them, and he would take the other. 
Cookmaids and footmen were now and then as lucky, and in the full-blown pride of their easily acquired wealth, made the most ridiculous mistakes. Preserving in the language and manners of their old, with the finery of their new station, they afforded continual subjects for the pity of the sensible, the contempt of the sober, and the laughter of everybody. But the folly and meanness of the higher ranks of society were still more disgusting. One instance alone, related by the Duke de Saint-Simon, will show the unworthy avarice which have infected the whole of society. A man of the name of André, without character or education, had, by a series of well-timed speculations in Mississippi bonds, gained enormous wealth in an incredibly short space of time. As Saint-Simon expresses it, he had amassed mountains of gold. As he became rich, he grew ashamed of the lowness of his birth, and anxious above all things to be allied to nobility. He had a daughter, an infant of only three years of age, and he opened a negotiation with the aristocratic and needy family of Dois that his child should, upon certain conditions, marry a member of that house. The Marquis Dois, to his shame, consented, and promised to marry her himself on her attaining the age of twelve, if the father would pay him down the sum of a hundred thousand crowns, and twenty thousand livres every year until the celebration of the marriage. The Marquis was himself in his thirty-third year. The scandalous bargain was duly signed and sealed, the stock-jobber, furthermore, agreeing to settle upon his daughter, on the marriage day, a fortune of several millions. The Duke of Branca, the head of the family, was present throughout the negotiation, and shared in all the profits. Saint-Simon, who treats the matter with the levity becoming what he thought so good a joke, adds, that people did not spare their animadversions on this beautiful marriage, and further informs us, that the project fell to the ground some months afterwards by the overthrow of law, and the ruin of the ambitious Monsieur André. It would appear, however, that the noble family never had the honesty to return the hundred thousand crowns. Amid events like these, which, humiliating though they be, partake largely of the ludicrous, others occurred of a more serious nature. Robberies in the streets were of daily occurrence, in consequence of the immense sums in paper which people carried about with them. Assassinations were also frequent. One case in particular fixed the attention of the whole of France, not only on account of the enormity of the offence, but of the rank and high connections of the criminal. The Count d'Orne, a younger brother of the Prince d'Orne, and related to the noble families of d'Arenberg, de Ligne, and de Montmorency, was a young man of dissipated character, extravagant to a degree, and unprincipled as he was extravagant. In connection with two other young men as reckless as himself, named Mille, a Piedmontese captain, and one d'Estaing, or Lestang, a Fleming, he formed a design to rob a very rich broker, who was known, unfortunately for himself, to carry great sums about his person. The Count pretended a desire to purchase of him a number of shares in the company of the Indies, and for that purpose appointed to meet him in a cabaret, or low public house, in the neighbourhood of the Place Vendôme. The unsuspecting broker was punctual to his appointment. So were the Count Don and his two associates, whom he introduced as his particular friends. After a few moments' conversation, the Count Don suddenly sprang upon his victim and stabbed him three times in the breast with a ponoir. The man fell heavily to the ground, and while the Count was employed in rifling his portfolio of bonds in the Mississippi and Indian schemes to the amount of one hundred thousand crowns, Mille, the Piedmontese, stabbed the unfortunate broker again and again to make sure of his death. But the broker did not fall without his struggle, and his cries brought the people of the cabaret to his assistance. Lestang, the other assassin, who had been sent to keep watch at a staircase, sprang from a window and escaped. But Mille and the Count d'Orne were seized in the very act. The crime, committed in open day and in so public a place as a cabaret, filled Paris with consternation. The trial of the assassins commenced on the following day, and the evidence being so clear, they were both found guilty and condemned to be broken alive on the wheel. The noble relatives of the Count d'Orne absolutely blocked up the antechambers of the regent, praying for mercy on the misguided youth, and alleging that he was insane. The regent avoided them for as long as possible, being determined that, in a case so atrocious, justice should take its course. But the importunity of these influential suitors was not to be overcome so silently and they at last forced themselves into the presence of the regent, and prayed him to save their house the shame of a public execution. They hinted that the princes d'Orne were allied to the illustrious family of Orléans, 
and added that the regent himself would be disgraced if a kinsman of his should die by the hands of a common executioner. The regent, to his credit, was proof against all their solicitations, and replied to their last argument in the words of Corneille, Le crime fait la honte, et non pas les chauffons, adding that whatever shame there might be in the punishment he would very willingly share with the other relatives. Day after day they renewed their entreaties, but always with the same result. At last they thought that if they could interest the Duc de saint simon in their favour, a man for whom the regent felt sincere esteem, they might succeed in their object. The duke, a thorough aristocrat, was as shocked as they were that a noble assassin should die by the same death as a plebeian felon, and represented to the regent the impolicy of making enemies of so numerous, wealthy, and powerful a family. He urged, too, that in Germany, where the family of Dauenberg had large possessions, it was the law that no relative of a person broken on the wheel could succeed to any public office or employ until a whole generation had passed away. For this reason he thought the punishment of the guilty count might be transmuted into beheading, which was considered all over Europe as much less infamous. The regent was moved by this argument, and was about to consent, when Law, who felt particularly interested in the fate of the murdered man, confirmed him in his former resolution to let the law take its course. The relatives of Dor were now reduced to the last extremity. The Prince de Robac Montmorency, despairing of other methods, found means to penetrate into the dungeon of the criminal, and offering a cup of poison, implored him to save them from disgrace. The Count Don turned away his head, and refused to take it. Montmorency pressed him once more, and losing all patience at his continued refusal, turned on his heel, and exclaiming, Die then, as thou wilt, mean-spirited wretch, thou art fit only to perish by the hands of the hangman, left him to his fate. De Horn himself petitioned the regent that he might be beheaded, but Law, who exercised more influence over his mind than any other person, with the exception of the notorious Abbé Dubois, his tutor, insisted that he could not in justice succumb to the self-interested views of the dawn. The regent had from the first been of the same opinion, and within six days after the commission of their crime, dawn and Mille were broken on the wheel in the Place de Greve. The other assassin, Lestang, was never apprehended. This prompt and severe justice was highly pleasing to the populace of Paris. Even Monsieur de Cancampois, as they called law, came in for a share of the approbation for having induced the regent to show no favour to a patrician. But the number of robberies and assassinations did not diminish. No sympathy was shown for rich jobbers when they were plundered. The general laxity of public morals, conspicuous enough before, was rendered still more so by the rapid pervasion of the middle classes, who had hitherto remained comparatively pure between the open vices of the class above and the hidden crimes of the class below them. The pernicious love of gambling diffused itself through society, and bore all public and nearly all private virtue before it. For a time, while confidence lasted, an impetus was given to trade which could not fail to be beneficial. In Paris especially the good results were felt. Strangers flocked into the capital from every part, bent not only upon making money, but on spending it. The Duchess of Orléans, mother of the regent, computes the increase of the population during this time, from the great influx of strangers from all parts of the world, at least 305,000 souls. The housekeepers were obliged to make up beds in garrets, kitchens, and even stables, for the accommodation of lodgers, and the town was so full of carriages and vehicles of every description that they were obliged, in the principal streets, to drive at a foot-pace for fear of accidents. The looms of the country worked with unusual activity to supply rich laces, silks, broadcloth and velvets, which, being paid for in abundant paper, increased in price fourfold. Provisions shared the general advance. Bread, meat and vegetables were sold at prices greater than had ever before been known, while the wages of labour rose in exactly the same proportion. The artisan, who formerly gained fifteen sous per diem, now gained sixty. New houses were built in every direction. An illusory prosperity shone over the land, and so dazzled the eyes of the whole nation, that none could see the dark cloud on the horizon, announcing the storm that was too rapidly approaching. Law himself, the magician whose wand had wrought so surprising a change, shared, of course, in the general prosperity. His wife and daughters were courted by the highest nobility, and their alliance sought by the heirs of ducal and princely houses. 
He bought two splendid estates in different parts of France, and entered into negotiations with the family of the Duke de Sully for the purchase of the Marquisate of Rosny. His religion being an obstacle to his advancement, the regent promised, if he would publicly conform to the Catholic faith, to make him Comptroller General of the Finances. Law, who had no more real religion than any other professed gambler, readily agreed, and was confirmed by the Abbé de Tanson in the Cathedral of Melon, in the presence of a great crowd of spectators. Note 8. The following squib was circulated on the occasion. Point de ton zélé séraphique, malheureuse Abbé de Tanson, depuis que l'eau est catholique, tous les royaumes est capuchin. Thus somewhat weakly and paraphrastically rendered by Justin Sand in his translation of the memoirs of Louis XV. Tanson, a curse on thy seraphic zeal, which by persuasion hath contrived the means to make the Scotchman at our altars kneel, since which we all are poor as Capuchin. On the following day he was elected honorary churchwarden of the parish of saint Roche, upon which occasion he made it a present of the sum of five hundred thousand livres. His charities, always magnificent, were not always so ostentatious. He gave away great sums privately, and no tale of real distress ever reached his ears in vain. At this time he was by far the most influential person of the state. The Duke of Orléans had so much confidence in his sagacity and the success of his plans that he always consulted him upon every matter of moment. He was by no means unduly elevated by his prosperity, but remained the same simple, affable, sensible man that he had shown himself in adversity. His gallantry, which was always delightful to the fair objects of it, was of a nature so kind, so gentlemanly, and so respectful, that not even a lover could have taken offence at it. If upon any occasion he showed any symptoms of haughtiness, it was to the cringing nobles who lavished their adulation upon him till it became fulsome. He often took pleasure in seeing how long he could make them dance attendance upon him for a single favour. To such of his own countrymen as by chance visited Paris and sought an interview with him, he was, on the contrary, all politeness and attention. When Archibald Campbell, Earl of Islay, and afterwards Duke of Argyle, called upon him in the Place Vendôme, he had to pass through an antechamber crowded with persons of the first distinction, all anxious to see the great financier, and have their names put down as first on the list of some new subscription. Law himself was quietly sitting in his library, writing a letter to the gardener at his paternal estate of Lauriston about the planting of some cabbages. The Earl stayed for a considerable time, played a game of piquet with his countryman, and left him, charmed with his ease, good sense, and good breeding. Among the nobles who, by means of the public credulity at this time, gained some sufficient to repair their ruined fortunes, may be mentioned the names of the Duke de Bourbon, de Guiche, de la Fosse, de Chaune, and d'Anton, the Marshal d'Astray, the Princes de Rouen, de Poix, and de Léon. The Duke de la Force gained considerable sums not only by jobbing in the stocks, but in dealing in porcelain, spices, etc. It was debated for a length of time in the Parliament of Paris whether he had not, in his quality of spice merchant, forfeited his rank in the peerage. It was decided in the negative. A caricature of him was made, dressed as a street porter, carrying a large bale of spices on his back with the inscription, Admire la Force. The Duc de Bourbon, son of Louis XIV by Madame de Montespan, was particularly fortunate in his speculations in Mississippi paper. He rebuilt the royal residence of Chantilly in a style of unwanted magnificence, and being passionately fond of horses, he erected a range of stables, which were long renowned throughout Europe, and imported a hundred and fifty of the finest races from England to improve the breed in France. He bought a large extent of country in Picardy, and became possessed of nearly all the valuable lands lying between the Oise and the Somme. When fortunes such as these were gained, it is no wonder that law should have been almost worshipped by the mercurial population. Never was monarch more flattered than he was. All the small poets and literateurs of the day poured floods of adulation upon him. According to them he was the saviour of the country, the tutelary divinity of France. Wit was in all his words, goodness in all his looks, and wisdom in all his actions. So great a crowd followed his carriage whenever he went abroad that the regent sent him a troop of horse as his permanent escort to clear the streets before him. 
It was remarked at this time that Paris had never before been so full of objects of elegance and luxury. Statues, pictures, and tapestries were imported in great quantities from foreign countries and found a ready market. All those pretty trifles in the way of furniture and ornament which the French excel in manufacturing were no longer the exclusive playthings of the aristocracy, but were to be found in abundance in the houses of traders and the middle classes in general. Jewellery of the most costly description was brought to Paris as the most favourable mart, among the rest, the famous diamond bought by the regent and called by his name, and which long adorned the crown of France. It was purchased for the sum of two million of livres, under circumstances which show that the regent was not so great a gainer as some of his subjects by the impetus which trade had received. When the diamond was first offered to him, he refused to buy it, although he desired above all things to possess it alleging as his reason that his duty to the country he governed would not allow him to spend so large a sum of the public money for a mere jewel. This valid and honourable excuse threw all the ladies of the court into alarm, and nothing was heard for some days but expressions of regret that so rare a gem should be allowed to go out of France, no private individual being rich enough to buy it. The regent was continually importuned about it, but all in vain until the Duc de saint simon who with all his ability was something of a twaddler, undertook the weighty business. His entreaties being seconded by law, the good-natured regent gave his consent, leaving to law's ingenuity to find the means to pay for it. The owner took security for the payment of the sum of two million of livres within a stated period, receiving in the meantime the interest of five per cent upon that amount, and being allowed, besides, all the valuable clippings of the gem. Saint-Simon, in his memoir, relates with no little complacency his share in the transaction. After describing the diamond to be as large as a green gauge, of a form nearly round, perfectly white and without flaw, and weighing more than five hundred grains, he concludes with a chuckle by telling the world that he takes great credit to himself for having induced the regent to make so illustrious a purchase. In other words, he was proud that he had induced him to sacrifice his duty, and buy a bauble for himself at an extravagant price out of the public money. End of chapter 1, part 2「Chapter One, Part Three of Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Volume 1, by Charles Mackay. The Mississippi Scheme, Part 3. Thus the system continued to flourish till the commencement of the year 1720. The warnings of the Parliament, that too great a creation of paper money would, sooner or later, bring the country to bankruptcy, were disregarded. The Regent, who knew nothing whatever of the philosophy of finance, thought that a system which had produced such good effects could never be carried to excess. If five hundred millions of paper had been of such advantage, five hundred millions additional would be of still greater advantage. This was the grand error of the regent, and which law did not attempt to dispel. The extraordinary avidity of the people kept up the delusion, and the higher the price of Indian and Mississippi stock, the more billets de banque were issued to keep pace with it. The edifice thus reared might not unaptly be compared to the gorgeous palace erected by Potemkin, that princely barbarian of Russia, to surprise and please his imperial mistress. Huge blocks of ice were piled one upon another. Iconic pillars of chastest workmanship in ice formed a noble portico, and a dome of the same material shone in the sun which had just strength enough to gild, but not to melt it. It glittered afar, like a palace of crystals and diamonds, but there came one warm breeze from the south, and the stately building dissolved away, till none were able even to gather up the fragments. So with Law and his paper system. No sooner did the breath of popular mistrust blow steadily upon it, than it fell to ruins, and none could raise it up again. 
The first slight alarm that was occasioned was early in 1720. The Prince de Conti, offended that law should have denied him fresh shares in India stock at his own price, sent to his bank to demand payment in specie of so enormous a quantity of notes that three wagons were required for its transport. Law complained to the regent, and urged on his attention the mischief that would be done if such an example found many imitators. The regent was but too well aware of it, and sending for the Prince de Conti ordered him, under penalty of his high displeasure, to refund to the bank two-thirds of the specie which he had withdrawn from it. The prince was forced to obey the despotic mandate. Happily for Law's credit, de Conti was an unpopular man. Everybody condemned his meanness and cupidity, and agreed that Law had been hardly treated. It is strange, however, that so narrow an escape should not have made both Law and the regent more anxious to restrict their issues. Others were soon found who imitated, from motives of distrust, the example which had been set by de Conti in revenge. The more acute stock-jobbers imagined justly that prices could not continue to rise for ever. Bourdon and La Richardière, renowned for their extensive operations in the funds, quietly and in small quantities at a time, converted their notes into specie, and sent it away to foreign countries. They also bought as much as they could conveniently carry of plate and expensive jewellery, and sent it secretly away to England or to Holland. Vermelet, a jobber who sniffed the coming storm, procured gold and silver coin to the amount of nearly a million livres, which he packed in a farmer's cart, and covered over with hay and cow dung. He then disguised himself in the dirty smock-frock or blouse of a peasant, and drove his precious load in safety into Belgium. From thence he soon found means to transport it to Amsterdam. Hitherto no difficulty had been experienced by any class in procuring specie for their wants. But this system could not long be carried on without causing a scarcity. The voice of complaint was heard on every side, and inquiries being instituted, the cause was soon discovered. The council debated long on the remedies to be taken, and law, being called on for his advice, was of an opinion that an edict should be published, depreciating the value of coin five per cent below that of paper. The edict was published accordingly, but failing of its intended effect, was followed by another, in which the depreciation was increased to ten per cent. The payments of the bank were at the same time restricted to one hundred livres in gold and ten in silver. All these measures were nugatory to restore confidence in the paper, though the restriction of cash payments within limits so extremely narrow kept up the credit of the bank. Notwithstanding every effort to the contrary, the precious metals continued to be conveyed to England and Holland. The little coin that was left in the country was carefully treasured, or hidden until the scarcity became so great that the operations of trade could no longer be carried on. In this emergency, Law hazarded the bold experiment of forbidding the use of specie altogether. In February 1720, an edict was published, which instead of restoring the credit of the paper, as was intended, destroyed it irrevocably and drove the country to the very brink of revolution. By this famous edict it was forbidden to any person whatever to have more than five hundred livres, twenty pounds, of coin in his possession, under pain of a heavy fine, and confiscation of the sums found. It was also forbidden to buy up jewellery, plate, and precious stones, and informers were encouraged to make search for offenders by the promise of one half the amount they might discover. The whole country set up a cry of distress at this unheard of tyranny. The most odious persecution daily took place. The privacy of families was violated by the intrusion of informers and their agents. The most virtuous and honest were denounced for the crime of having been seen with a louis d'or in their possession. Servants betrayed their masters, one citizen became a spy upon his neighbour, and arrests and confiscations so multiplied that the courts found a difficulty in getting through the immense increase of business thus occasioned. It was sufficient for an informer to say that he suspected any person of concealing money in his house, and immediately a search warrant was granted. Lord Stair, the English ambassador, said that it was now impossible to doubt the sincerity of Law's conversion to the Catholic religion. He had established the Inquisition, after having given an abundant evidence of his faith in transubstantiation, by turning so much gold into paper. Every epithet that popular hatred could suggest was showered upon the regent and the unhappy Law. 
Coin, to any amount above five hundred livres, was an illegal tender, and nobody would take paper if he could help it. No one knew today what his notes would be worth tomorrow. Never, said Duclos, in his secret memoirs of the Regency, was seen a more capricious government. Never was a more frantic tyranny exercised by hands less firm. It is inconceivable to those who were witnesses of the horrors of those times, and who look back upon them now as on a dream, that a sudden revolution did not break out, that law and the regent did not perish by a tragical death. They were both held in horror, but the people confined themselves to complaints, a sombre and timid despair, a stupid consternation had seized upon all, and men's minds were too vile even to be capable of a courageous crime. It would appear that, at one time, a movement of the people was organised. Seditious writings were posted up against the walls and were sent in handbills to the houses of the most conspicuous people. One of them, given in the Memoir de la Régence, was to the following effect. Sir and Madam, this is to give you notice that a St. Bartholomew's Day will be enacted again on Saturday and Sunday if affairs do not alter. You are desired not to stir out, nor you, nor your servants. God preserve you from the flames. Give notice to your neighbours, dated Saturday, May the 25th, 1720. The immense number of spies with which the city was infested rendered the people mistrustful of one another, and beyond some trifling disturbances made in the evening by an insignificant group, which was soon dispersed, the peace of the capital was not compromised. The value of shares in the Louisiana or Mississippi stock had fallen very rapidly, and few indeed were found to believe the tales that had once been told of the immense wealth of that region. A last effort was therefore tried to restore the public confidence in the Mississippi project. For this purpose, a general conscription of all the poor wretches in Paris was made by order of government. Upwards of six thousand of the very refuse of the population were impressed, as if in time of war, and were provided with clothes and tools to be embarked for New Orleans, to work in the gold mines alleged to abound there. They were paraded day after day through the streets with their pikes and shovels, and then sent off in small detachments to the outports to be shipped for America. Two-thirds of them never reached their destination, but dispersed themselves over the country, sold their tools for what they could get, and returned to their old course of life. In less than three weeks afterwards, one half of them were to be found again in Paris. The manoeuvre, however, caused a trifling advance in Mississippi stock. Many persons of superabundant gullibility believed that operations had begun in earnest in the new Golconda, and that gold and silver ingots would again be found in France. In a constitutional monarchy some surer means would have been found for the restoration of public credit. In England, at a subsequent period, when a similar delusion had brought on similar distress, how different were the measures taken to repair the evil! But in France, unfortunately, the remedy was left to the authors of the mischief. The arbitrary will of the regent, which endeavoured to extricate the country, only plunged it deeper into the mire. All payments were ordered to be made in paper, and between the 1st of February and the end of May, notes were fabricated to the amount of upwards of 1,500 millions of livres, or 60 million pounds sterling. But the alarm once sounded, no art could make the people feel the slightest confidence in paper which was not exchangeable into metal. M. Lambert, the President of the Parliament of Paris, told the Regent to his face that he would rather have a hundred thousand livres in gold or silver than five millions in the notes of his bank. When such was the general feeling, the superabundant issues of paper but increased the evil by rendering still more enormous the disparity between the amount of specie and notes in circulation. Coin, which it was the object of the Regent to depreciate, rose in value on every French attempt to diminish it. In February it was judged advisable that the Royal Bank should be incorporated with the Company of the Indies. An edict to that effect was published and registered by the Parliament. The State remained the guarantee for the notes of the Bank, and no more were to be issued without an order in Council. All the profits of the Bank, since the time it had been taken out of law's hands and made a national institution, were given over by the Regent to the Company of the Indies. This measure had the effect of raising for a short time the value of the Louisiana and the other shares of the company, but it failed in placing public credit on any permanent basis. A council of state was held in the beginning of May, at which Law, D'Argenson, his colleague in the administration of the finances, and all the ministers were present. 
It was then computed that the total amount of notes in circulation was 260,000 millions of livres, while the coin in the country was not quite equal to half that amount. It was evident to the majority of the council that some plan must be adopted to equalize the currency. Some proposed that the notes should be reduced to the value of the specie, while others proposed that the nominal value of the specie should be raised till it was on an equality with the paper. Law is said to have been opposed to both these projects, but failing in suggesting any other, it was agreed that the notes should be depreciated one half. On the 21st of May, an edict was accordingly issued by which it was decreed that the shares of the Company of the Indies, and the notes of the bank, should gradually diminish in value, till at the end of a year they should only pass current for one and a half of their nominal worth. The Parliament refused to register the edict. The greatest outcry was excited, and the state of the country became so alarming that, as the only means of preserving tranquillity, the Council of the Regency was obliged to stultify its own proceedings by publishing within seven days another edict, restoring the notes to their original value. On the same day, the 27th of May, the bank stopped payment in specie. Law and D'Argenson were both dismissed from the ministry. The weak, vacillating, and cowardly regent threw the blame of the mischief upon Law, who, upon presenting himself at the Palais Royal, was refused admittance. At nightfall, however, he was sent for and admitted into the palace by a secret door, when the regent endeavoured to console him and made all manner of excuses for the severity with which, in public, he had been compelled to treat him. So capricious was his conduct that, two days afterwards, he took him publicly to the opera, where he sat in the royal box alongside of the regent, who treated him with marked consideration in face of all the people. But such was the hatred against law, that the experiment had well nigh proved fatal to him. The mob assailed his carriage with stones just as he was entering his own door, and if the coachman had not made a sudden jerk into the courtyard, and the domestics closed the gate immediately, he would in all probability have been dragged out and torn to pieces. On the following day his wife and daughter were also assailed by the mob as they were returning in their carriage from the races. When the regent was informed of these occurrences, he sent law a strong detachment of Swiss guards, who were stationed night and day in the court of his residence. The public indignation at last increased so much that Law, finding his own house, even with this guard, insecure, took refuge in the Palais Royal in the apartments of the regent. The Chancellor, D'Agesso, who had been dismissed in 1718 for his opposition to the projects of Law, was now recalled to aid in the restoration of credit. The regent acknowledged too late that he had treated with unjustifiable harshness and mistrust one of the ablest, and perhaps the sole honest public man of that corrupt period. He had retired ever since his disgrace to his country house at Fresen, where in the midst of severe but delightful philosophic studies he had forgotten the intrigues of an unworthy court. Law himself, and the Chevalier de Conflans, a gentleman of the regent's household, were dispatched in a post-chairs with orders to bring the ex-chancellor to Paris along with them. D'Agesso consented to render what assistance he could, contrary to the advice of his friends, who did not approve that he should accept any recall to office of which law was the bearer. On his arrival in Paris, five councillors of the Parliament were admitted to confer with the Commissary of France, and on the 1st of June an order was published abolishing the law which made it criminal to amass coin to the amount of more than 500 livres. Every one was permitted to have as much specie as he pleased. In order that the bank notes might be withdrawn, 25 millions of new notes were created, on the security of the revenues of the city of Paris at 2.5%. The bank notes withdrawn were publicly burned in front of the Hotel de Ville. The new notes were principally of the value of 10 livres each, and on the 10th of June the bank was reopened, with a sufficiency of silver coin to give in change for them. These measures were productive of considerable advantage. All the population of Paris hastened to the bank to get coin for their small notes, and silver becoming scarce, they were paid in copper. Very few complained that this was too heavy, although poor fellows might be continually seen toiling and sweating along the streets, laden with more than they could comfortably carry, in the shape of change for fifty livres. The crowds around the bank were so great that hardly a day passed that some one was not pressed to death. On the ninth of July the multitude was so dense and clamorous that the guards stationed at the entrance of the Mazarin Gardens closed the gate and refused to admit any more. 
the crowd became incensed and flung stones through the railings upon the soldiers. The latter, incensed in their turn, threatened to fire upon the people. At that instant one of them was hit by a stone, and, taking up his piece, he fired into the crowd. One man fell dead immediately, and another was severely wounded. It was every instant expected that a general attack would have been commenced upon the bank, but the gates of the Mazarin Gardens being open to the crowd, who saw a whole troop of soldiers with their bayonets fixed ready to receive them, they contented themselves by giving vent to their indignation in groans and hisses. Eight days afterwards the concourse of people was so tremendous that fifteen persons were squeezed to death at the doors of the bank. The people were so indignant that they took three of the bodies on stretchers before them, and proceeded to the number of seven or eight thousand, to the gardens of the Palais Royal, that they might show the regent the misfortunes that he and law had brought upon the country. Law's coachman, who was sitting at the box of his master's carriage in the courtyard of the palace, happened to have more zeal than discretion, and not liking that the mob should abuse his master, he said loud enough to be overheard by several persons, that they were all blackguards and deserved to be hanged. The mob immediately set upon him, and thinking that Law was in the carriage, broke it to pieces. The imprudent coachman narrowly escaped with his life. No further mischief was done. A body of troops making their appearance, the crowd quietly dispersed, after an assurance had been given by the regent that the three bodies they had brought to show him should be decently buried at his own expense. The Parliament was sitting at the time of this uproar, and the President took upon himself to go out and see what was the matter. On his return he informed the councillors that Law's carriage had been broken by the mob. All the members rose simultaneously and expressed their joy by a loud shout, while one man, more zealous in his hatred than the rest, exclaimed, And Law himself, is he torn to pieces? Note 13. The Duchess of Orléans gives a different version of this story, but whichever be the true one, the manifestation of such feeling in a legislative assembly was not very creditable. She says that the President was so transported with joy that he was seized with a rhyming fit, and returning to the hall, exclaimed to the members, Messieurs, Messieurs, bonne nouvelle, le carrosse de l'as est réduit en canelle. Much, undoubtedly, depended on the credit of the Company of the Indies, which was answerable for so great a sum to the nation. It was therefore suggested in the Council of the Ministry that any privileges which could be granted to enable it to fulfil its engagements would be productive of the best results. With this end in view, it was proposed that the exclusive privilege of all maritime commerce should be secured to it, and an edict to that effect was published. But it was unfortunately forgotten that by such a measure all the merchants of the country would be ruined. The idea of such an immense privilege was generally scouted by the nation, and petition on petition was presented to the Parliament that they would refuse to register the decree. They refused accordingly, and the regent, remarking that they did nothing but fan the flames of sedition, exiled them to Blois. At the intercession of D'Aguisseau, the place of banishment was changed to Pontoise, and thither, accordingly, the councillors repaired, determined to set the regent at defiance. They made every arrangement for rendering their temporary exile as agreeable as possible. The president gave the most elegant suppers, to which he invited all the gay and wittiest company of Paris. Every night there was a concert and ball for the ladies. The usually grave and solemn judges and counsellors joined in cards and other diversions, leading for several weeks a life of the most extravagant pleasure, for no other purpose than to show the regent of how little consequence they deemed their banishment, and that when they willed it, they could make Pontoise a pleasanter residence than Paris. Of all the nations in the world, the French are the most renowned for singing over their grievances. Of that country it has been remarked with some truth that its whole history may be traced in its songs. When Law, by the utter failure of his best laid plans, rendered himself obnoxious, satire, of course, seized hold upon him, and while caricatures of his person appeared in all the shops, the streets resounded with songs in which neither he nor the regent were spared. Many of these songs were far from decent, and one of them in particular counselled the application of all his notes to the most ignoble use to which paper can be applied. But the following, preserved in the letters of the Duchess of Orléans, was the best and the most popular, and was to be heard for months in all the carrefour in Paris. The application of the chorus is happy enough. Aussitôt que la arriva dans notre bonne ville, Monsieur la Régent publia 
que la sera utile pour rétablir la nation. La farindondan, la farindondan, mais il nous a tout enrichi. Biri biri, à la facon de barbarie, mon ami, c'est papayon pour attirer. Tout l'argent de la France, son guerre d'abord à s'assurer de notre confiance. Il fit son abjuration, la farindondan, la farindondan, mais le fauve s'est converti. Biri biri, à la facon de barbarie, mon ami, las le fille al né de Satan. Nous mettons à l'aumont, il nous a pris tout notre argent et non rend à personne. Mais la région, humaine est bon, la fin d'ondin, la fin d'ondin, nous rendra ce qu'on nous a pris. Biribiri à la facon de Barbarie, mon ami. The following epigram is of the same date. Lundi, j'achetai des actions. Mardi, je gagnais des millions. Mercredi, j'arrangeai mon ménage. Jeudi, je pris un équipage. Vendredi, je m'en fous à bol. Et samedi, à l'hôpital. Among the caricatures that were abundantly published, and that showed as plainly as graver matters that the nation had awakened to a sense of its folly, was one, a facsimile of which is preserved in the Mémoire de la Régence. It was thus described by its author, the goddess of shares, in her triumphal car, driven by the goddess of folly. Those who are drawing the car are impersonations of the Mississippi with his wooden leg, the South Sea, the Bank of England, the company of the West of Senegal, and of various assurances. Lest the car should not roll fast enough, the agents of these companies, known by their long fox tails and their cunning looks, turn round the spokes of the wheels upon which are marked the names of the several stocks and their value, sometimes high and sometimes low, according to the turns of the wheel. Upon the ground are the merchandise, day-books and ledgers of legitimate commerce, crushed under the chariot of folly. Behind is an immense crowd of persons of all ages, sexes and conditions, clamouring after fortune, and fighting with each other to get a portion of the shares which she distributes so bountifully among them. In the clouds sits a demon, blowing bubbles of soap, which are also the objects of the admiration and cupidity of the crowd, who jump upon one another's backs to reach them ere they burst. Right in the pathway of the car, and blocking up the passage, stands a large building, with three doors, through one of which it must pass if it proceeds farther, and all the crowd along with it. Over the first door are the words, Hôpital des Fous, over the second, Hôpital des Malades, and over the third, Hôpital des Guerres. Another caricature represented Law sitting in a large cauldron, boiling over the flames of popular madness, surrounded by an impetuous multitude who were pouring all their gold and silver into it, and receiving gladly in exchange the bits of paper which he distributed among them by handfuls. While this excitement lasted, Law took great care not to expose himself unguarded in the streets. Shut up in the apartments of the regent, he was secure from all attack, and whenever he ventured abroad it was either incognito or in one of the royal carriages with a powerful escort. An amusing anecdote is recorded of the detestation in which he was held by the people and the ill-treatment he would have met had he fallen into their hands. A gentleman of the name of Bursal was passing in his carriage down the Rue de Saint-Antoine, when his farther progress was stayed by a hackney-coach that had blocked up the road. Monsieur Bursel's servant called impatiently to the hackney-coachman to get out of the way, and on his refusal struck him a blow on the face. A crowd was soon drawn together by the disturbance, and Monsieur Bursel got out of the carriage to restore order. The hackney-coachman, imagining that he had now another assailant, bethought him of an expedient to rid himself of both, and called out as loudly as he was able, Help! Help! Murder! Murder! Here are Law and his servant going to kill me! Help! Help! At this cry the people came out of their shops armed with sticks and other weapons, while the mob gathered stones to inflict summary vengeance upon the supposed financier. Happily for Monsieur Bursel and his servant, the door of the church of the Jesuits stood wide open, and seeing the fearful odds against them, they rushed towards it with all speed. They reached the altar, pursued by the people, and would have been ill-treated even there, if, 
finding the door open leading to the sacristy, they had not sprang through, and closed it after them. The mob were then persuaded to leave the church by the alarmed and indignant priests, and finding M. Borsal's carriage still in the streets, they vented their ill-will against it, and did it considerable damage. The twenty-five millions secured on the municipal revenues of the city of Paris, bearing so low an interest as two and a half per cent, were not very popular among the large holders of Mississippi stock. The conversion of the securities was, therefore, a work of considerable difficulty, for many preferred to retain the falling paper of Law's company in the hope that a favourable turn might take place. On the 15th of August, with a view to hasten the conversion, an edict was passed, declaring that all notes for sums between 1,000 and 10,000 livres should not pass current, except for the purchase of annuities and bank accounts, or for the payment of instalments still due on the shares of the company. In October following, another edict was passed, depriving these notes of all value whatever after the month of November next evening. The management of the mint, the farming of the revenue, and all the other advantages and privileges of the India or Mississippi Company were taken from them, and they were reduced to a mere private company. This was the death blow to the whole system, which had now got into the hands of his, its enemies. Law had lost all influence in the Council of Finance, and the company, being despoiled of its immunities, could no longer hold out the shadow of a prospect of being able to fulfil its engagements. All those suspected of illegal profits at the time the public delusion was at its height were sought out and immersed in heavy fines. It was previously ordered that a list of the original proprietors should be made out, and that such persons as still retained their shares should place them in deposit with the company, and that those who had neglected to complete the shares for which they had put down their names should now purchase them of the company at the rate of 13,500 livres for each share of 500 livres. Rather than submit to pay this enormous sum of stock which was actually at a discount, the shareholders packed up all their portable effects and endeavoured to find a refuge in foreign countries. Orders were immediately issued to the authorities at the ports and frontiers to apprehend all travellers who sought to leave the kingdom and keep them in custody, until it were ascertained whether they had any plate or jewellery with them, or were concerned in the late stock jobbing. Against such few as escaped, the punishment of death was recorded, while the most arbitrary proceedings were instituted against those who remained. Law himself, in a moment of despair, determined to leave a country where his life was no longer secure. He at first only demanded permission to retire from Paris to one of his country seats, a permission which the regent cheerfully granted. The latter was much affected at the unhappy turn affairs had taken, but his faith continued unmoved in the truth and efficacy of Law's financial system. His eyes were opened to his own errors, and during the few remaining years of his life he constantly longed for an opportunity of again establishing the system upon a secure basis. At Law's last interview with the Prince he is reported to have said, I confess that I have committed many faults. I committed them because I am a man, and all men are liable to error. But I declare to you most solemnly that none of them proceeded from wicked or dishonest motives, and that nothing of the kind will be found in the whole course of my conduct. Two or three days after his departure the regent sent him a very kind letter, permitting him to leave the kingdom whenever he pleased, and stating that he had ordered his passports to be made ready. He at the same time offered him any sum of money he might require. Law respectfully declined the money and set out for Brussels in a post-chaise belonging to the Madame de Priet, the mistress of the Duke of Bourbon, escorted by six horse-guards. From thence he proceeded to Venice, where he remained for some months, the object of the greatest curiosity to the people, who believed him to be the possessor of enormous wealth. No opinion, however, could be more erroneous. With more generosity than could have been expected from a man who during the greatest part of his life had been a professed gambler, he had refused to enrich himself at the expense of a ruined nation. During the height of the popular frenzy for Mississippi stock, he had never doubted of the final success of his projects in making France the richest and most powerful nation of Europe. He invested all his gains in the purchase of landed property in France, a sure proof of his own belief in the stability of his schemes. He had hoarded no plate or jewellery, and sent no money, like the dishonest jobbers, to foreign countries. His all, with the exception of one diamond, worth about five or six thousand pounds sterling, was invested in the French soil and when he left that country he left it almost a beggar. The fact alone ought to rescue his memory from the charge of knavery so often and so unjustly brought against him. 
As soon as his departure was known, all his estates and his valuable library were confiscated. Among the rest, an annuity of two hundred thousand livres, eight thousand pounds sterling, on the lives of his wife and children, which had been purchased for five millions of livres, was forfeited, notwithstanding that a special edict, drawn up for the purpose in the days of his prosperity, had expressly declared that it should never be confiscated for any cause whatever. Great discontent existed among the people that law had been suffered to escape. The mob and the Parliament would have been pleased to have seen him hanged. The few who had not suffered by the commercial revolution rejoiced that the quack had left the country, but all those, and they were by far the numerous class whose fortunes were implicated, regretted that his intimate knowledge of the distress of the country, and of the causes that had led to it, had not been rendered more available in discovering a remedy. At a meeting of the Council of Finance and the General Council of the Regency, documents were laid upon the table from which it appeared that the amount of notes in circulation was 2,700 millions. The Regent was called upon to explain how it happened that there was a discrepancy between the dates at which these issues were made and those of the edicts by which they were authorised. He might have safely taken the whole blame upon himself, but he preferred that an absent man should bear a share of it, and he therefore stated that law, upon his own authority, had issued 1,200 millions of notes at different times, and that he, the regent, seeing that the thing had been irrevocably done, had screened law by antedating the decrees of the council which authorised the augmentation. It would have been more to his credit if he had told the whole truth while he was about it, and acknowledged that it was mainly through his extravagance and impatience that law had been induced to overstep the bounds of safe speculation. It was also ascertained that the national debt, on the 1st of January 1721, amounted to upwards of 3,100 millions of livres, or more than a hundred and twenty-four million pounds sterling, the interest upon which was three million one hundred and ninety-six thousand pounds. A commission, or visa, was forthwith appointed to examine into all the securities of the state creditors who were to be divided into five classes, the first four comprising those who had purchased their securities with real effects, and the latter comprising those who could give no proofs that the transactions they had entered into were real and bona fide. The securities of the latter were ordered to be destroyed, while those of the first four classes were subjected to the most rigid and jealous scrutiny. The result of the labours of the visa was a report, in which they counselled the reduction of the interest upon these securities to fifty-six millions of livres. They justified this advice by a statement of the various acts of peculation and extortion which they had discovered, and an edict to that effect was accordingly published and duly registered by the parliaments of the kingdom. Another tribunal was afterwards established, under the title of the Chambre de l'Arsenal, which took cognizance of all the malversations committed in the financial departments of the government during the late unhappy period. A master of requests, named Falhonet, together with the Abbe Clement and two clerks in their employ, had been concerned in diverse acts of peculation to the amount of upwards of a million of livres. The first two were sentenced to be beheaded, and the latter to be hanged but their punishment was afterwards commuted into imprisonment for life in the Bastille. Numerous other acts of dishonesty were discovered and punished by fine and imprisonment. D'Argentsant shared with Law and the Regent the unpopularity which had alighted upon all those concerned in the Mississippi madness. He was dismissed from his post of Chancellor to make room for Dagasso, but he retained the title of Keeper of the Seals and was allowed to attend the councils whenever he pleased. He thought it better, however, to withdraw from Paris, and live for a time the life of seclusion at his country seat. But he was not formed for retirement, and becoming moody and discontented, he aggravated a disease under which he had long laboured, and died in less than a twelve-month. The populace of Paris so detested him that they carried their hatred even to his grave. As his funeral procession passed to the church of Saint-Nicolas du Chardonneret, the burying place of his family, it was beset by a riotous mob, and his two sons, who were following as chief mourners, were obliged to drive as fast as they were able down a by-street to escape personal violence. As regards law, he for some time entertained a hope that he should be recalled to France, to aid in establishing its credit upon a firmer basis. The death of the regent in 1723, who expired suddenly as he was sitting by the fireside conversing with his mistress, the Duchess de Fallery, deprived him of that hope, and he was reduced to lead his former life of gambling. 
He was more than once obliged to pawn his diamond, the sole remnant of his vast wealth, but successful play generally enabled him to redeem it. Being persecuted by his creditors at Rome, he proceeded to Copenhagen, where he received permission from the English ministry to reside in his native country, his pardon for the murder of Mr. Wilson having been sent over to him in 1719. He was brought over in the Admiral's ship, a circumstance which gave occasion for a short debate in the House of Lords. Earl Coningsby complained that a man who had renounced both his country and his religion should have been treated with such honour, and expressed his belief that his presence in England, at a time when the people were so bewildered by the nefarious practices of the South Sea directors, would be attended with no little danger. He gave notice of a motion on the subject, but it was allowed to drop, no other member of the House having the slightest participation in his lordship's fears. Law remained for about four years in England, and then proceeded to Venice, where he died in 1729 in very embarrassed circumstances. The following epitaph was written at the time. Si j se eco sans célèbre, se calculateur sans égal, de algebra a mis la France à l'hôpital. His brother, William Law, who had been concerned with him in the administration both of the bank and the Louisiana Company, was imprisoned in the Bastille for alleged malversation, but no guilt was ever proven against him. He was liberated after fifteen months, and became the founder of a family, which is still known in France under the title of Marquises de Lauriston. In the next chamber will be found an account of the madness which infected the people of England at the same time, and under very similar circumstances, but which, thanks to the energies and good sense of a constitutional government, was attended with results far less disastrous than those which were seen in France. End of chapter 1, part 3. Chapter 2, Part 1 of Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds by Charles Mackay. THE SOUTH SEA BUBBLE PART ONE At length corruption, like a general flood, Did deluge all, and avarice creeping on, Spread like a low-born mist, and hid the sun. Statesmen and patriots plied alike the stocks, Peeress and butler shared alike the box, And judges jobbed, and bishops bit the town, and mighty dukes packed cards for half a crown, Britain was sunk in Lucas' sordid charms. Pope The South Sea Company was originated by the celebrated Harley, Earl of Oxford, in the year 1711, with the view of restoring public credit, which had suffered by the dismissal of the Whig ministry, and of providing for the discharge of the army and navy debentures, and other parts of the floating debt, amounting to nearly ten millions sterling. A company of merchants, at that time without a name, took this debt upon themselves, and the government agreed to secure them for a certain period the interest of six per cent. To provide for this interest, amounting to six hundred thousand pounds per annum, the duties upon wines, vinegar, India goods, wrought silks, tobacco, whale fins, and some other articles, were rendered permanent. The monopoly of the trade to the South Seas was granted, and the company, being incorporated by Act of Parliament, assumed the title by which it has ever since been known. The minister took great credit to himself for his share in this transaction, and the scheme was always called by his flatterers the Earl of Oxford's Masterpiece. Even at this early period of its history, the most visionary ideas were formed by the company and the public of the immense riches of the eastern coast of South America. Everybody had heard of the gold and silver mines of Peru and Mexico. Everyone believed them to be inexhaustible, 
and that it was only necessary to send the manufactures of England to the coast to be repaid a hundredfold in gold and silver ingots by the natives. A report, industriously spread, that Spain was willing to concede four ports on the coasts of Chile and Peru for the purposes of traffic, increased the general confidence, and for many years the South Sea Company's stock was in high favour. Philip V of Spain, however, never had any intention of admitting the English to a free trade in the ports of Spanish America. Negotiations were set on foot, but their only result was the Asiento contract, or the privilege of supplying the colonies with Negroes for thirty years, and of sending, once a year, a vessel, limited both as to tonnage and value of cargo, to trade with Mexico, Peru, or Chile. The latter permission was only granted upon the hard condition that the King of Spain should enjoy one-fourth of the profits, and a tax of five per cent on the remainder. This was a great disappointment to the Earl of Oxford and his party, who were reminded much oftener than they found agreeable of the Parturiunt Montes Nascitur Ridiculus Mus. But the public confidence in the South Sea Company was not shaken. The Earl of Oxford declared that Spain would permit two ships, in addition to the annual ship, to carry out merchandise during the first year, and a list was published in which all the ports and harbours of these coasts were pompously set forth as open to the trade of Great Britain. The first voyage of the annual ship was not made till the year 1717, and in the following year the trade was suppressed by the rupture with Spain. The King's speech, at the opening of the session of 1717, made pointed allusion to the state of public credit, and recommended that proper measures should be taken to reduce the national debt. The two great monetary corporations, the South Sea Company and the Bank of England, made proposals to Parliament on the 20th of May ensuing. The South Sea Company prayed that their capital stock of ten millions might be increased to twelve, by subscription or otherwise, and offered to accept five per cent instead of six upon the whole amount. The bank made proposals equally advantageous. The House debated for some time, and finally three acts were passed, called the South Sea Act, the Bank Act, and the General Fund Act. By the first, the proposals of the South Sea Company were accepted, and that body held itself ready to advance the sum of two millions towards discharging the principal and interest of the debt due by the State for the four lottery funds of the ninth and tenth years of Queen Anne. By the second act, the bank received a lower rate of interest for the sum of one million seven hundred and seventy five thousand and twenty seven pounds fifteen shillings due to it by the state, and agreed to deliver up to be cancelled as many exchequer bills as amounted to two millions sterling, and to accept of an annuity of one hundred thousand pounds, being after the rate of five per cent, the whole redeemable at one year's notice. They were further required to be ready to advance, in case of need, a sum not exceeding two million five hundred thousand pounds, upon the same terms of five per cent interest, redeemable by Parliament. The General Fund Act recited the various deficiencies which were to be made good by the aids derived from the foregoing sources. The name of the South Sea Company was thus continually before the public though their trade with the South American states produced little or no augmentation of their revenues, they continued to flourish as a monetary corporation. Their stock was in high request, and the directors, buoyed up with success, began to think of new means for extending their influence. The Mississippi scheme of John Law, which so dazzled and captivated the French people, inspired them with an idea that they could carry on the same game in England. The anticipated failure of his plans did not divert them from their intention. 
wise in their own conceit, they imagined they could avoid his faults, carry on their schemes for ever, and stretch the cord of credit to its extremest tension, without causing it to snap asunder. It was while Law's plan was at its greatest height of popularity, while people were crowding in thousands to the Rue Quincompois, and ruining themselves with frantic eagerness, that the South Sea directors laid before Parliament their famous plan for paying off the national debt. Visions of boundless wealth floated before the fascinated eyes of the people in the two most celebrated countries of Europe. The English commenced their career of extravagance somewhat later than the French. But as soon as the delirium seized them, they were determined not to be outdone. Upon the 22nd of January, 1720, the House of Commons resolved itself into a committee of the whole House, to take into consideration that part of the King's speech at the opening of the session, which related to the public debts, and the proposal of the South Sea Company towards the redemption and sinking of the same. The proposal set forth at great length, and under several heads, the debts of the State, amounting to thirty million nine hundred and eighty-one thousand seven hundred and twelve pounds, which the company were anxious to take upon themselves, upon consideration of five per cent per annum, secured to them until midsummer, 1727, after which time the whole was to become redeemable at the pleasure of the legislature, and the interest to be reduced to four per cent. The proposal was received with great favour, but the Bank of England had many friends in the House of Commons, who were desirous that that body should share in the advantages that were likely to accrue. On behalf of this corporation it was represented that they had performed great and eminent services to the State in the most difficult times, and deserved at least that if any advantage was to be made by public bargains of this nature, they should be preferred before a company that had never done anything for the nation. The further consideration of the matter was accordingly postponed for five days. In the meantime, a plan was drawn up by the governors of the bank. The South Sea Company, afraid that the bank might offer still more advantageous terms to the government than themselves, reconsidered their former proposal, and made some alterations in it, which they hoped would render it more acceptable. The principal change was a stipulation that the government might redeem these debts at the expiration of four years instead of seven, as at first suggested. The bank resolved not to be outbidden in this singular auction, and the governors also reconsidered their first proposal, and sent in a new one. Thus, each corporation having made two proposals, the House began to deliberate. Mr. Robert Walpole was the chief speaker in favour of the bank, and Mr. Aislaby, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, the principal advocate on behalf of the South Sea Company. It was resolved, on the 2nd of February, that the proposals of the latter were most advantageous to the country. They were accordingly received, and leave was given to bring in a bill to that effect. Exchange Alley was in a fever of excitement. The company's stock, which had been at a hundred and thirty the previous day, gradually rose to three hundred, and continued to rise with the most astonishing rapidity during the whole time that the bill, in its several stages, was under discussion. Mr. Walpole was almost the only statesman in the House who spoke out boldly against it. He warned them, in eloquent and solemn language, of the evils that would ensue. It countenanced, he said, the dangerous practice of stock-jobbing, and would divert the genius of the nation from trade and industry. It would hold out a dangerous lure to decoy the unwary to their ruin, by making them part with the earnings of their labour for a prospect of imaginary wealth. The great principle of the project was an evil of first-rate magnitude. It was to raise artificially the value of the stock, by exciting and keeping up a general infatuation, 
and by promising dividends out of funds which could never be adequate to the purpose. In a prophetic spirit he added, that if the plan succeeded, the directors would become masters of the government, form a new and absolute aristocracy in the kingdom, and control the resolutions of the legislature. If it failed, which he was convinced it would, the result would bring general discontent and ruin upon the country. Such would be the delusion that when the evil day came, as come it would, the people would start up as from a dream, and ask themselves if these things could have been true. All his eloquence was in vain. He was looked upon as a false prophet, or compared to the horse raven, croaking omens of evil. His friends, however, compared him to Cassandra, predicting evils which would only be believed when they came home to men's hearths, and stared them in the face at their own boards. Although in former times the house had listened with utmost attention to every word that fell from his lips, the benches became deserted when it was known that he would speak on the South Sea question. The bill was two months in its progress through the House of Commons. During this time every exertion was made by the directors and their friends, and more especially by the chairman, the noted Sir John Blunt, to raise the price of the stock. The most extravagant rumours were in circulation. Treaties between England and Spain were spoken of, whereby the latter was to grant a free trade to all her colonies, and the rich produce of the mines of potosi la Paz was to be brought to England, until silver should be almost as plentiful as iron. For cotton and woollen goods, with which we could supply them in abundance, the dwellers in Mexico were to empty their golden mines. The company of merchants trading to the South Seas would be the richest the world ever saw, and every hundred pounds invested in it would produce hundreds per annum to the stockholder. At last the stock was raised by these means to near four hundred, but after fluctuating a good deal, settled at three hundred and thirty, at which price it remained when the bill passed the Commons by a majority of one hundred and seventy-two against fifty-five. In the House of Lords the bill was hurried through all its stages with unexampled rapidity. On the 4th of April it was read a first time, on the 5th it was read a second time, on the 6th it was committed, and on the 7th was read a third time, and passed. Several peers spoke warmly against the scheme, but their warnings fell upon dull, cold ears. A speculating frenzy had seized them as well as the plebeians. Lord North and Grey said the bill was unjust in its nature, and might prove fatal in its consequences, being calculated to enrich the few and impoverish the many. The Duke of Wharton followed, but, as he only retailed at second hand the arguments so eloquently stated by Walpole in the lower house, he was not listened to with even the same attention that had been bestowed upon Lord North and Grey. Earl Cowper followed on the same side, and compared the bill to the famous horse of the siege of Troy. Like that, it was ushered in and received with great pomp and acclamations of joy, but bore within it treachery and destruction. The Earl of Sunderland endeavoured to answer all objections, and on the question being put, there appeared only seventeen peers against, and eighty-three in favour of the project. The very same day on which it passed the Lords, it received the royal assent, and became the law of the land. It seemed at that time as if the whole nation had turned stock-jobbers. Exchange Alley was every day blocked up by crowds, and Cornhill was impassable for the number of carriages. Everybody came to purchase stock. Every fool aspired to be a knave. In the words of a ballad published at the time, and sung about the streets, Then stars and garters did appear among the meaner rabble, To buy and sell, to see and hear, the Jews and Gentiles squabble. The greatest ladies thither came, and plied in chariots daily, Or pawned their jewels for a sum to venture in the alley. Bubbles 
to a new tune called The Grand Elixir, or The Philosopher's Stone Discovered. The inordinate thirst of gain that had afflicted all ranks of society was not to be slaked even in the South Sea. Other schemes of the most extravagant kind were started. The share lists were speedily filled up, and an enormous traffic carried on in shares, while, of course, every means were resorted to to raise them to an artificial value in the market. Contrary to all expectation, South Sea stock fell when the bill received the royal assent. On the 7th of April the shares were quoted at 310, and on the following day at 290. Already the directors had tasted the profits of their scheme, and it was not likely that they should quietly allow the stock to find its natural level without an effort to raise it. Immediately their busy emissaries were set to work. Every person interested in the success of the project endeavoured to draw a knot of listeners around him, to whom he expatiated on the treasures of the South American seas. Exchange Alley was crowded with attentive groups. One rumour alone, asserted with the utmost confidence, had an immediate effect upon the stock. It was said that Earl Stanhope had received overtures in France from the Spanish government to exchange Gibraltar and Port Mahon for some places on the coast of Peru for the security and enlargement of the trade in the South Seas. Instead of one annual ship trading to those ports, and allowing the King of Spain 25% out of the profits, the company might build and charter as many ships as they pleased, and pay no percentage whatever to any foreign potentate. Visions of ingots danced before their eyes, and stock rose rapidly. On the 12th of April, five days after the bill had become law, the directors opened their books for a subscription of a million, at the rate of three hundred pounds for every one hundred pounds capital. Such was the concourse of persons of all ranks, that this first subscription was found to amount to above two millions of original stock. It was to be paid at five payments, of sixty pounds each for every one hundred pounds. In a few days the stock advanced to three hundred and forty, and the subscriptions were sold for double the price of the first payment. To raise the stock still higher, it was declared in a general court of directors on the 21st of April, that the midsummer dividend should be ten per cent, and that all subscriptions should be entitled to the same. These resolutions answering the end designed, the directors, to improve the infatuation of the moneyed men, opened their books for a second subscription of a million at four hundred per cent. Such was the frantic eagerness of the people of every class to speculate in these funds, that in the course of a few hours no less than a million and a half was subscribed at that rate. In the meantime innumerable joint-stock companies started up everywhere. They soon received the name of Bubbles, the most appropriate that imagination could devise. The populace are often most happy in the nicknames they employ. None could be more apt than that of Bubbles. Some of them lasted for a week or a fortnight, and were no more heard of, while others could not even live out that short span of existence. Every evening produced new schemes, and every morning new projects. The highest of the aristocracy were as eager in this hot pursuit of gain as the most plodding jobber in Cornhill. The Prince of Wales became governor of one company, and is said to have cleared forty thousand pounds by his speculations. The Duke of Bridgewater started a scheme for the improvement of London and Westminster, and the Duke of Chandos another. There were nearly a hundred different projects, each more extravagant and deceptive than the other. To use the words of the political state, they were set on foot and promoted by crafty knaves, then pursued by multitudes of covetous fools, and at last appeared to be, in effect, what their vulgar appellation denoted them to be, bubbles and mere cheats. 
It was computed that nearly one million and a half sterling was won and lost by these unwarrantable practices, to the impoverishment of many a fool, and the enriching of many a rogue. Some of these schemes were plausible enough, and had they been undertaken at a time when the public mind was unexcited, might have been pursued with advantage to all concerned. But they were established merely with the view of raising the shares in the market. The projectors took the first opportunity of a rise to sell out, and next morning the scheme was at an end. Maitland, in his History of London, gravely informs us that one of the projects which received great encouragement was for the establishment of a company to make deal boards out of sawdust. This is no doubt intended as a joke, but there is abundance of evidence to show that dozens of schemes, hardly a whit more reasonable, lived their little day, ruining hundreds ere they fell. One of them was for a wheel for perpetual motion, capital one million. Another was for encouraging the breed of horses in England, and improving of glebe and church lands, and repairing and rebuilding parsonage and vicarage houses. Why the clergy, who were so mainly interested in the latter clause, should have taken so much interest in the first, is only to be explained on the supposition that the scheme was projected by a knot of the fox-hunting parsons once so common in England. The shares of this company were rapidly subscribed for, but the most absurd and preposterous of all, and which showed more completely than any other the utter madness of the people, was one started by an unknown adventurer, entitled, A Company for Carrying On an Undertaking of Great Advantage, But Nobody to Know What It Is. Were not the facts stated by scores of credible witnesses, it would be impossible to believe that any person could have been duped by such a project. The man of genius, who essayed this bold and successful inroad upon public credulity, merely stated in his prospectus that the required capital was half a million, in five thousand shares of a hundred pounds each, deposit two pounds per share. Each subscriber, paying his deposit, would be entitled to one hundred pounds per annum per share. How this immense profit was to be obtained, he did not condescend to inform them at that time, but promised that in a month full particulars should be duly announced, and a call made for the remaining ninety-eight pounds of the subscription. Next morning at nine o'clock, this great man opened an office in Cornhill. Crowds of people beset his door, and when he shut up at three o'clock, he found that no less than one thousand shares had been subscribed for, and the deposits paid. He was thus in five hours the winner of two thousand pounds. He was philosopher enough to be contented with his venture, and set off the same evening for the continent. He was never heard of again. Well might Swift exclaim, comparing Change Alley to a gulf in the South Sea, Subscribers here by thousands float, and jostle one another down, each paddling in his leaky boat, and here they fish for gold, and drown. Now buried in the depths below, now mounted up to heaven again, they reel and stagger to and fro, at their wit's end, like drunken men. Meantime, secure on Garraway cliffs, a savage race by shipwrecks fed, lie waiting for the foundered skiffs, and strip the bodies of the dead. Another fraud that was very successful was that of the globe permits, as they were called. They were nothing more than square pieces of playing cards, on which was the impression of a seal in wax, bearing the sign of the globe tavern, in the neighbourhood of Exchange Alley, with the inscription of sailcloth permits. The possessors enjoyed no other advantage from them than permission to subscribe at some future time to a new sailcloth manufactory, projected by one who was then known to be a man of fortune, but who was afterwards involved in the peculation and punishment of the South Sea directors. These permits sold for as much as sixty guineas in the alley. Persons of distinction of both sexes were deeply engaged in all these bubbles, 
those of the male sex going to the taverns and coffee-houses to meet their brokers, and the ladies resorting for the same purpose to the shops of milliners and haberdashers. But it did not follow that all these people believed in the feasibility of the schemes to which they subscribed. It was enough for their purpose that their shares would, by stock-jobbing arts, be soon raised to a premium, when they got rid of them, with all expedition, to the really credulous. So great was the confusion of the crowd in the alley, that shares in the same bubble were known to have been sold at the same instant, ten per cent higher, at one end of the alley than at the other. Sensible men beheld the extraordinary infatuation of the people with sorrow and alarm. There were some, both in and out of Parliament, who foresaw clearly the ruin that was impending. Mr. Walpole did not cease his gloomy forebodings. His fears were shared by all the thinking few, and impressed most forcibly upon the government. On the 11th of June, the day the Parliament rose, the King published a proclamation, declaring that all these unlawful projects should be deemed public nuisances, and prosecuted accordingly, and forbidding any broker, under penalty of five hundred pounds, from buying or selling any shares in them. Notwithstanding this proclamation, roguish speculators still carried them on, and the deluded people still encouraged them. On the 12th of July, an order of the Lord's Justice assembled in Privy Council was published, dismissing all the petitions that had been presented for patents and charters, and dissolving all the bubble companies. The following copy of their Lordship's order, containing a list of all these nefarious projects, would not be deemed uninteresting at the present time, when, at periodic intervals, there is but too much tendency in the public mind to indulge in similar practices. At the Council Chamber, Whitehall, the 12th day of July, 1720. Present, Their Excellencies, the Lords, Justices in Council. Their Excellencies, the Lords, Justices in Council, taking into consideration the many inconveniences arising to the public from several projects set on foot for raising of joint stock for various purposes, and that a great many of His Majesty's subjects have been drawn in to part with their money on pretence of assurances that their petitions for patents and charters to enable them to carry on the same would be granted. To prevent such impositions, their Excellencies this day ordered the said several petitions, together with such reports from the Board of Trade, and from His Majesty's Attorney and Solicitor General, as had been obtained thereon, to be laid before them, and after mature consideration thereof, were pleased, by advice of His Majesty's Privy Council, to order that the said petitions be dismissed, which are as follow. 1. Petition of several persons, praying letters patent for carrying on a fishing trade by the name of the Grand Fishery of Great Britain. 2. Petition of the Company of the Royal Fishery of England, praying letters patent for such further powers as will effectually contribute to carry on the said fishery. 3. Petition of George James, on behalf of himself and diverse persons of distinction, concerned in a national fishery, praying letters patent of incorporation, to enable them to carry on the same. 4. Petition of several merchants, traders, and others, whose names are thereunto subscribed, praying to be incorporated for reviving and carrying on a whale fishery to Greenland and elsewhere. 5. Petition of Sir John Lambert, and others thereto subscribing, on behalf of themselves and a great number of merchants, praying to be incorporated for carrying on a Greenland trade and particularly a whale fishery in Davis's Straits. 6. Another petition for a Greenland trade. 7. Petition of several merchants, gentlemen and citizens, praying to be incorporated for buying and building of ships to let or freight. 8. Petition of Samuel Antrim and others, praying for letters patent for sowing hemp and flax. 9. 
petition of several merchants, masters of ships, sail-makers, and manufacturers of sail-cloth, praying a charter of incorporation to enable them to carry on and promote the said manufactory by a joint stock. 10. Petition of Thomas Boyd and several hundred merchants, owners and masters of ships, sail-makers, weavers, and other traders, praying a charter of incorporation, empowering them to borrow money for purchasing lands, in order to the manufacturing sailcloth and fine Holland. 11. Petition on behalf of several persons interested in a patent granted by the late King William and Queen Mary for the making of linen and sailcloth, praying that no charter may be granted to any persons whatsoever for making sailcloth, but that the privilege now enjoyed by them may be confirmed and likewise an additional power to carry on the cotton and cotton silk manufactures. 12. Petition of several citizens, merchants and traders in London, and others, subscribers to a British stock for a general insurance from fire in any part of England, praying to be incorporated for carrying on the said undertaking. 13. Petition of several of His Majesty's loyal subjects of the City of London, and other parts of Great Britain, praying to be incorporated for carrying on a general insurance from losses by fire within the Kingdom of England. 14. Petition of Thomas Surges, and others His Majesty's subjects thereto subscribing, in behalf of themselves and others, subscribers to a fund of one million two hundred thousand pounds, for carrying on a trade to His Majesty's German dominions, praying to be incorporated by the name of the Harburg Company. 15. Petition of Edward Jones, a dealer in timber, on behalf of himself and others, praying to be incorporated for the importation of timber from Germany. 16. Petition of several merchants of London, praying a charter of incorporation for carrying on a salt work. 17. Petition of Captain MacFedris of London, merchant, on behalf of himself and several merchants, clothiers, hatters, dyers, and other traders, praying a charter of incorporation, empowering them to raise a sufficient sum of money to purchase lands for planting and rearing a wood called madder, for the use of dyers. 18. Petition of Joseph Galendo of London, snuff-maker, praying a patent for his invention to prepare and cure Virginia tobacco for snuff in Virginia, and making it into the same in all His Majesty's dominions. List of Bubbles The following bubble companies were by the same order declared to be illegal, and abolished accordingly. 1. For the importation of Swedish iron. 2. For supplying London with sea coal. Capital, three millions. 3. For building and rebuilding houses throughout all England. Capital, three millions. 4. For making of muslin. 5. For carrying on and improving the British alum works. 6. For effectually settling the island of Blanco and Sal Tartagus. 7. For supplying the town of Deal with fresh water. 8. For the importation of Flanders lace. 9. For the improvement of lands in Great Britain. Capital, 4 millions. 10. For encouraging the breed of horses in England, and improving of glebe and church lands, and for repairing and rebuilding parsonage and vicarage houses. 11. For making of iron and steel in Great Britain. 12. For improving the land in the county of Flint. Capital, 1 million. 13. For purchasing lands to build on. Capital, two millions. 14. For trading in hair. 15. For erecting salt works in Holy Ireland. Capital, two millions. 16. For buying and selling estates and lending money on mortgage. 17. For carrying on an undertaking of great advantage, but nobody to know what it is. 18. For paving the streets of London. Capital, two millions. 19. For furnishing funerals to any part of Great Britain. 20. 
for buying and selling lands and lending money at interest. Capital, five millions. 21. For carrying on the royal fishery of Great Britain. Capital, ten millions. 22. For assuring of seamen's wages. 23. For erecting loan offices for the assistance and encouragement of the industrious. Capital, two millions. 24. For purchasing and improving leasable lands. Capital, four millions. 25. For importing pitch and tar and other naval stores from North Britain and America. 26. For the clothing, felt and pantile trade. 27. For purchasing and improving a manor and royalty in Essex. 28. For insuring of horses. Capital, two millions. 29. For exporting the woollen manufacture and importing copper, brass and iron. Capital, four millions. 30. For a grand dispensary. Capital, three millions. 31. For erecting mills and purchasing lead mines. Capital, Two millions. Thirty two. For improving the art of making soap. Thirty three. For a settlement on the island of Santa Cruz. Thirty four. For sinking pits and smelting lead ore in Derbyshire. Thirty five. For making glass bottles and other glass. Thirty six. For a wheel for perpetual motion. Capital one million. Thirty seven. For improving of gardens. 38. For insuring and increasing children's fortunes. 39. For entering and loading goods at the custom house and for negotiating business for merchants. 40. For carrying on a woollen manufacture in the north of England. 41. For importing walnut trees from Virginia. Capital, two millions. 42. For making Manchester stuffs of thread and cotton. 43. For making Joppa and Castile soap. 44. For improving the wrought iron and steel manufactures of this kingdom. Capital, four millions. 45. For dealing in lace, hollands, cambrics, lawns, etc. Capital, two millions. 46. For trading in and improving certain commodities of the produce of this kingdom, etc. Capital, three millions. 47. For supplying the London markets with cattle. 48. For making looking glasses, coach glasses, etc. Capital, two millions. 49. For working the tin and lead mines in Cornwall and Derbyshire. 50. For making rape oil. 51. For importing beaver fur. Capital, two millions. 52. For making pasteboard and packing paper. 53. For importing of oils and other materials used in the woollen manufacture. 54. For improving and increasing the silk manufactures. 55. For lending money on stock, annuities, tallies, etc. 56. For paying pension to widows and others at a small discount. Capital, two millions. 57. For improving malt liquors. Capital, four millions. 58. For a grand American fishery. 59. For purchasing and improving the fenny lands in Lincolnshire. Capital, two millions. 60. For improving the paper manufacture of Great Britain. 61. The Bottomry Company. 62. For drying malt by hot air. 63. For carrying on a trade in the river Orinoco. 64. For the more effectual making of bays in Colchester and other parts of Great Britain. 65. For buying of naval stores, supplying the victualling and paying the wages of the workmen. 66. For employing poor artificers and furnishing merchants and others with watches. 67. For improvement of tillage and the breed of cattle. 68. Another for the improvement of our breed in horses. 69. Another for a horse insurance. 
70. For carrying on the corn trade of Great Britain. 71. For insuring to all masters and mistresses the losses they may sustain by servants. Capital, three millions. 72. For erecting houses or hospitals for taking in and maintaining illegitimate children. Capital, two millions. 73. For bleaching coarse sugars without the use of fire or loss of substance. 74. For building turnpikes and wharfs in Great Britain. 75. For insuring from thefts and robberies. 76. For extracting silver from lead. 77. For making china and delft ware. Capital, one million. 78. For importing tobacco and exporting it again to Sweden and the north of Europe. Capital, four millions. 79. For making iron with pit coal. 80. For furnishing the cities of London and Westminster with hay and straw. Capital, three millions. 81. For a sale and packing cloth manufactory in Ireland. 82. For taking up ballast. 83. For buying and fitting out ships to suppress pirates. 84. For the importation of timber from Wales. Capital, two millions. 85. For rock salt. 86. For the transmutation of quicksilver into a malleable fine metal. Beside these bubbles, many others sprang up daily, in spite of the condemnation of the government and the ridicule of the still sane portion of the public. The print shops teemed with caricatures, and the newspapers with epigrams and satires upon the prevalent folly. An ingenious card-maker published a pack of South Sea playing cards, which are now extremely rare, each card containing, besides the usual figures of a very small size in one corner, a caricature of a bubble company, with appropriate verses underneath. One of the most famous bubbles was Puckle's Machine Company, for discharging round and square cannonballs and bullets, and making a total revolution in the art of war. Its pretensions to public favour were thus summed up on the Eight of Spades. A rare invention to destroy the crowd of fools at home, instead of fools abroad. Fear not, my friends, this terrible machine. They're only wounded who have shares therein. The Nine of Hearts was a caricature of the English Copper and Brass Company, with the following epigram. The headlong fool that wants to be a swapper of gold and silver coin for English copper may, in Change Alley, prove himself an ass, and give rich metal for adulterate brass. The Eight of Diamonds celebrated the company for the colonisation of Acadia, with this doggerel. He that is rich and wants to fool away a good round sum in North America, let him subscribe himself a headlong sharer, and ass's ears shall honour him or bearer and in a similar style every card of the pack exposed some knavish scheme, and ridiculed the persons who were its dupes. It was computed that the total amount of the sums proposed for carrying on these projects was upwards of three hundred millions sterling. End of chapter 2, part 1「Two, Part Two of Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds by Charles Mackay Volume 1 The South Sea Bubble Part 2 It is time, however, to return to the great South Sea Gulf that swallowed the fortunes of so many thousands of the avaricious and the credulous. 
On the 29th of May, the stock had risen as high as 500, and about two-thirds of the government annuitants had exchanged the securities of the state for those of the South Sea Company. During the whole of the month of May, the stock continued to rise, and on the 28th it was quoted at 550. In four days after this, it took a prodigious leap, rising suddenly from 550 to 890. It was now the general opinion that the stock could rise no higher, and many persons took that opportunity of selling out, with a view of realising their profits. Many noblemen and persons in the train of the king, and about to accompany him to Hanover, were also anxious to sell out. So many sellers, and so few buyers, appeared in the alley on the 3rd of June, that the stock fell at once from 890 to 640. The directors were alarmed, and gave their agents orders to buy. Their efforts succeeded. Towards evening confidence was restored, and the stock advanced to 750. It continued at this price, with some slight fluctuation, until the company closed their books on the 22nd of June. It would be needless and uninteresting to detail the various arts employed by the directors to keep up the price of stock. It will be sufficient to state that it finally rose to 1,000%. It was quoted at this price in the commencement of August. The bubble was then full-blown, and began to quiver and shake, preparatory to its bursting. Many of the government annuitants expressed dissatisfaction against the directors. They accused them of partiality in making out the lists for shares in each subscription. Further uneasiness was occasioned by its being generally known that Sir John Blunt, the chairman, and some others had sold out. During the whole of the month of August the stock fell, and on the 2nd of September it was quoted at 700 only. The state of things now became alarming. To prevent, if possible, the utter extinction of public confidence in their proceedings, the directors summoned a general court of the whole corporation to meet in Merchant Taylor's Hall on the 8th of September. By nine o'clock in the morning the room was filled to suffocation. Cheapside was blocked up by a crowd unable to gain admittance, and the greatest excitement prevailed the directors and their friends mustered in great numbers. Sir John Fellows, the sub-governor, was called to the chair. He acquainted the assembly with the cause of their meeting, read to them the several resolutions of the court of directors, and gave them an account of their proceedings, of the taking in the redeemable and unredeemable funds, and of the subscriptions in money. Mr. Secretary Craggs then made a short speech, wherein he commended the conduct of the directors, and urged that nothing could more effectually contribute to the bringing this scheme to perfection than union among themselves. He concluded with a motion for thanking the Court of Directors for their prudent and skilful management, and for desiring them to proceed in such manner as they should think most proper for the interest and advantage of the corporation. Mr. Hungerford, who had rendered himself very conspicuous in the House of Commons for his zeal in behalf of the South Sea Company, and who was shrewdly suspected to have been a considerable gainer by knowing the right time to sell out, was very magniloquent on this occasion. He said that he had seen the rise and fall, the decay and resurrection, of many communities of this nature, but that, in his opinion, none had ever performed such wonderful things in so short a time as the South Sea Company. They had done more than the crown, the pulpit, or the bench could do. They had reconciled all parties in one common interest. They had laid asleep, if not wholly extinguished, all the domestic jars and animosities of the nation. By the rise of their stock, Moneyed men had vastly increased their fortunes. Country gentlemen had seen the value of their lands doubled and trebled in their hands. They had at the same time done good to the church, not a few of the reverent clergy having got great sums by the project. In short, they had enriched the whole nation, and he hoped they had not forgotten themselves. 
there was some hissing at the latter part of this speech, which, for the extravagance of its eulogy, was not far removed from satire, but the directors and their friends, and all the winners in the room, applauded vehemently. The Duke of Portland spoke in a similar strain, and expressed his great wonder why anybody should be dissatisfied. Of course, he was a winner by his speculations, and in a condition similar to that of the fat alderman in Joe Miller's jests, who, whenever he had eaten a good dinner, folded his hands upon his paunch, and expressed his doubts whether there could be a hungry man in the world. Several resolutions were passed at this meeting, but they had no effect upon the public. Upon the very same evening the stock fell to six hundred and forty, and on the morrow to five hundred and forty. Day after day it continued to fall, until it was as low as four hundred. In a letter dated September the 13th, from Mr. Broderick, M.P., to Lord Chancellor Middleton, and published in Cox's Walpole, the former says, Various are the conjectures why the South Sea directors have suffered the cloud to break so early. I made no doubt, but they would do so when they found it to their advantage. They have stretched credit so far beyond what it would bear, that specie proves insufficient to support it. Their most considerable men have drawn out, securing themselves by the losses of the deluded, thoughtless numbers, whose understandings have been overruled by avarice, and the hope of making mountains out of molehills. Thousands of families will be reduced to beggary. The consternation is inexpressible, the rage beyond description, and the case altogether so desperate that I do not see any plan or scheme so much as thought of for averting the blow, so that I cannot pretend to guess what is next to be done. Ten days afterwards, the stock still falling, he writes, the company have yet come to no determination, for they are in such a wood that they know not which way to turn. By several gentlemen lately come to town, I perceive the very name of a South Sea man grows abominable in every country. A great many goldsmiths are already run off, and more will daily. I question whether one-third, nay, one-fourth of them can stand it. From the very beginning I founded my judgment of the whole affair upon the unquestionable maxim that ten millions, which is more than our running cash, could not circulate two hundred millions, beyond which our paper credit extended. That therefore, whenever that should become doubtful, be the cause what it would, our noble state machine must inevitably fall to the ground. On the 12th of September, at the earnest solicitation of Mr. Secretary Craggs, several conferences were held between the directors of the South Sea and the directors of the bank. A report which was circulated, that the latter had agreed to circulate six millions of the South Sea Company's bonds, caused the stock to rise to six hundred and seventy. But in the afternoon, as soon as the report was known to be groundless, the stock fell again to five hundred and eighty, the next day to five hundred and seventy, and so gradually to four hundred. The Ministry were seriously alarmed at the aspect of affairs. The directors could not appear in the streets without being insulted. Dangerous riots were every moment apprehended. Dispatches were sent off to the King at Hanover, praying his immediate return. Mr. Walpole, who was staying at his country seat, was sent for, that he might employ his known influence with the directors of the Bank of England, to induce them to accept the proposal made by the South Sea Company for circulating a number of their bonds. The bank was very unwilling to mix itself up with the affairs of the company. It dreaded being involved in calamities which it could not relieve, and received all overtures with visible reluctance but the universal voice of the nation called upon it to come to the rescue. Every person of note in commercial politics was called in to advise in the emergency. A rough draft of a contract drawn up by Mr. Walpole was ultimately adopted as the basis of further negotiations, and the public alarm abated a little. On the following day, the 20th of September, a general court of the South Sea Company was held at Merchant Taylors Hall, in which resolutions were carried, 
empowering the directors to agree with the Bank of England, or any other persons, to circulate the company's bonds, or make any other agreement with the bank which they should think proper. One of the speakers, a Mr. Pulteney, said it was most surprising to see the extraordinary panic which had seized upon the people. Men were running to and fro in alarm and terror, their imaginations filled with some great calamity, the form and dimensions of which nobody knew. Black it stood as night, fierce as ten furies, terrible as hell. At a general court of the Bank of England held two days afterwards, the Governor informed them of the several meetings that had been held on the affairs of the South Sea Company, adding that the directors had not yet thought fit to come to any decision upon the matter. A resolution was then proposed, and carried without a dissentient voice, empowering the directors to agree with those of the South Sea to circulate their bonds, to what sum, and upon what terms, and for what time, they might think proper. Thus both parties were at liberty to act as they might judge best for the public interest. Books were opened at the bank for a subscription of three millions for the support of public credit, on the usual terms of a 151% deposit, 31% premium, and 51% interest. So great was the concourse of people in the early part of the morning, all eagerly bringing their money, that it was thought the subscription would be filled that day. But before noon the tide turned. In spite of all that could be done to prevent it, the South Sea Company's stock fell rapidly. Their bonds were in such discredit that a run commenced upon the most eminent goldsmiths and bankers, some of whom, having lent out great sums upon South Sea stock, were obliged to shut up their shops and abscond. The Sword Blade Company, which had hitherto been the chief cashiers of the South Sea Company, stopped payment. This being looked upon as but the beginning of evil, occasioned a great run upon the bank, who were now obliged to pay out money much faster than they had received it upon the subscription in the morning. The day succeeding was a holiday, the 29th of September, and the bank had a little breathing time. They bore up against the storm, but their former rivals, the South Sea Company, were wrecked upon it. Their stock fell to 150, and gradually, after various fluctuations, to 135. The bank, finding they were not able to restore public confidence and stem the tide of ruin, without running the risk of being swept away with those they intended to save, declined to carry out the agreement into which they had partially entered. They were under no obligation whatever to continue, for the so-called bank contract was nothing more than the rough draft of an agreement, in which blanks had been left for several important particulars, and which contained no penalty for their secession. And thus, to use the words of the parliamentary history, were seen in the space of eight months, the rise, progress, and fall of that mighty fabric, which, being wound up by mysterious springs to a wonderful height, had fixed the eyes and expectations of all Europe, but whose foundation, being fraud, illusion, credulity, and infatuation, fell to the ground as soon as the artful management of its directors was discovered. In the heyday of its blood, during the progress of this dangerous delusion, the manners of the nation became sensibly corrupted. The parliamentary inquiry, set on foot to discover the delinquents, disclosed scenes of infamy, disgraceful alike to the morals of the offenders and the intellects of the people among whom they had arisen. It is a deeply interesting study to investigate all the evils that were the result. Nations, like individuals, cannot become desperate gamblers with impunity. Punishment is sure to overtake them sooner or later. A celebrated writer, Smollett, is quite wrong when he says that such an era as this is the most unfavourable for a historian, that no reader of sentiment and imagination can be entertained or interested by a detail of transactions such as these, which admit of no warmth, no colouring, no embellishment, a detail of which only serves to exhibit an inanimate picture of tasteless vice and mean degeneracy. 
on the contrary, and Smollett might have discovered it, if he had been in the humour, the subject is capable of inspiring as much interest as even a novelist can desire. Is there no warmth in the despair of a plundered people, no life and animation in the picture which might be drawn of the woes of hundreds of impoverished and ruined families, of the wealthy of yesterday become the beggars of to-day, of the powerful and influential changed into exiles and outcasts, and the voice of self-reproach and imprecation resounding from every corner of the land. Is it a dull or uninstructive picture to see a whole people shaking suddenly off the trammels of reason, and running wild after a golden vision, refusing obstinately to believe that it is not real, till, like a deluded hind running after an ignis fatuous, they are plunged into a quagmire? But in this false spirit has history too often been written. The intrigues of unworthy courtiers to gain the favour of still more unworthy kings, or the records of murderous battles and sieges, have been dilated on, and told over and over again, with all the eloquence of style, and all the charms of fancy, while the circumstances which have most deeply affected the morals and welfare of the people have been passed over with but slight notice, as dry and dull, and capable of neither warmth nor colouring. During the progress of this famous bubble, England presented a singular spectacle. The public mind was in a state of unwholesome fermentation. Men were no longer satisfied with the slow but sure profits of cautious industry. The hope of boundless wealth for the morrow made them heedless and extravagant for to-day. A luxury, till then unheard of, was introduced, bringing in its train a corresponding laxity of morals. The overbearing insolence of ignorant men, who had arisen to sudden wealth by successful gambling, made men of true gentility of mind and manners blush that gold should have the power to raise the unworthy in the scale of society. The haughtiness of some of these ciphering sits, as they were termed by Sir Richard Steele, was remembered against them in the day of their adversity. In the parliamentary inquiry, many of the directors suffered more for their insolence than for their peculation. One of them, who, in the full-blown pride of an ignorant rich man, had said that he would feed his horse upon gold, was reduced almost to bread and water for himself. Every haughty look, every overbearing speech, was set down, and repaid them a hundredfold in poverty and humiliation. The state of manners all over the country was so alarming that George I shortened his intended stay in Hanover, and returned in all haste to England. He arrived on the 11th of November, and Parliament was summoned to meet on the 8th of December. In the meantime, public meetings were held in every considerable town of the Empire, at which petitions were adopted, praying the vengeance of the legislature upon the South Sea directors, who, by their fraudulent practices, had brought the nation to the brink of ruin. Nobody seemed to imagine that the nation itself was as culpable as the South Sea Company. Nobody blamed the credulity and avarice of the people, the degrading lust of gain, which had swallowed up every nobler quality in the national character or the infatuation which had made the multitude run their heads with such frantic eagerness into the net held out for them by scheming projectors. These things were never mentioned. The people were a simple, honest, hard-working people, ruined by a gang of robbers, who were to be hanged, drawn, and quartered without mercy. This was the almost unanimous feeling of the country. The two Houses of Parliament were not more reasonable. Before the guilt of the South Sea directors was known, punishment was the only cry. The King, in his speech from the throne, expressed his hope that they would remember that all their prudence, temper, and resolution were necessary to find out and apply the proper remedy for their misfortunes. In the debate on the answer to the address, Several speakers indulged in the most violent invectives against the directors of the South Sea project. The Lord Molesworth was particularly vehement. It had been said by some 
that there was no law to punish the directors of the South Sea Company, who were justly looked upon as the authors of the present misfortunes of the State. In his opinion, they ought upon this occasion to follow the example of the ancient Romans, who, having no law against parricide, because their legislators supposed no son could be so unnaturally wicked as to imbrue his hands in his father's blood, made a law to punish this heinous crime as soon as it was committed. They adjudged the guilty wretch to be sown in a sack and thrown alive into the Tiber. He looked upon the contrivers and executors of the villainous South Sea scheme as the parricides of their country, and should be satisfied to see them tied in like manner in sacks, and thrown into the Thames. Other members spoke with as much want of temper and discretion. Mr. Walpole was more moderate. He recommended that their first care should be to restore public credit. If the City of London were on fire, all wise men would aid in extinguishing the flames, and preventing the spread of the conflagration, before they inquired after the incendiaries. Public credit had received a dangerous wound, and lay bleeding, and they ought to apply a speedy remedy to it. It was time enough to punish the assassin afterwards. On the ninth of December an address, in answer to His Majesty's speech, was agreed upon, after an amendment, which was carried without a division, that words should be added expressive of the determination of the House not only to seek a remedy for the national distresses, but to punish the authors of them. The inquiry proceeded rapidly. The directors were ordered to lay before the House a full account of all their proceedings. Resolutions were passed to the effect that the calamity was mainly owing to the vile arts of stock-jobbers, and that nothing could tend more to the re-establishment of public credit than a law to prevent this infamous practice. Mr. Walpole then rose and said that, as he had previously hinted, he had spent some time upon a scheme for restoring public credit, but that the execution of it, depending upon a position which had been laid down as fundamental, he thought it proper, before he opened out his scheme, to be informed whether he might rely upon that foundation. It was whether the subscription of public debts and encumbrances, money subscriptions and other contracts, made with the South Sea Company, should remain in the present state. This question occasioned an animated debate. It was finally agreed by a majority of 259 against 117 that all these contracts should remain in their present state, unless altered for the relief of the proprietors by a general court of the South Sea Company, or set aside by due course of law. On the following day, Mr. Walpole laid before a committee of the whole house his scheme for the restoration of public credit, which was, in substance, to engraft nine millions of South Sea stock into the Bank of England, and the same sum into the East India Company, upon certain conditions. The plan was favourably received by the House. After some few objections, it was ordered that proposals should be received from the two great corporations. They were both unwilling to lend their aid, and the plan met with a warm but fruitless opposition at the general courts summoned for the purpose of deliberating upon it. They, however, ultimately agreed upon the terms on which they would consent to circulate the South Sea bonds, and their report being presented to the committee, a bill was brought in under the superintendence of Mr. Walpole, and safely carried through both Houses of Parliament. A bill was at the same time brought in for restraining the South Sea directors, governor, sub-governor, treasurer, cashier, and clerks, from leaving the kingdom for a twelve-month, and for discovering their estates and effects, and preventing them from transporting or alienating the same. All the most influential members of the House supported the bill. Mr. Shippen, seeing Mr. Secretary Craggs in his place, and believing the injurious rumours that were afloat of that minister's conduct in the South Sea business, determined to touch him to the quick. He said he was glad to see a British House of Commons resuming its pristine vigour and spirit, and acting with so much unanimity for the public good. 
it was necessary to secure the persons and estates of the South Sea directors and their officers. But, he added, looking fixedly at Mr. Craggs as he spoke, there were other men in the high station whom, in time, he would not be afraid to name, who were no less guilty than the directors. Mr. Craggs arose in great wrath, and said that if the innuendo were directed against him, he was ready to give satisfaction to any man who questioned him, either in the house or out of it. Loud cries of order immediately arose on every side. In the midst of the uproar, Lord Molesworth got up, and expressed his wonder at the boldness of Mr. Craggs in challenging the whole House of Commons. He, Lord Molesworth, though somewhat old, past sixty, would answer Mr. Craggs whatever he had to say in the House, and he trusted there were plenty of young men beside him who would not be afraid to look Mr. Craggs in the face out of the House. The cries of order again resounded from every side. The members arose simultaneously. Everybody seemed to be vociferating at once. The speaker in vain called order. The confusion lasted several minutes, during which Lord Molesworth and Mr. Craggs were almost the only members who kept their seats. At last the call for Mr. Craggs became so violent that he thought proper to submit to the universal feeling of the House, and explain his unparliamentary expression. He said that by giving satisfaction to the impugners of his conduct in that House, he did not mean that he would fight, but that he would explain his conduct. Here the matter ended, and the House proceeded to debate in what manner they should conduct their inquiry into the affairs of the South Sea Company, whether in a grand or a select committee. Ultimately, a secret committee of thirteen was appointed, with power to send for persons, papers, and records. The Lords were as zealous and as hasty as the Commons. The Bishop of Rochester said the scheme had been like a pestilence. The Duke of Wharton said the House ought to show no respect of persons, that, for his part, he would give up the dearest friend he had, if he had been engaged in the project. The nation had been plundered in a most shameful and flagrant manner, and he would go so far as anybody in the punishment of the offenders. Lord Stanhope said, that every farthing possessed by the criminals, whether directors or not directors, ought to be confiscated to make good the public losses. During all this time the public excitement was extreme. We learn from Cox's Walpole that the very name of a South Sea director was thought to be synonymous with every species of fraud and villainy. Petitions from counties, cities and boroughs in all parts of the kingdom were presented crying for the justice due to an injured nation, and the punishment of the villainous peculators. Those moderate men, who would not go to extreme lengths, even in the punishment of the guilty, were accused of being accomplices, were exposed to repeated insults and virulent invectives, and devoted, both in anonymous letters and public writings, to the speedy vengeance of an injured people. The accusations against Mr. Aislaby, Chancellor of the Exchequer, and Mr. Craggs, another member of the Ministry, were so loud that the House of Lords resolved to proceed at once into the investigation concerning them. It was ordered on the 21st of January that all brokers concerned in the South Sea scheme should lay before the House an account of the stock or subscriptions bought or sold by them for any of the officers of the Treasury or Exchequer, or in trust for any of them, since Michaelmas 1719. When this account was delivered, it appeared that large quantities of stock had been transferred to the use of Mr. Aislaby. Five of the South Sea directors, including Mr. Edward Gibbon, the grandfather of the celebrated historian, were ordered into the custody of the Black Rod. Upon a motion made by Earl Stanhope, it was unanimously resolved that the taking in or giving credit for stock without a valuable consideration actually paid or sufficiently secured, or the purchasing stock by any director or agent of the South Sea Company for the use or benefit of any member of the administration, 
or any member of either House of Parliament, during such time as the South Sea Bill was yet pending in Parliament, was a notorious and dangerous corruption. Another resolution was passed a few days afterwards, to the effect that several of the directors and officers of the company, having, in a clandestine manner, sold their own stock to the company, had been guilty of a notorious fraud and breach of trust, and had thereby mainly caused the unhappy turn of affairs that had so much affected public credit. Mr. Aislaby resigned his office as Chancellor of the Exchequer, and absented himself from Parliament, until the formal inquiry into his individual guilt was brought under the consideration of the legislature. End of section 5 End of chapter 2, part 2「2 Part 3 of Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Volume 1, by Charles Mackay. The South Sea Bubble, Part 3. In the meantime, Knight, the treasurer of the company, and who was entrusted with all the dangerous secrets of the dishonest directors, packed up his books and documents, and made his escape from the country. He embarked in disguise in a small boat on the river, and proceeding to a vessel hired for the purpose, was safely conveyed to Calais. The Committee of Secrecy informed the House of the circumstance, when it was resolved unanimously that two addresses should be presented to the King, the first praying that he would issue a proclamation offering a reward for the apprehension of night, and the second that he would give immediate orders to stop the ports, and to take effectual care of the coasts, to prevent the said knight or any other officers of the South Sea Company from escaping out of the kingdom. The ink was hardly dry upon these addresses, before they were carried to the king by Mr. Methuen, deputed by the house for that purpose. The same evening a royal proclamation was issued, offering a reward of two thousand pounds for the apprehension of night. The commons ordered the doors of the house to be locked, and the keys to be placed on the table. General Ross, one of the members of the Committee of Secrecy, acquainted them that they had already discovered a train of the deepest villainy and fraud that hell had ever contrived to ruin a nation, which in due time they would lay before the house. In the meantime, in order to a further discovery, the committee thought it highly necessary to secure the persons of some of the directors and the principal South Sea officers, and to seize their papers. A motion to this effect having been made was carried unanimously. Sir Robert Chaplin, Sir Theodore Janssen, Mr. Sawbridge, and Mr. F. Isles, members of the House, and directors of the South Sea Company, were summoned to appear in their places, and answer for their corrupt practices. Sir Theodore Janssen and Mr. Sawbridge answered to their names, and endeavoured to exculpate themselves. The House heard them patiently, and then ordered them to withdraw. A motion was then made and carried, nemine contradicente, that they had been guilty of a notorious breach of trust, had occasioned much loss to great numbers of His Majesty's subjects, and had highly prejudiced the public credit. It was then ordered that, for their offence, they should be expelled the house, and taken into the custody of the sergeant-at-arms. Sir Robert Chaplin and Mr. Isles, attending in their places four days afterwards, were also expelled the house. It was resolved at the same time to address the King to give directions to his ministers at foreign courts, to make application for night, that he might be delivered up to the English authorities, in case he took refuge in any of their dominions. 
The king at once agreed, and messengers were dispatched to all parts of the continent the same night. Among the directors taken into custody was Sir John Blunt, the man whom popular opinion has generally accused of having been the original author and father of the scheme. This man, we are informed by Pope, in his epistle to Allen, Lord Bathurst, was a dissenter of a most religious deportment, and professed to be a great believer. "'God cannot love,' says Blunt, with tearless eyes, "'the wretch he starves and piously denies. "'Much injured Blunt, why bears he Britain's hate? "'A wizard told him in these words our fate. "'At length corruption, like a general flood, "'so long by watchful ministers withstood, "'shall deluge all, and avarice, creeping on, "'spread like a low-born mist and blot the sun.' Statesman and patriot ply alike the stocks, Peeress and butler share alike the box, And judges job and bishops bite the town, And mighty dukes pack cards for half a crown. See Britain sunk in Lucas' forbid charms, And France revenged of Anne's and Edward's arms. T'was no court badge, great Scrivener, fired thy brain, nor lordly luxury, nor city gain. No, t'was thy righteous end, ashamed to see Senates degenerate, patriots disagree, and nobly wishing party rage to cease, to buy both sides, and give thy country peace. Pope's Epistle to Allen, Lord Bathurst he constantly declaimed against the luxury and corruption of the age, the partiality of parliaments, and the misery of party spirit. He was particularly eloquent against avarice in great and noble persons. He was originally a scrivener, and afterwards became not only a director, but the most active manager of the South Sea Company. Whether it was during his career in this capacity that he first began to declaim against the avarice of the great, we are not informed. He certainly must have seen enough of it to justify his severest anathema, but if the preacher had himself been free from the vice he condemned, his declamations would have had a better effect. He was brought up in custody to the bar of the House of Lords, and underwent a long examination. He refused to answer several important questions. He said he had been examined already by a committee of the House of Commons, and, as he did not remember his answers, and might contradict himself, he refused to answer before another tribunal. This declaration, in itself an indirect proof of guilt, occasioned some commotion in the House. He was again asked peremptorily whether he had ever sold any portion of the stock to any member of the administration, or any member of either House of Parliament, to facilitate the passing of the bill. He again declined to answer. He was anxious, he said, to treat the House with all possible respect, but he thought it hard to be compelled to accuse himself. After several ineffectual attempts to refresh his memory, he was directed to withdraw. A violent discussion ensued between the friends and opponents of the ministry. It was asserted that the administration were no strangers to the convenient taciturnity of Sir John Blunt. The Duke of Wharton made a reflection upon the Earl Stanhope, which the latter warmly resented. He spoke under great excitement, and with such vehemence as to cause a sudden determination of blood to the head. He felt himself so ill that he was obliged to leave the house and retire to his chamber. He was cupped immediately, and also let blood on the following morning, but with slight relief. The fatal result was not anticipated. Towards evening he became drowsy, and turning himself on his face, expired. The sudden death of this statesman caused great grief to the nation. George the First was exceedingly affected, and shut himself up for some hours in his closet, inconsolable for his loss. Knight, the treasurer of the company, was apprehended at Tourlemont, near Liège, by one of the secretaries of Mr. Leiths, the British resident at Brussels, and lodged in the citadel of Antwerp. Repeated applications were made to the court of Austria to deliver him up, but in vain. 
Knight threw himself upon the protection of the states of Brabant, and demanded to be tried in that country. It was a privilege granted to the states of Brabant by one of the articles of the Joyeuse Entrée, that every criminal apprehended in that country should be tried in that country. The states insisted on their privilege, and refused to deliver Knight to the British authorities. The latter did not cease their solicitations, but in the meantime Knight escaped from the citadel. On the 16th of February, the Committee of Secrecy made their first report to the House. They stated that their inquiry had been attended with numerous difficulties and embarrassments. Every one they had examined had endeavoured, as far as in him lay, to defeat the ends of justice. In some of the books produced before them, false and fictitious entries had been made. In others, there were entries of money with blanks for the names of the stockholders. There were frequent erasures and alterations, and in some of the books, leaves were torn out. They also found that some books of great importance had been destroyed altogether, and that some had been taken away or secreted. At the very entrance into their inquiry, they had observed that the matters referred to them were of great variety and extent. Many persons had been entrusted with various parts in the execution of the law, and under colour thereof had acted in an unwarrantable manner in disposing of the properties of many thousands of persons, amounting to many millions of money. They discovered that, before the South Sea Act was passed, there was an entry in the company's book of the sum of one million two hundred and fifty nine thousand three hundred and twenty five pounds, upon account of the stock stated to have been sold to the amount of five hundred and seventy four thousand five hundred pounds. This stock was all fictitious, and had been disposed of with a view to promote the passing of the bill. It was noted as sold on various days, and at various prices, from one hundred and fifty to three hundred and twenty-five per cent. Being surprised to see so large an account disposed of at a time when the company were not empowered to increase their capital, the committee determined to investigate most carefully the whole transaction. The governor, sub-governor, and several directors were brought before them, and examined rigidly. They found that, at the time these entries were made, the company was not in possession of such a quantity of stock, having in their own right only a small quantity, not exceeding thirty thousand pounds at the utmost. Pursuing the inquiry, they found that this amount of stock was to be esteemed as taken in or holden by the company for the benefit of the pretended purchasers, although no mutual agreement was made for its delivery or acceptance at any certain time. No money was paid down, nor any deposit or security whatever given to the company by the supposed purchasers, so that if the stock had fallen, as might have been expected had the act not passed, they would have sustained no loss. If, on the contrary, the price of stock advanced, as it actually did by the success of the scheme, the difference by the advanced price was to be made good to them. Accordingly, after the passing of the Act, the account of stock was made up and adjusted with Mr. Knight, and the pretended purchasers were paid the difference out of the company's cash. This fictitious stock, which had been chiefly at the disposal of Sir John Blunt, Mr. Gibbon, and Mr. Knight, was distributed among several members of the government and their connections, by way of bribe, to facilitate the passing of the bill. To the Earl of Sunderland was assigned fifty thousand pounds of this stock, to the Duchess of Kendal ten thousand pounds, to the Countess of Platten ten thousand pounds, to her two nieces ten thousand pounds, to Mr. Secretary Craggs thirty thousand pounds, to Mr. Charles Stanhope, one of the Secretaries of the Treasury, ten thousand pounds, to the Sword Blade Company fifty thousand pounds. It also appeared that Mr. Stanhope had received the enormous sum of two hundred and fifty thousand pounds as the difference in the price of some stock through the hands of Turner, Caswell and Company, but that his name had been partly erased from their books and altered to Stangape. Aislaby, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, had made profits still more abominable. 
he had an account with the same firm, who were also South Sea directors, to the amount of seven hundred and ninety-four thousand four hundred and fifty-one pounds. He had besides advised the company to make their second subscription one million and a half instead of a million, by their own authority and without any warrant. The third subscription had been conducted in a manner as disgraceful. Mr. Aislaby's name was down for £70,000, Mr. Craggs senior for £659,000, the Earl of Sunderland's for £160,000, and Mr. Stanhope for £47,000. This report was succeeded by six others less important. At the end of the last, the committee declared that the absence of Knight, who had been principally entrusted, prevented them from carrying on their inquiries. The first report was ordered to be printed, and taken into consideration on the next day but one succeeding. After a very angry and animated debate, a series of resolutions were agreed to, condemnatory of the conduct of the directors, of the members of the Parliament, and of the administration concerned with them, and declaring that they ought, each and all, to make satisfaction out of their own estates for the injury they had done the public. Their practices were declared to be corrupt, infamous, and dangerous, and a bill was ordered to be brought in for the relief of the unhappy sufferers. Mr. Charles Stanhope was the first person brought to account for his share in these transactions. He urged in his defence that, for some years past, he had lodged all the money he was possessed of in Mr. Knight's hands, and whatever stock Mr. Knight had taken in for him, he had paid a valuable consideration for it. As for the stock that had been bought for him by Turner, Caswall, and Co., he knew nothing about it. Whatever had been done in that matter was done without his authority, and he could not be responsible for it. Turner and Company took the latter charge upon themselves, but it was notorious to every unbiased and unprejudiced person that Mr. Stanhope was a gainer of the two hundred and fifty thousand pounds which lay in the hands of that firm to his credit. He was, however, acquitted by a majority of three only. The greatest exertions were made to screen him. Lord Stanhope, the son of the Earl of Chesterfield, went round to the wavering members, using all the eloquence he was possessed of, to induce them either to vote for the acquittal, or to absent themselves from the house. Many weak-headed country gentlemen were led astray by his persuasions, and the result was, as already stated, the acquittal caused the greatest discontent throughout the country. Mobs of a menacing character assembled in different parts of London. Fears of riots were generally entertained, especially as the examination of a still greater delinquent was expected by many to have a similar termination. Mr. Aislaby, whose high office and deep responsibilities should have kept him honest, even had native principle been insufficient, was very justly regarded as perhaps the greatest criminal of all. His case was entered into on the day succeeding the acquittal of Mr. Stanhope. Great excitement prevailed, and the lobbies and avenues of the house were beset by crowds impatient to know the result. The debate lasted the whole day. Mr. Aislaby found few friends. His guilt was so apparent and so heinous that nobody had courage to stand up in his favour. It was finally resolved, without a dissentient voice, that Mr. Aislaby had encouraged and promoted the destructive execution of the South Sea scheme, with a view to his own exorbitant profit, and had combined with the directors in their pernicious practices to the ruin of the public trade and credit of the kingdom, that he should, for his offences, be ignominiously expelled from the House of Commons, and committed a close prisoner to the Tower of London that he should be restrained from going out of the kingdom for a whole year, or till the end of the next session of Parliament, and that he should make out a correct account of all his estate, in order that it might be applied to the relief of those who had suffered by his malpractices. This verdict caused the greatest joy. Though it was delivered at half-past twelve at night, it soon spread over the city, Several persons illuminated their houses in token of their joy. 
On the following day, when Mr. Aislaby was conveyed to the tower, the mob assembled on Tower Hill with the intention of hooting and pelting him. Not succeeding in this, they kindled a large bonfire and danced around it in the exuberance of their delight. Several bonfires were made in other places. London presented the appearance of a holiday, and people congratulated one another as if they had just escaped from some great calamity. The rage upon the acquittal of Mr. Stanhope had grown to such a height that none could tell where it would have ended, had Mr. Aislaby met with the like indulgence. To increase the public satisfaction, Sir George Caswell, of the firm of Turner, Caswell and Company, was expelled from the house on the following day, committed to the tower, and ordered to refund the sum of two hundred and fifty thousand pounds. That part of the report of the Committee of Secrecy, which related to the Earl of Sunderland, was next taken into consideration. Every effort was made to clear his lordship from the imputation, as the case against him rested chiefly on the evidence extorted from Sir John Blunt, great pains were taken to make it appear that Sir John's word was not to be believed, especially in a matter affecting the honour of a peer and privy councillor. All the friends of the ministry rallied round the Earl, it being generally reported that a verdict of guilty against him would bring a Tory ministry into power. He was eventually acquitted by a majority of 233 against 172, but the country was convinced of his guilt. The greatest indignation was everywhere expressed, and menacing mobs again assembled in London. Happily, no disturbance took place. This was the day on which Mr. Craggs the Elder expired. The morrow had been appointed for the consideration of his case. It was very generally believed that he had poisoned himself. It appeared, however, that grief for the loss of his son, one of the secretaries of the Treasury, who had died five weeks previously of the smallpox, preyed much on his mind. For this son, dearly beloved, he had been amassing vast heaps of riches. He had been getting money, but not honestly, and he, for whose sake he had bartered his honour and sullied his fame, was now no more. The dread of further exposure increased his trouble of mind, and ultimately brought on an apoplectic fit, in which he expired. He left a fortune of a million and a half, which was afterwards confiscated for the benefit of the sufferers by the unhappy delusion he had been so mainly instrumental in raising. One by one the case of every director of the company was taken into consideration. A sum amounting to two millions and fourteen thousand pounds was confiscated from their estates towards repairing the mischief they had done, each man being allowed a certain residue in proportion to his conduct and circumstances, with which he might begin the world anew. Sir John Blunt was only allowed five thousand pounds out of his fortune of upwards of one hundred and eighty-three thousand pounds. Sir John Fellows was allowed ten thousand pounds out of two hundred and forty three thousand pounds, Sir Theodore Janssen fifty thousand pounds out of two hundred and forty three thousand pounds, Mr Edward Gibbon ten thousand pounds out of one hundred and six thousand pounds, Sir John Lambert five thousand pounds out of seventy two thousand pounds. Others, less deeply involved, were treated with greater liberality. Gibbon, the historian, whose grandfather was the Mr. Edward Gibbon so severely mulcted, has given, in the memoirs of his life and writings, an interesting account of the proceedings in Parliament at this time. He owns that he is not an unprejudiced witness, but, as all the writers from which it is possible to extract any notice of the proceedings of these disastrous years, were prejudiced on the other side, the statements of the great historian become of additional value, if only on the principle of Audi alteram partem, his opinion is entitled to consideration. In the year 1716, he says, my grandfather was elected one of the directors of the South Sea Company, and his books exhibited the proof that before his acceptance of that fatal office, he had acquired an independent fortune of sixty thousand pounds. 
but his fortune was overwhelmed in the shipwreck of the year 1720, and the labours of thirty years were blasted in a single day. Of the use or abuse of the South Sea scheme, of the guilt or innocence of my grandfather and his brother directors, I am neither a competent nor a disinterested judge. Yet the equity of modern times must condemn the violent and arbitrary proceedings which would have disgraced the cause of justice and rendered injustice still more odious. No sooner had the nation awakened from its golden dream than a popular and even a parliamentary clamour demanded its victims. But it was acknowledged on all sides that the directors, however guilty, could not be touched by any known laws of the land. The intemperate notions of Lord Molesworth were not literally acted on, but a bill of pains and penalties was introduced, a retroactive statute, to punish the offences which did not exist at the time they were committed. The legislature restrained the persons of the directors, imposed an exorbitant security for their appearance, and marked their character with a previous note of ignominy. They were compelled to deliver, upon oath, the strict value of their estates, and were disabled from making any transfer or alienation of any part of their property. Against a bill of pains and penalties, it is the common right of every subject to be heard by his counsel at the bar. They prayed to be heard, their prayer was refused, and their oppressors, who required no evidence, would listen to no defence. It had been at first proposed that one-eighth of their respective estates should be allowed for the future support of the directors, but it was especially urged that, in the various shades of opulence and guilt, such a proportion would be too light for many, and for some might possibly be too heavy. The character and conduct of each man were separately weighed, but instead of the calm solemnity of a judicial inquiry, the fortune and honour of thirty-three Englishmen were made the topics of hasty conversation, the sport of a lawless majority, and the basest member of the committee, by a malicious word or silent vote, might indulge his general spleen or personal animosity. Injury was aggravated by insult, and insult was embittered by pleasantry. Allowances of twenty pounds or one shilling were facetiously moved. A vague report that a director had formerly been concerned in another project, by which some unknown persons had lost their money, was admitted as a proof of his actual guilt. One man was ruined because he had dropped a foolish speech that his horses should feed upon gold. Another, because he was grown so proud that one day, at the Treasury, he had refused a civil answer to persons much above him. All were condemned, absent and unheard, in arbitrary fines and forfeitures, which swept away the greatest part of their substance. Such bold oppression can scarcely be shielded by the omnipotence of Parliament. My grandfather could not expect to be treated with more lenity than his companions. His Tory principles and connections rendered him obnoxious to the ruling powers. His name was reported in a suspicious secret. His well-known abilities could not plead the excuse of ignorance or error. In the first proceedings against the South Sea directors, Mr. Gibbon was one of the first taken into custody, and in the final sentence the measure of his fine proclaimed him eminently guilty. The total estimate which he delivered on oath to the House of Commons amounted to one hundred and six thousand five hundred and forty three pounds five shillings and sixpence exclusive of antecedent settlements two different allowances of fifteen thousand pounds and of ten thousand pounds were moved for mr gibbon but on the question being put it was carried without a division for the smaller sum on these ruins with the skill and credit of which Parliament had not been able to despoil him, my grandfather, at a mature age, erected the edifice of a new fortune. The labours of sixteen years were amply rewarded, and I have reason to believe that the second structure was not much inferior to the first. The next consideration of the legislature, after the punishment of the directors, was to restore public credit. 
the scheme of Walpole had been found insufficient, and had fallen into disrepute. A computation was made of the whole capital stock of the South Sea Company at the end of the year 1720. It was found to amount to thirty-seven millions eight hundred thousand pounds, of which the stock allotted to all the proprietors only amounted to twenty-four millions five hundred thousand pounds. The remainder of the thirteen millions three hundred thousand pounds belonged to the company in their corporate capacity, and was the profit they had made by the national delusion. Upwards of eight millions of this were taken from the company, and divided among the proprietors and subscribers generally, making a dividend of about thirty-three pounds, six shillings, and eightpence per cent. This was a great relief. It was further ordered that such persons as had borrowed money from the South Sea Company upon stock actually transferred and pledged at the time of borrowing to or for the use of the company, should be free from all demands, upon payment of ten per cent of the sums so borrowed. They had lent about eleven millions in this manner, at a time when prices were unnaturally raised, and they now received back one million one hundred thousand, when prices had sunk to their ordinary level. But it was a long time before public credit was thoroughly restored. Enterprise, like Icarus, had soared too high, and melted the wax of her wings. Like Icarus, she had fallen into a sea, and learnt, while floundering in its waves, that her proper element was the solid ground. She has never since attempted so high a flight." In times of great commercial prosperity, there has been a tendency to over-speculation on several occasions since then. The success of one project generally produces others of a similar kind. Popular imitativeness will always, in a trading nation, seize hold of such successes, and drag a community too anxious for profits into an abyss from which extrication is difficult. Bubble companies of a kind similar to those engendered by the South Sea Project lived their little day in the famous year of the Panic, 1825. On that occasion, as in 1720, knavery gathered a rich harvest from cupidity, but both suffered when the day of reckoning came. The schemes of the year 1836 threatened at one time results as disastrous, but they were happily averted before it was too late. End of chapter 2, part 3「Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds」Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds Volume 1 by Charles Mackay The Tulipomania What Madness, O Citizens! Lucan. The tulip, so named, it is said, from a Turkish word, signifying a turban, was introduced into Western Europe about the middle of the 16th century. Conrad Gessner, who claims the merit of having brought it into repute, little dreaming of the commotion it was shortly afterwards to make in the world, says that he first saw it in the year 1559, in a garden at Osberg, belonging to the learned councillor Hewitt a man very famous in his day for his collection of rare exotics. The bulbs were sent to this gentleman by a friend at Constantinople, for the flower had long been a favourite. In the course of ten or eleven years after this period, tulips were much sought after by the wealthy, especially in Holland and Germany. Rich people at Amsterdam sent for the bulbs direct to Constantinople and paid the most extravagant prices for them. The first roots planted in England were brought from Vienna in 1600. Until the year 1634, the tulip annually increased in reputation, until it was deemed a proof of bad taste in any man of fortune to be without a collection of them. Many learned men, including Pompeius de Anglis and the celebrated Lupicus of Leyden, 
the author of the treatise De Constantina, were passionately fond of tulips. The rage for possessing them soon caught the middle classes of society, and merchants and shopkeepers, even of moderate means, began to vie with each other in the rarity of these flowers and the preposterous prices they paid for them. A trader at Harlem was known to pay one half of his fortune for a single root, not with the design of selling it again at a profit, but to keep in his own conservatory for the admiration of his acquaintance. One would suppose that there must have been some great virtue in this flower to have made it so valuable in the eyes of so prudent a people as the Dutch. But it has neither the beauty nor the perfume of the rose, hardly the beauty of the sweet, sweet pea. Neither is it as enduring as either. Cowley, it is true, is loud in its praise. He says, The tulip next appeared all over gay, But wanton, full of pride and full of play. The world can shew a dye, but here has place. Nay, by new mixtures she can change her face. Purple and gold are both beneath her care. The richest needlework she loves to wear. Her only study is to please the eye, And to outshine the rest in finery. This, though not very poetical, is the description of a poet. Beckman, in his History of Inventions, paints it with more fidelity and in prose more pleasing than Cowley's poetry. He says, There are few plants which acquire, through accident, weakness or disease, so many variegations as the tulip. When uncultivated and in its natural state, it is almost of one colour, has large leaves and an extraordinarily long stem. When it has been weakened by cultivation, it becomes more agreeable in the eyes of the florist. The petals are then paler, smaller, and more diversified in hue, and the leaves acquire a softer green colour. Thus this masterpiece of culture, the more beautiful it turns, grows so much the weaker, so that, with the greatest skill and most careful attention, it can scarcely be transplanted or even kept alive. Many persons grow insensibly attached to that which gives them a great deal of trouble, as a mother often loves her sick and ever-ailing child better than her more healthy offspring. Upon the same principle we must account for the unmerited encomia lavished upon these fragile blossoms. In 1634, the rage among the Dutch to possess them was so great that the ordinary industry of the country was neglected, and the population, even to its lowest dregs, embarked in the tulip trade. As the mania increased, prices augmented, until in the year 1635, many persons were known to invest a fortune of a 100,000 florins in the purchase of 40 roots. It then became necessary to sell them by their weight in parrots, a small weight less than a grain. The tulip of the species, called Admiral Lifkin, weighing 400 parrots, was worth 4,400 florins, and Admiral van der Eyck, weighing 446 parrots, was worth 1,260 florins. A childer, of 106 parrots, was worth 1,615 florins. A viceroy, of 400 parrots, 3,000 florins. And most precious of all, a Semper Augustus, weighing 200 parrots, was thought to be very cheap at 5,500 florins. The latter was much sought after, and even an inferior bulb might command a price of 2,000 florins. It is related that, at one time, early in 1636, there were only two roots of this description to be had in all Holland, and those not of the best. One was in the possession of a dealer in Amsterdam, and the other in Harlem. So anxious were the speculators to obtain them, that one person offered the fee simple of twelve acres of building ground for the Harlem tulip. That of Amsterdam was brought for 4,600 florins, a new carriage, two grey horses, and a complete suit of harness. Hunting, an industrious author of that day, who wrote a folio volume of 1,000 pages upon the Chulipomania, has preserved the folio wing list of the various articles, and their value, which were delivered for one single root of the rare species called the Viceroy. Two lasts of wheat, 448 florins. Four lasts of rye, 558 florins, four fat oxen, 480 florins, eight fat swine, 240 florins, 
twelve fat sheep, a hundred and twenty florins, two hogsheads of wine, seventy florins, four tons of beer, thirty-two florins, two tons of butter, a hundred and ninety-two florins, one thousand pounds of cheese, a hundred and twenty florins, a complete bed, a hundred florins, a suit of clothes, eighty florins, a silver drinking cup, sixty florins, total two thousand five hundred florins. People who had been absent from Holland, and whose chance it was to return when this folly was at its maximum, were sometimes led into awkward dilemmas by their ignorance. There is an amusing instance of the kind related in Blainville's travels. A wealthy merchant, who prided himself not a little on his rare tulips, received upon one occasion a very valuable consignment of merchandise from the Levant. Intelligence of its arrival was brought him by a sailor who presented himself for that purpose at the counting-house, among bales of goods of every description. The merchant, to reward him for his news, munificently made him a present of a fine red herring for his breakfast. The sailor had, it appears, a great partiality for onions, and seeing a bulb very like an onion lying upon the counter of this liberal trader, and thinking it, no doubt, very much out of its place among silks and velvets, he slyly seized an opportunity and slipped it into his pocket, as a relish for his herring. He got clear off with his prize, and proceeded to the quay to eat his breakfast. Hardly was his back turned, when the merchant missed his valuable Semper Augustus, worth three thousand florins, or about two hundred and eighty pounds sterling. The whole establishment was instantly in an uproar. Search was everywhere made for the precious root, but it was not to be found. Great was the merchant's distress of mind. The search was renewed, but again without success. At last, someone thought of the sala. The unhappy merchant sprang into the street at the bare suggestion. His alarmed household followed him. The sailor, simple soul, had not thought of concealment. He was found quietly sitting on a coil of ropes, masticating the last morsel of his onion. Little did he dream that he had been eating a breakfast whose cost might have regaled a whole ship's crew for a twelvemonth, or as the plundered merchant himself expressed it, might have sumptuously feasted the Prince of Orange and the whole court of the Standholder. Anthony caused pearls to be dissolved in wine to drink the health of Cleopatra. Sir Richard Whittington was as foolishly magnificent in an entertainment to King Henry V, and Sir Thomas Gresham drank a diamond dissolved in wine to the health of Queen Elizabeth when she opened the Royal Exchange. But the breakfast of this roguish Dutchman was as splendid as either. He had an advantage, too, over his wasteful predecessors. Their gems did not improve the taste or the wholesomeness of their wine, while his tulip was quite delicious with his red herring. The most unfortunate part of the business for him was that he remained in prison for some months on a charge of felony preferred against him by the merchant. Another story is told of an English traveller, which is scarcely less ludicrous. This gentleman, an amateur botanist, happened to see a tulip root lying in the conservatory of a wealthy Dutchman. Being ignorant of its quality, he took out his penknife and peeled off its coats, with the view of making experiments upon it. When it was by this means reduced to half its size, he cut it into two equal sections, making all the time many learned remarks on the singular appearances of the unknown bulb. Suddenly the owner pounced upon him, and with fury in his eyes asked him if he knew what he had been doing. Peeling a most extraordinary onion, replied the philosopher. Hundred thousand duvels, said the Dutchman. It's an Admiral van der Eyck. Thank you, replied the traveller, taking out his notebook to make a memorandum of the same. Are these admirals common in your country? Death and the devil, said the Dutchman, seizing the astonished man of science by the collar. Come before the syndic, and you shall see. In spite of his remonstrances, the traveller was led through the streets, followed by a mob of persons. When brought into the presence of the magistrate, he learned, to his consternation, that the route upon which he had been experimentalizing was worth four thousand florins, and notwithstanding all he could urge in extenuation, he was lodged in prison until he found securities for the payment of this sum. The demand for tulips of a rare species increased so much in the year 1636 that regular marts for the sale were established on the stock exchange of Amsterdam, in Rotterdam, Harlem, Leyden, Alkmaar, Horn, and other towns. Symptoms of gambling now became, for the first time, apparent. The stock jobbers, ever on the alert for a new speculation, dealt largely in tulips, 
making use of all the means they so well knew how to employ to cause fluctuations in prices. At first, as in all these gambling mania, confidence was at its height, and everybody gained. The tulip jobbers speculating in the rise and fall of the tulip stocks, and made large profits by buying when prices fell and selling out when they rose. Many individuals grew suddenly rich. A golden bait hung temptingly out before the people, and one after the other they rushed to the tulip marts, like flies around a honey pot. Everyone imagined that the passion for tulips would last forever, and that the wealthy from every part of the world would send to Holland and pay whatever prices were asked for them. The riches of Europe would be concentrated on the shores of the Zunder Zee, and poverty banished from the favoured clime of Holland. Nobles, citizens, farmers, mechanics, seamen, footmen, maidservants, even chimney sweets and old clothes women dabbled in tulips. People of all grades converted their property into cash and invested it in flowers. Houses and lands were offered for sale at ruinously low prices or assigned in payment of bargains made at the tulip mart. Foreigners became smitten with the same frenzy and money poured into Holland from all directions. The prices of the necessities of life rose again by degrees. Houses and lands, horses and carriages, and luxuries of every sort rose in value with them. And for some months Holland seemed the very antechamber of Plutus. The operations of the trade became so extensive and so intricate that it was found necessary to draw up a code of laws for the guidance of the dealers. Notaries and clerks were also appointed, who devoted themselves exclusively to the interests of the trade. The designation of public notary was hardly known in some towns, that of tulip notary usurping its place. In the smaller towns, where there was no exchange, the principal tavern was usually selected as the show place, where high and low traded in tulips, and confirmed their bargains over sumptuous entertainments. These dinners were sometimes attended by two or three hundred persons, and large vases of tulips, in full bloom, were placed at regular intervals upon the tables and sideboards for their gratification during the repast. At last, however, the more prudent began to see that this folly could not last forever. Rich people no longer brought the flowers to keep them in their gardens, but to sell them again at cent per cent profit. It was seen that somebody must lose fearfully in the end. As this conviction spread, prices fell and never rose again. Confidence was destroyed, and a universal panic seized upon the dealers. A had agreed to purchase ten Semper Augustines from B at 4,000 florins each. At six weeks after the signing of the contract, B was ready with the flowers at the appointed time, but the price had fallen to three or four hundred florins, and A refused either to pay the difference or receive the tulips. Defaulters were announced day after day in all the towns of Holland. Hundreds who, a few months previously, had begun to doubt that there was such a thing as poverty in the land, suddenly found themselves the possessors of a few bulbs which nobody would buy, even though they offered them at one quarter of the sums they had paid for them. The cry of distress resounded everywhere, and each man accused his neighbour. The few who had contrived to enrich themselves hid their wealth from the knowledge of their fellow citizens, and invested it in the English or other funds. Many who, for a brief season, had emerged from the humbler walks of life were cast back into their original obscurity. Substantial merchants were reduced almost to beggary, and many a representative of a noble line saw the fortunes of his house ruined beyond redemption. When the first alarm subsided, the tulip holders in the several towns held public meetings to devise what measures were best to be taken to restore public credit. It was generally agreed that deputies should be sent from all parts to Amsterdam, consult with the government upon some remedy for the evil. The government at first refused to interfere, but advised the tulip holders to agree to some plan among themselves. Several meetings were held for this purpose, but no measure could be devised likely to give satisfaction to the deluded people, or repair even a slight portion of the mischief that had been done. The language of complaint and reproach was in everybody's mouth, and all the meetings were of the most stormy character. At last, however, after much bickering and ill will, it was agreed at Amsterdam by the assembled deputies that all contracts made in the height of the mania or prior to the month of November 1636 should be declared null and void, and that, 
in those made after that date, purchasers should be freed from their engagements on paying 10% to the vendor. This decision gave no satisfaction. The vendors who had their tulips on hand were, of course, discontented, and those who had pledged themselves to purchase thought themselves hardly treated. Tulips which had, at one time, been worth 6,000 florins were now to be procured for 500, so that the composition of 10% was 100 florins more than the actual value. Actions for breach of contract were threatened in all the courts of the country, but the latter refused to take cognizance of gambling transactions. The matter was finally referred to the provincial council at The Hague, and it was confidently expected that the wisdom of this body would invent some measure by which credit should be restored. Expectation was on the stretch for its decision, but it never came. The members continued to deliberate week after week, and at last, after thinking about it for three months, declared that they could offer no final decision until they had more information. They advised, however, that in the meantime, every vendor should, in the presence of witnesses, offer the tulips in natura to the purchaser for the sums agreed upon. If the latter refused to take them, they might be put up for sale by public auction and the original contractor held responsible for the difference between the actual and the stipulated price. This was exactly the plan recommended by the deputies, and which was already shown to be of no avail. There was no court in Holland which would enforce payment. The question was raised in Amsterdam, but the judges unanimously refused to interfere, on the ground that debts contracted in gambling were no debts in law. Thus the matter rested. To find a remedy was beyond the power of the government. Those who were unlucky enough to have had stores of tulips on hand at the time of the sudden reaction were left to bear their ruin as philosophically as they could. Those who had made profits were allowed to keep them. But the commerce of the country suffered a severe shock, from which it was many years ere it recovered. The example of the Dutch was imitated to some extent in England. In the year 1636, Tulips were publicly sold in the Exchange of London, and the jobbers exerted themselves to the utmost to raise them to the fictitious value they had acquired in Amsterdam. In Paris, also, the jobbers strove to create a tulipomania. In both cities they only partially succeeded. However, the force of example brought the flowers into great favour, and amongst a certain class of people, tulips have ever since been prized more highly than any other flowers of the field. The Dutch are still notorious for their partiality to them, and continue to pay higher prices for them than any other people. As the rich Englishman boasts of his fine race horses or his old pitchers, so does the wealthy Dutchman vaunt him of his tulips. In England, in our day, strange as it may appear, a tulip will produce more money than an oak. If one could be found rara in terris, and black as the black swan of Juvenal, its price would equal that of a dozen acres of standing corn. In Scotland, towards the close of the 17th century, the highest price for tulips, according to the authority of a writer in the supplement to the third edition of the Encyclopaedia Britannica, was ten guineas. Their value appears to have diminished from that time, till the year 1769, when the two most valuable species in England were the Don Quevedo and the Valentinia, the former of which was worth two guineas, on the latter two guineas and a half. These prices appear to have been the minimum. In the year 1800, a common price was 15 guineas for a single bulb. In 1835, a bulb of the species called the Miss Fanny Kemble was sold by public auction in London for 75 pounds. Still more remarkable was the price of a tulip in the possession of a gardener in the King's Road, Chelsea. In his catalogues, it was labelled at 200 guineas. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4, Part 1 of Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Volume 1, by Charles Mackay. Chapter 4. The Alchemists, or Searchers for the Philosopher's Stone and the Water of Life, Part 1. Mercury, Locator, the mischief a secret any of them know, 
above the consuming of coals and drawing of Yuskaba. Howsoever they may pretend, under the specious names of Geber, Arnold, Luli, or Bombast of Hohenheim, to commit miracles in art and treason against nature, as if the title of philosopher, that creature of glory, were to be fetched out of a furnace. I am their crude and their sublimate, their precipitate and their unctions, their male and their female, sometimes their hermaphrodite, what they list to style me. They will calcine you a grave matron, as it might be a mother of the maids, and spring up a young virgin out of her ashes, as fresh as a phoenix." lay you an old courtier on the coals, like a sausage or a bloat herring, and after they have broiled him enough, blow a soul into him with a pair of bellows. See, they begin to muster again, and draw their forces out against me. The genius of the place defend me. Ben Jonson's Mask, Mercury Vindicated from the Alchemists. Dissatisfaction with his lot seems to be the characteristic of man in all ages and climates. So far, however, from being an evil, as at first might be supposed, it has been the great civilizer of our race, and has tended, more than anything else, to raise us above the condition of the brutes. But the same discontent which has been the source of all improvement has been the parent of no small progeny of follies and absurdities. To trace these latter is our present object. Vast as the subject appears, it is easily reducible within such limits as will make it comprehensible without being wearisome, and render its study both instructive and amusing. Three causes especially have excited the discontent of mankind, and by impelling us to seek for remedies for the irremediable, have bewildered us in a maze of madness and error. These are death, toil, and ignorance of the future, the doom of man upon this sphere, and for which he shews his antipathy by his love of life, his longing for abundance, and his craving curiosity to pierce the secrets of the days to come. The first has led many to imagine that they might find means to avoid death, or failing in this, that they might nevertheless so prolong existence as to reckon it by centuries instead of units. From this sprang the search, so long continued and still pursued, for the elixir vitae, or water of life, which has led thousands to pretend to it and millions to believe in it. From the second sprang the search for the philosopher's stone, which was to create plenty by changing all metals into gold, and from the third the false sciences of astrology, divination, and their divisions of necromancy, chiromancy, augury, with all their train of signs, portents, and omens. In tracing the career of the erring philosophers, or the willful cheats, who have encouraged or preyed upon the credulity of mankind, it will simplify and elucidate the subject if we divide it into three classes. The first comprising alchemists, are those in general who have devoted themselves to the discovering of the philosopher's stone and the water of life the second comprising astrologers, necromancers, sorcerers, geomancers, and all those who pretended to discover futurity, and the third consisting in the dealers in charms, amulets, filters, universal panacea mongers, touchers for the evil, seventh sons of a seventh son, sympathetic powder compounders, homeopathists, animal magnetizers, and all the motley tribe of quacks, empirics, and charlatans. But in narrating the career of such men, it will be found that many of them united several, or all of the functions just mentioned, that the alchemist was a fortune-teller, or a necromancer, that he pretended to cure all maladies by touch or charm, and to work miracles of every kind. In the dark and early ages of European history, this is more especially the case. Even as we advance to more recent periods, we shall find great difficulty in separating the characters. The alchemist seldom confined himself strictly to his pretended science the sorcerer and necromancer to theirs, or the medical charlatan to his. Beginning with alchemy, some confusion of these classes is unavoidable, but the ground will clear for us as we advance. Let us not, in the pride of our superior knowledge, turn with contempt from the follies of our predecessors. The study of the errors into which great minds have fallen in the pursuit of truth can never be uninstructive. As the man looks back to the days of his childhood and his youth, and recalls to his mind the strange notions and false opinions that swayed his actions at that time, that he may wonder at them. So should society, for its edification, look back to the opinions which governed the ages fled. He is but a superficial thinker who would despise and refuse to hear of them merely because they are absurd. No man is so wise but that he may learn some wisdom from his past errors, either of thought or action, and no society has made such advances as to be capable of no improvement from the retrospect of its past folly and credulity. And not only is such a study instructive, 
he who reads for amusement only, will find no chapter in the annals of the human mind more amusing than this. It opens out the whole realm of fiction, the wild, the fantastic, and the wonderful, and all the immense variety of things that are not and cannot be, but that have been imagined and believed. For more than a thousand years the art of alchemy captivated many noble spirits, and was believed in by millions. Its origin is involved in obscurity. Some of its devotees have claimed for it an antiquity coeval with the creation of man himself. Others, again, would trace it no further back than the time of Noah. Vincent de Beauvais argues, indeed, that all the antediluvians must have possessed a knowledge of alchemy, and particularly cites Noah as having been acquainted with the elixir vitae, or he could not have lived to so prodigious an age, and have begotten children when upwards of five hundred. Lenglet du Fresnoy, in his History of the Hermetic Philosophy, says, most of them pretended that Shem, or Chem, the son of Noah, was an adept in the art, and thought it highly probable that the words chemistry and alchemy are both derived from his name. Others say the art was derived from the Egyptians, amongst whom it was first founded by Hermes Trismegistus. Moses, who is looked upon as a first-rate alchemist, gained his knowledge in Egypt, but he kept it all to himself, and would not instruct the children of Israel in its mysteries. All the writers upon alchemy triumphantly cite the story of the golden calf in the thirty-second chapter of Exodus, to prove that this great lawgiver was an adept, and could make or unmake gold at his pleasure. It is recorded that Moses was so wrath with the Israelites for their idolatry, that he took the calf which they had made, and burned it in the fire, and ground it to powder, and strewed it upon the water, and made the children of Israel drink it. This, say the alchemist, he never could have done had he not been in possession of the philosopher's stone. By no other means could he have made the powder of gold float upon the water. But we must leave this knotty point for the consideration of the adepts in the art, if any such there be, and come to more modern periods of its history. The Jesuit, Father Martini, in his Historia Sinica, says it was practiced by the Chinese two thousand five hundred years before the birth of Christ, but his assertion being unsupported is worth nothing. It would appear, however, that pretenders to the art of making gold and silver existed in Rome in the first centuries after the Christian era, and that when discovered they were liable to punishment as knaves and impostors. At Constantinople in the fourth century the transmutation of metals was very generally believed in, and many of the Greek ecclesiastics wrote treatises upon the subject. Their names are preserved, and some notice of their works given, in the third volume of Langlais du Fresnoy's History of the Hermetic Philosophy. Their notion appears to have been that all metals were composed of two substances, the one metallic earth, and the other a red inflammable matter, which they called sulphur. The pure union of these substances formed gold, but other metals were mixed with and contaminated by various foreign ingredients. The object of the philosopher's stone was to dissolve or neutralize all these ingredients, by which iron, lead, copper, and all metals would be transmuted into the original gold. Many learned and clever men wasted their time, their health, and their energies in this vain pursuit, but for several centuries it took no great hold upon the imagination of the people. The history of the delusion appears, in a manner, lost from this time till the eighth century, when it appeared amongst the Arabians. From this period it becomes easier to trace its progress. A master then appeared, who was long looked upon as the father of the science, and whose name is indissolubly connected with it, Geber. Of this philosopher who devoted his life to the study of alchemy, but few particulars are known. He is thought to have lived in the year 730. His true name was Abu Musa Jafar, to which was added Al-Sofi, or the Wise, and he was born at Huron in Mesopotamia. Some have thought he was a Greek, others a Spaniard, and others a prince of Hindustan. But of all the mistakes which have been made respecting him, the most ludicrous was that made by the French translator of Sprenger's History of Medicine, who thought from the sound of his name that he was a German, and rendered it as the donateur or giver. No details of his life are known, but it is asserted that he wrote more than five hundred works upon the philosopher's stone and the water of life. He was a great enthusiast in his art, and compared the incredulous to little children shut up in a narrow room, without windows or aperture, who, because they saw nothing beyond, denied the existence of the great globe itself. He thought that a preparation of gold would cure all maladies, not only in man, but in the inferior animals and plants. 
He also imagined that all metals labored under disease, with the exception of gold, which was the only one in perfect health. He affirmed that the secret of the philosopher's stone had been more than once discovered, but that the ancient and wise men who had hit upon it would never, by word or writing, communicate it to men, because of their unworthiness and incredulity. Footnote. His sum of perfection or instructions to students to aid them in the laborious search for the stone and elixir has been translated into most of the languages of Europe. An English translation by a great enthusiast in alchemy, one Richard Russell, was published in London in 1686. The preface is dated eight years previously from the house of the alchemist at the Star in Newmarket, in Wapping, near the dock. His design in undertaking the translation was, as he informs us, to expose the false pretenses of the many ignorant pretenders to the science who abounded in his day. End footnote. But the life of Geber though spent in the pursuit of this vain chimera, was not altogether useless. He stumbled upon discoveries which he did not seek, and science is indebted to him for the first mention of corrosive sublimate, the red oxide of mercury, nitric acid, and the nitrate of silver. For more than two hundred years after the death of Geber, the Arabian philosophers devoted themselves to the study of alchemy, joining with it that of astrology. Of these, the most celebrated was Al-Farabi, Al-Farabi flourished at the commencement of the tenth century, and enjoyed the reputation of being one of the most learned men of his age. He spent his life in travelling from country to country, that he might gather the opinions of philosophers upon the great secrets of nature. No danger dismayed him, no toil wearied him of the pursuit. Many sovereigns endeavoured to retain him at their courts, but he refused to rest until he had discovered the great object of his life, the art of preserving it for centuries, and of making gold as much as he needed. This wandering mode of life at last proved fatal to him. He had been on a visit to Mecca, not so much for religious as for philosophical purposes. When returning through Syria, he stopped at the court of the Sultan Sifet Dule, who was renowned as the patron of learning. He presented himself in his travelling attire in the presence of that monarch and his courtiers, and, without invitation, coolly sat himself down on the sofa beside the prince. The courtiers and wise men were indignant, and the sultan, who did not know the intruder, was at first inclined to follow their example. He turned to one of his officers, and ordered him to eject the presumptuous stranger from the room. But Al-Farabi, without moving, dared them to lay hands upon him, and turning himself calmly to the prince, remarked that he did not know who was his guest, or he would treat him with honour, not with violence. The sultan, instead of being still further incensed, as many potentates would have been, admired his coolness, and requesting him to sit still closer to him on the sofa, entered into a long conversation with him upon science and divine philosophy. All the court were charmed with the stranger. Questions for discussion were propounded, on all of which he shewed superior knowledge. He convinced every one who ventured to dispute with him, and spoke so eloquently upon the science of alchemy that he was at once recognized as only second to the great Geber himself. One of the doctors present inquired whether a man who knew so many sciences was acquainted with music. Al-Farabi made no reply, but merely requested that a lute should be brought to him. The lute was brought, and he played such ravishing and tender melodies that all the court were melted into tears. He then changed his theme, and played air so sprightly that he set the grave philosophers, sultan and all, dancing as fast as their legs could carry them. He then sobered them again by a mournful strain, and made them sob and sigh as if broken-hearted. The sultan, highly delighted with his powers, entreated him to stay, offering him every inducement that wealth, power, and dignity could supply, but the alchemist resolutely refused. It being decreed, he said, that he should never repose till he had discovered the philosopher's stone. He set out accordingly the same evening, and was murdered by some thieves in the deserts of Syria. His biographers give no further particulars of his life, beyond mentioning that he wrote several valuable treatises on his art, all of which, however, have been lost. His death happened in the year 954. Avicenna Avicenna, whose real name was Eben Sinna, another great alchemist, was born at Bacara in 980. His reputation as a physician and a man skilled in all sciences was so great that the Sultan Magdal Duleth resolved to try his powers in the great science of government. 
he was accordingly made grand vizier of that prince, and ruled the state with some advantage. But in a science still more difficult, he failed completely. He could not rule his own passions, but gave himself up to wine and women, and led a life of shameless debauchery. Amid the multifarious pursuits of business and pleasure, he nevertheless found time to write seven treatises upon the philosopher's stone, which were for many ages looked upon as of great value by pretenders to the art. It is rare that an eminent physician, as Avicenna appears to have been, abandons himself to central gratification, but so completely did he become enthralled in the course of a few years, that he was dismissed from his high office, and died shortly afterwards of premature old age, and a complication of maladies brought on by debauchery. His death took place in the year 1036. After his time, few philosophers of any note in Arabia are heard of as devoting themselves to the study of alchemy. But it began shortly afterwards to attract greater attention in Europe. Learned men in France, England, Spain, and Italy expressed their belief in the science, and many devoted their whole energies to it. In the twelfth and thirteenth centuries especially, it was extensively pursued, and some of the brightest names of that age are connected with it. Among the most eminent of them are Albertus Magnus and Thomas Aquinas. The first of these philosophers was born in the year 1193 of a noble family at Longen, in the Duchy of Newburgh on the Danube. For the first thirty years of his life he appeared remarkably dull and stupid, and it was feared by every one that no good could come of him. He entered a Dominican monastery at an early age, but made so little progress in his studies that he was more than once upon the point of abandoning them in despair. But he was endowed with extraordinary perseverance. As he advanced to middle age, his mind expanded, and he learned whatever he applied himself to with extreme facility. So remarkable a change was not in that age to be accounted for but by a miracle. It was asserted and believed that the Holy Virgin, touched with his great desire to become learned and famous, took pity upon his incapacity, and appeared to him in the cloister where he sat almost despairing, and asked him whether he wished to excel in philosophy or divinity. He chose philosophy, to the chagrin of the Virgin, who reproached him in mild and sorrowful accents, that he had not made a better choice. She, however, granted his request, that he should become the most excellent philosopher of the age, but set this drawback to his pleasure, that he should relapse, when at the height of his fame, into his former incapacity and stupidity. Albertus never took the trouble to contradict the story, but prosecuted his studies with such unremitting zeal, that his reputation speedily spread over all Europe. In the year 1244, the celebrated Thomas Aquinas placed himself under his tuition. Many extraordinary stories are told of the master and his pupil. While they paid all due attention to other branches of science, they never neglected the pursuit of the philosopher's stone and the elixir vitae. Although they discovered neither, it was believed that Albert had seized some portion of the secret of life, and found means to animate a brazen statue, upon the formation of which, under proper conjunctions of the planets, he had been occupied many years of his life. He and Thomas Aquinas completed it together, endowed it with the faculty of speech, and made it perform the functions of a domestic servant. In this capacity it was exceedingly useful, but through some defect in the machinery it chattered much more than was agreeable to either philosopher. Various remedies were tried to cure it of its garrulity, but in vain. And one day Thomas Aquinas was so enraged at the noise it made when he was in the midst of a mathematical problem that he seized a ponderous hammer and smashed it to pieces. He was sorry afterwards for what he had done, and was reproved by his master for giving way to his anger, so unbecoming in a philosopher. They made no attempt to reanimate the statue. Such stories as these show the spirit of the age. Every great man who attempted to study the secrets of nature was thought a magician, and it is not to be wondered at that, when philosophers themselves pretended to discover an elixir for conferring immortality, or a red stone which was to create boundless wealth, that popular opinion should have enhanced upon their pretensions, and have endowed them with powers still more miraculous. It was believed of Albertus Magnus that he could even change the course of the seasons, a feat which the many thought less difficult than the discovery of the grand elixir. Albertus was desirous of attaining a piece of ground on which to build a monastery in the neighborhood of Cologne. The ground belonged to William, Count of Holland, and King of the Romans. 
who for some reason or other did not wish to part with it. Albertus is reported to have gained it by the following extraordinary method. He invited the prince, as he was passing through Cologne, to a magnificent entertainment prepared for him and all his court. The prince accepted it, and repaired with the lordly retinue to the residence of the sage. It was in the midst of winter, the Rhine was frozen over, and the cold was so bitter that the knights could not sit on horseback without running the risk of losing their toes by the frost. Great, therefore, was their surprise, on arriving at Albert's house, to find that the repast was spread in his garden, in which the snow had drifted to the depth of several feet. The earl, in high dudgeon, remounted his steed, but Albert at last prevailed upon him to take his seat at the table. He had no sooner done so than the dark clouds rolled away from the sky. A warm sun shone forth. The cold north wind veered suddenly round and blew a mild breeze from the south. The snows melted away, the ice was unbound upon the streams, and the trees brought forth their green leaves and their fruit. Flowers sprang up beneath their feet, while larks, nightingales, blackbirds, cuckoos, thrushes, and every sweet song bird sang hymns from every tree. The earl and his attendants wondered greatly, but they ate their dinner, and in recompense for it Albert got his piece of ground to build a convent on. He had not, however, shown them all his power. Immediately that the repast was over, he gave the word, and dark clouds obscured the sun, the snow fell in large flakes, the singing birds fell dead, the leaves dropped from the trees, and the winds blew so cold and howled so mournfully, that the guests wrapped themselves up in their thick cloaks, and retreated into the house to warm themselves at the blazing fire in Albert's kitchen. Thomas Aquinas could also work wonders as well as his master. It is related of him that he lodged in a street at Cologne, where he was much annoyed by the incessant clatter made by the horses' hoofs, as they were led through it daily to exercise by their grooms. He had entreated the latter to select some other spot, where they might not disturb a philosopher, but the grooms turned a deaf ear to all his solicitations. In this emergency he had recourse to the aid of magic. He constructed a small horse of bronze, upon which he inscribed certain cabalistic characters, and buried it at midnight in the midst of the highway. The next morning a troop of grooms came riding along as usual, but the horses, as they arrived at the spot where the magic horse was buried, reared and plunged violently, their nostrils distended with terror, their manes grew erect, and the perspiration ran down their sides in streams. In vain the riders applied the spur, in vain they coaxed or threatened, the animals would not pass the spot. On the following day their success was no better. They were at length compelled to seek another spot for their exercise, and Thomas Aquinas was left in peace. Albertus Magnus was made bishop of Ratisbon in 1259, but he occupied the see only four years, when he resigned, on the ground that its duties occupied too much of the time which he was anxious to devote to philosophy. He died in Cologne in 1280, at the advanced age of 87. The Dominican writers deny that he ever sought the philosopher's stone, but his treatise upon minerals sufficiently proves that he did. Artephius. Artephius, a name noted in the annals of alchemy, was born in the early part of the twelfth century. He wrote two famous treatises, the one upon the philosopher's stone, and the other on the art of prolonging human life. In the latter he vaunts his great qualifications for instructing mankind on such a matter, as he was at that time in the thousand and twenty-fifth year of his age. He had many disciples who believed in his extreme age, and who attempted to prove that he was Apollonius of Tyana, who lived soon after the advent of Jesus Christ, and the particulars of whose life and pretended miracles have been so fully described by Philostratus. He took care never to contradict a story which so much increased the power he was desirous of wielding over his fellow mortals. On all convenient occasions he boasted of it, and having an excellent memory, a fertile imagination, and a thorough knowledge of all existing history, he was never at a loss for an answer when questioned as to the personal appearance the manners, or the character of the great men of antiquity. He also pretended to have found the philosopher's stone, and said that, in search of it, he had descended to hell, and seen the devil sitting on a throne of gold, with a legion of imps and fiends around him. His works on alchemy have been translated into French, and were published in Paris in 1609 or 1610. Alain de Lille Contemporary with Albertus Magnus was Alain de Lille of Flanders who was named, from his great learning, the universal doctor. He was thought to possess a knowledge of all the sciences, and, like Artephius, 
to have discovered the elixir vitae. He became one of the friars of the Abbey of Citeaux, and died in 1298, aged about 110 years. It was said of him that he was at the point of death when in his fiftieth year, but that the fortunate discovery of the elixir enabled him to add sixty years to his existence. He wrote a commentary on the prophecies of Merlin. Arnold de Villeneuve. This philosopher has left a much greater reputation. He was born in the year 1245, and studied medicine with great success in the University of Paris. He afterwards travelled for twenty years in Italy and Germany, where he made acquaintance with Pietro da Pon, a man of a character akin to his own, and addicted to the same pursuits. As a physician he was thought in his own lifetime to be the most able the world had ever seen. Like all the learned men of that day, he dabbled in astrology and alchemy, and was thought to have made immense quantities of gold from lead and copper. When Pietro da Pon was arrested in Italy, and brought to trial as a sorcerer, a similar accusation was made against Arnold, but he managed to leave the country in time, and escape the fate of his unfortunate friend. He lost some credit by predicting the end of the world, but afterwards regained it. The time of his death is not exactly known, but it must have been prior to the year 1311, when Pope Clement V wrote a circular letter to all the clergy of Europe who lived under his obedience, praying them to use their utmost efforts to discover the famous treatise of Arnold on the practice of medicine. The author had promised during his lifetime to make a present of the work to the Holy See, but died without fulfilling it. In a very curious work by M. Longueville Harcouet, entitled The History of the Persons Who Have Lived Several Centuries and Then Grown Young Again, there is a receipt, said to have been given by Arnold de Villeneuve, by means of which any one might prolong his life for a few hundred years or so. In the first place, say Arnold and M. Harcouet, the person intending so to prolong his life must rub himself well, two or three times a week, with the juice or marrow of cassia, Moel de la Casse. Every night, upon going to bed, he must put upon his heart a plaster, composed of a certain quantity of oriental saffron, red rose leaves, sandalwood, aloes, and amber, liquefied in oil of roses, and the best white wax. In the morning he must take it off, and enclose it carefully in a leaden box till the next night, when it must be again applied. If he be of sanguine temperament, he shall take sixteen chickens, if phlegmatic, twenty-five, and if melancholy, thirty, which he shall put into a yard where the air and the water are pure. Upon these he is to feed, eating one a day, but previously the chickens are to be fattened by a peculiar method, which will impregnate their flesh with the qualities that are to produce longevity in the eater. Being deprived of all other nourishment till they are almost dying of hunger, they are to be fed upon broth made of serpents and vinegar, which broth is to be thickened with wheat and bran. Various ceremonies are to be performed in the cooking of this mess, which those may see in the book of M. Harcouet, who are at all interested in the matter. And the chickens are to be fed upon it for two months. They are then fit for table, and are to be washed down with moderate quantities of good white wine or claret. This regimen is to be followed regularly every seven years, and any one may live to be as old as Methuselah. It is right to state that M. Harcouet has but little authority for attributing this precious composition to Arnold of Villeneuve. It is not found in the collected works of that philosopher, but was first brought to light by a M. Poirier at the commencement of the sixteenth century, who asserted that he had discovered it in manuscript in the undoubted writing of Arnold. End of chapter 4, part 1「Chapter Four, Part Two of Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Volume One, by Charles Mackay. The Alchemists, Part Two. Pietro Dapone. This unlucky sage was born at Apon, near Padua, in the year 1250. Like his friend Arnold de Villeneuve, he was an eminent physician, and a pretender to the arts of astrology and alchemy. He practiced for many years in Paris, and made great wealth by killing and curing, and telling fortunes. In an evil day for him he returned to his own country, with the reputation of being a magician of the first order. 
It was universally believed that he had drawn seven evil spirits from the infernal regions, whom he kept enclosed in seven crystal vases, until he required their services, when he sent them forth to the ends of the earth, to execute his pleasure. One spirit excelled in philosophy, a second in alchemy, a third in astrology, a fourth in physic, a fifth in poetry, a sixth in music, and the seventh in painting. And whenever Pietro wished for information or instruction in any of these arts, he had only to go to his crystal vase and liberate the presiding spirit. Immediately all the secrets of the art were revealed to him, and he might, if it pleased him, excel Homer in poetry, Apelles in painting, or Pythagoras himself in philosophy. Although he could make gold out of brass, it was said of him that he was very sparing of his powers in that respect, and kept himself constantly supplied with money by other and less credible means. Whenever he dispersed gold, he muttered a certain charm, known only to himself, and next morning the gold was safe again in his own possession. The traitor to whom he gave it might lock it in his strong-box, and have it guarded by a troop of soldiers, but the charmed metal flew back to its old master. Even if it were buried in the earth, or thrown into the sea, the dawn of the next morning would behold it in the pockets of Pietro. Few people, in consequence, like to have dealings with such a personage, especially for gold. Some, bolder than the rest, thought that his power did not extend over silver, but when they made the experiment they found themselves mistaken. Bolts and bars could not restrain it, and it sometimes became invisible in their very hands, and was whisked through the air to the purse of the magician. He necessarily acquired a very bad character, and having given utterance to some sentiments regarding religion, which were the very reverse of orthodox, he was summoned before the tribunals of the Inquisition to answer for his crimes as a heretic and a sorcerer. He loudly protested his innocence, even upon the rack, where he suffered more torture than nature could support. He died in prison ere his trial was concluded, but was afterwards found guilty. His bones were ordered to be dug up and publicly burned. He was also burned in effigy in the streets of Padua. Raymond Lully while Arnold de Villeneuve and Pietro d'Apone flourished in France and Italy, a more celebrated adept than either appeared in Spain. This was Raymond Lully, a name which stands in the first rank among alchemists. Unlike many of his predecessors, he made no pretensions to astrology or necromancy, but, taking Geber for his model, studied intently the nature and composition of metals, without reference to charms, incantations, or any foolish ceremonies. It was not, however, till late in life that he commenced his study of the art. His early and middle age were spent in a different manner, and his whole history is romantic in the extreme. He was born in an illustrious family in Majorca in the year 1235. When that island was taken from the Saracens by James I, King of Aragon, in 1230, the father of Raymond, who was originally of Catalonia, settled there, and received a considerable appointment from the crown. Raymond married at an early age, and being fond of pleasure, he left the solitudes of his native isle, and passed over with his bride into Spain. He was made Grand Seneschal at the court of King James, and led a gay life for several years. Faithless to his wife, he was always in the pursuit of some new beauty, till his heart was fixed at last by the lovely but unkind Ambrosia de Castello. This lady, like her admirer, was married, but unlike him, was faithful to her vows, and treated all his solicitations with disdain. Raymond was so enamoured, that repulse only increased his flame. He lingered all night under her windows, wrote passionate verses in her praise, neglected his affairs, and made himself the butt of all the courtiers. One day, while watching under her lattice, he by chance caught sight of her bosom, as her neckerchief was blown aside by the wind. The fit of inspiration came over him, and he sat down and composed some tender stanzas upon the subject, and sent them to the lady. The fair Ambrosia had never before condescended to answer his letters, but she replied to this. She told him that she could never listen to his suit, that it was unbecoming in a wise man to fix his thoughts, as he had done, on any other than his God, and entreated him to devote himself to a religious life, and conquer the unworthy passion which he had suffered to consume him. She, however, offered, if he wished it, to show him the fair bosom which had so captivated him. Raymond was delighted. He thought the latter part of this epistle but ill corresponded with the former, and that Ambrosia, in spite of the good advice she gave him, had at last relented, and would make him as happy as he desired. He followed her about from place to place, entreating her to fulfill her promise, but still Ambrosia was cold, 
and implored him with tears to importune her no longer, for that she never could be his, and never would, if she were free to-morrow. "'What means your letter, then?' said the despairing lover. "'I will show you,' replied Ambrosia, who immediately uncovered her bosom, and exposed to the eyes of her horror-stricken admirer a large cancer which had extended to both breasts. She saw that he was shocked, and extending her hand to him, she prayed him once more to lead a religious life, and set his heart upon the Creator, and not upon the creature. He went home an altered man. He threw up on the morrow his valuable appointment at the court, separated from his wife, and took a farewell of his children, after dividing one half of his ample fortune among them. The other half he shared among the poor. He then threw himself at the foot of a crucifix, and devoted himself to the service of God, vowing, as the most acceptable atonement for his errors, that he would employ the remainder of his days in the task of converting the Mussulmans to the Christian religion. In his dream he saw Jesus Christ, who said to him, Raymond, Raymond, follow me. The vision was three times repeated, and Raymond was convinced that it was an intimation direct from heaven. Having put his affairs in order, he set out on a pilgrimage to the shrine of St. James of Compostello, and afterwards lived for ten years in solitude amid the mountains of Aranda. Here he learned the Arabic, to qualify himself for his mission of converting the Mohammedans. He also studied various sciences, as taught in the works of the learned men of the East, and first made acquaintance with the writings of Geber, which were destined to exercise so much influence over his future life. At the end of this probation, and when he had entered his fortieth year, he emerged from his solitude into more active life. With some remains of his fortune, which had accumulated during his retirement, he founded a college for the study of Arabic, which was approved of by the Pope, with many commendations upon his zeal and piety. At this time he narrowly escaped assassination from an Arabian youth whom he had taken into his service. Raymond prayed to God, in some of his excesses of fanaticism, that he might suffer martyrdom in his holy cause. His servant had overheard him, and being as great a fanatic as his master, he resolved to gratify his wish, and punish him at the same time for the curses which he incessantly launched against Mohammed and all who believed in him, by stabbing him to the heart. He therefore aimed a blow at his master as he sat one day at table, but the instinct of self-preservation being stronger than the desire of martyrdom, Raymond grappled with his antagonist and overthrew him. He scorned to take his life himself, but handed him over to the authorities of the town, by whom he was afterwards found dead in his prison. After this adventure Raymond travelled to Paris, where he resided for some time, and made the acquaintance of Arnold de Villeneuve. From him he probably received some encouragement to search for the philosopher's stone, as he began from that time forth to devote less of his attention to religious matters, and more to the study of alchemy. Still he never lost sight of the great object for which he lived, the conversion of the Mohammedans, and proceeded to Rome to communicate personally with Pope John the Twenty First on the best measures to be adopted for that end. The Pope gave him encouragement in words, but failed to associate any other persons with him in the enterprise which he meditated. Raymond, therefore, set out for Tunis alone, and was kindly received by many Arabian philosophers who had heard of his fame as a professor of alchemy. If he had stuck to alchemy while in their country, it would have been well for him, but he began cursing Mohammed, and got himself into trouble. While preaching the doctrines of Christianity in the great bazaar of Tunis, he was arrested and thrown into prison. He was shortly afterwards brought to trial, and sentenced to death. Some of his philosophic friends interceded hard for him, and he was pardoned upon condition that he left Africa immediately, and never again set foot in it. If he was found there again, no matter what his object might be, or whatever length of time might intervene, his original sentence would be carried into execution. Raymond was not at all solicitous of martyrdom, when it came to the point, whatever he might have been when there was no danger, and he gladly accepted his life upon these conditions, and left Tunis with the intention of proceeding to Rome. He afterwards changed his plan, and established himself at Milan, where for a length of time he practiced alchemy, and some say astrology, with great success. Many writers who believe in the secrets of alchemy, and who have noticed the life of Raymond Lully, assert that while in Milan he received letters from Edward, King of England, inviting him to settle in his states. They add that Lully gladly accepted the invitation, and had apartments assigned for his use in the Tower of London, where he refined much gold, superintended the coinage of rose nobles, and made gold out of iron, quicksilver, lead, and pewter, to the amount of six millions. 
The writers in the Bibliographie Universelle, an excellent authority in general, deny that Raymond was ever in England, and say that in all these stories of his wondrous powers as an alchemist, he has been mistaken for another Raymond, a Jew of Tarragona. Naudet, in his Apologie, says simply that six millions were given by Raymond Lully to King Edward to make war against the Turks and other infidels. Not that he transmuted so much metal into gold, but, as he afterwards adds, that he advised Edward to lay a tax upon wool, which produced that amount. To show that Raymond went to England, his admirers quote a work attributed to him, De Transmutatione Animi Metallorum, in which he expressly says that he was in England at the intercession of the king. The hermetic writers are not agreed whether it was Edward I or Edward II who invited him over, but by fixing the date of his journey in 1312, they make it appear that it was Edward II. Edmund Dickinson, in his work on the quintessences of the philosophers, says that Raymond worked in Westminster Abbey, where, a long time after his departure, there was found in the cell which he had occupied a great quantity of golden dust, of which the architects made a great profit. In the biographical sketch of John Kremer, abbot of Westminster, given by Lenglet, it is said that it was chiefly among his instrumentality that Raymond came to England. Kremer had been himself for thirty years occupied in the vain search for the philosopher's stone, when he accidentally met Raymond in Italy, and endeavoured to induce him to communicate his grand secret. Raymond told him that he must find it for himself, as all great alchemists had done before him. Kremer, on his return to England, spoke to King Edward in high terms of the wonderful attainments of the philosopher, and a letter of invitation was forthwith sent him. Robert Constantinus, in the Nomenclator Scriptorum Mediocrum, published in 1515, says that after a great deal of research he found that Raymond Lully resided for some time in London, and that he actually made gold by means of the philosopher's stone in the tower, that he had seen the golden pieces of his coinage, which were still named in England the nobles of Raymond, or Rose Nobles. Lully himself appears to have boasted that he made gold, for in his well-known testamentum he states that he converted no less than fifty thousand pounds weight of quicksilver, lead, and pewter into that metal. It seems highly probable that the English king, believing in the extraordinary powers of the alchemist, invited him to England to make test of them, and that he was employed in refining gold and in coining. Camden, who is not credulous in matters like these, affords his countenance to the story of his coinage of nobles, and there is nothing at all wonderful in the fact of a man famous for his knowledge of metals being employed in such a capacity. Raymond was, at this time, an old man, in his seventy-seventh year, and somewhat in his dotage. He was willing enough to have it believed that he had discovered the grand secret, and supported the rumour rather than contradicted it. He did not long remain in England, but returned to Rome to carry out the projects which were nearer to his heart than the profession of alchemy. He had proposed them to several successive popes, with little or no success. The first was a plan for the introduction of the Oriental languages into all monasteries of Europe. The second, for the reduction into one of all the military orders, that being united, they might move more efficaciously against the Saracens, and the third, that the sovereign pontiff should forbid the works of Averroes to be read in the schools, as being more favourable to Mahometanism than to Christianity. The Pope did not receive the old man with much cordiality, and after remaining for about two years in Rome, he proceeded once more to Africa, alone and unprotected, to preach the gospel of Jesus. He landed at Bona in 1314, and so irritated the Mahometans by cursing their prophet, that they stoned him, and left him for dead on the seashore. He was found some hours afterward by a party of Genoese merchants, who conveyed him on board their vessel, and sailed toward Majorca. The unfortunate man still breathed, but could not articulate. He lingered in this state for some days, and expired just as the vessel arrived within sight of his native shores. His body was conveyed with great pomp to the church of St. Eulala at Palma, where a public funeral was instituted in his honor. Miracles were afterwards said to have been worked at his tomb. Thus ended the career of Raymond Lully, one of the most extraordinary men of his age, and, with the exception of his last boasts about the six millions of gold, the least inclined to quackery of any of the professors of alchemy. His writings were very numerous, and include nearly five hundred volumes, upon grammar, rhetoric, morals, theology, politics, civil and canon law, physics, metaphysics, astronomy, medicine, and chemistry. Roger Bacon. The powerful delusion of alchemy seized upon a mind still greater than that of Raymond Lully. Roger Bacon firmly believed in the philosopher's stone, and spent much of his time in search of it. 
His example helped to render all the learned men of the time more convinced of its practicability, and more eager in the pursuit. He was born at Ilchester, in the county of Somerset, in the year 1214. He studied for some time in the University of Oxford, and afterwards in that of Paris, in which he received the degree of Doctor of Divinity. Returning to England in 1240, he became a monk of the Order of St. Francis. He was by far the most learned man of his age, and his acquirements were so much above the comprehension of his contemporaries, that they could only account for them by supposing that he was indebted for them to the devil. Voltaire has not inaptly designated him de l'or en courte de toutes les ordures de son siècle. But the crust of the superstition that enveloped his powerful mind, though it may have dimmed, could not obscure the brightness of his genius. To him, and apparently to him only, among all the inquiring spirits of the time, were known the properties of the concave and convex lens. He also invented the magic lantern, that pretty plaything of modern days, which acquired for him a reputation that embittered his life. In a history of alchemy, the name of this great man cannot be omitted, although, unlike many others of whom we shall have occasion to speak, he only made it secondary to other pursuits. The love of universal knowledge that filled his mind would not allow him to neglect one branch of science, of which neither he nor the world could yet see the absurdity. He made ample amends for his time lost in this pursuit by his knowledge in physics and his acquaintance with astronomy. The telescope, burning lenses, and gunpowder are discoveries which may well carry his fame to the remotest time, and make the world blind to the one spot of folly, the diagnosis of the age in which he lived, and the circumstances by which he was surrounded. His treatise on the admirable power of art and nature in the production of the philosopher's stone was translated into French by Gérard de Tourne, and published at Lyon in 1557. His Mirror of Alchemy was also published in French in the same year, and in Paris in 1612, with some additions from the works of Raymond Lully. A complete list of all the published treatises upon the subject may be seen in L'Engle de Fresnoy. Pope John the Twenty Second, This prelate is said to have been the friend and pupil of Arnold de Villeneuve, by whom he was instructed in all the secrets of alchemy. Tradition asserts of him that he made great quantities of gold, and died as rich as Croesus. He was born at Cahors, in the province of Guyenne, in the year 1244. He was a very eloquent preacher, and soon reached high dignity in the church. He wrote a work on the transmutation of metals, and had a famous laboratory at Avignon. He issued two bulls against the numerous pretenders to the art, who had sprung up in every part of Christendom, from which it might be inferred that he was himself free from the delusion. The alchemists claim him, however, as one of the most distinguished and successful professors of their art, and say that his bulls were not directed against the real adepts, but the false pretenders. They lay particular stress upon these words in his bull, Spondant quas non exibant divities pauper alchemisti. These, it is clear, they say, relate only to poor alchemists, and therefore false ones. He died in the year 1344, leaving in his coffers a sum of eighteen millions of florins. Popular belief alleged that he had made and not amassed this treasure, and alchemists complacently cite this as a proof that the philosopher's stone was not such a chimera as the incredulous pretended. They take it for granted that John really left this money, and ask by what possible means he could have accumulated it. Replying to their own question, they say triumphantly, his book shows it was by alchemy, the secrets of which he learned from Arnold de Villeneuve and Raymond Lully. But he was as prudent as all other hermetic philosophers. Whoever would read his book to find out his secret would employ all his labor in vain. The Pope took good care not to divulge it. Unluckily, for their own credit, all these gold-makers are in the same predicament, their great secret loses its worth most wonderfully in the telling, and therefore they keep it snugly to themselves. Perhaps they thought that, if everybody could transmute metals, gold would be so plentiful that it would be no longer valuable, and that some new art would be requisite to transmute it back again into steel and iron. If so, society is much indebted to them for their forbearance. Jean de Myung. All classes of men dabbled in the art at this time. The last mentioned was a pope, the one of whom we now speak was a poet. Jean de Mien, the celebrated author of the Roman de la Rose, was born in the year 1279 or 1280, and was a great personage at the courts of Louis X, Philip the Long, Charles IV, and Philip de Valois. His famous poem of the Roman de la Rose, which treats of every subject in vogue at that day, necessarily makes great mention of alchemy. Jean was a firm believer in the art, and wrote, besides his Roman, 
two shorter poems, the one entitled The Remonstrance of Nature to the Wandering Alchemist, and The Reply of the Alchemist to Nature. Poetry and alchemy were his delight, and priests and women were his abomination. A pleasant story is related of him in the ladies of the court of Charles the Fourth. He had written the following libelous couplet upon the fair sex, Tout cette serait ou fut, de fait ou de volonté, putain, et qui très bien vous chercherez, tout putain vous toujourez. Footnote. These verses are but a coarser expression of the slanderous line of Pope, that every woman is at heart a rake. This naturally gave great offence, and being perceived one day in the king's antechamber, by some ladies who were waiting for an audience, they resolved to punish him. To the number of ten or twelve, they armed themselves with canes and rods, and surrounding the unlucky poet, called upon the gentlemen present to strip him naked, that they might wreak just vengeance upon him, and lash him through the streets of the town. Some of the lords present were in no wise loath, and promised themselves great sport from his punishment. But Jean de Mion was unmoved by their threats, and stood up calmly in the midst of them, begging them to hear him first, and then, if not satisfied, they might do as they liked with him. Silence being restored, he stood upon a chair, and entered on his defence. He acknowledged that he was the author of the obnoxious verses, but denied that they bore reference to all womankind. He only meant to speak of the vicious and abandoned, whereas those whom he saw around him were patterns of virtue, loveliness, and modesty. If, however, any lady present thought herself aggrieved, he would consent to be stripped, and she might lash him till her arms were wearied. It is added that by this means Jean escaped his flogging, and that the wrath of the fair ones immediately subsided. The gentlemen present were, however, of opinion, that if every lady in the room whose character corresponded with the verses had taken him at his word, the poet would in all probability have been beaten to death. All his life long he evinced a great animosity toward the priesthood, and his famous poem abounds with passages reflecting upon their avarice, cruelty, and immorality. At his death he left a large box, filled with some weighty material, which he bequeathed to the cordeliers as a peace-offering, for the abuse he had lavished upon them. As his practice of alchemy was well known, it was thought that the box was filled with gold and silver, and the cordeliers congratulated themselves on their rich acquisition. When it came to be opened, they found to their horror that it was filled only with slates, scratched with hieroglyphic and cabalistic characters. Indignant at the insult, they determined to refuse him Christian burial, on pretense that he was a sorcerer. He was, however, honorably buried in Paris, the whole court attending his funeral. End of chapter 4, part 2Chapter 4, Part 3 of Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Morgan Scorpion. Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Volume 1 by Charles Mackay. The Alchemists. Part 3. Nicholas Flamel. The story of this alchemist, as handed down by tradition and enshrined in the pages of Langlader Fresnoy, is not a little marvellous. He was born at Pontoise of a poor but respectable family at the end of the 13th or beginning of the 14th century. Having no patrimony, he set out for Paris at an early age to try his fortune as a public scribe. He had received a good education, was well skilled in the learned languages, and was an excellent penman. He soon procured occupation as a letter writer and copyist, and used to sit at the corner of the Rue de Marivaux and practice his calling, but he hardly made profit enough to keep body and soul together. To mend his fortunes he tried poetry, but this was a more wretched occupation still. As a transcriber he had at least gained bread and cheese, but his rhymes were not worth a crust. He then tried painting with as little success, and as a last resource began to search for the philosopher's stone and tell fortunes. This was a happier idea. He soon increased in substance, and had wherewithal to live comfortably. He therefore took unto himself his wife Petronella, and began to save money, but continued to all outward appearance as poor and miserable as before. In the course of a few years he became desperately addicted to the study of alchemy, 
and thought of nothing but the philosopher's stone, the elixir of life, and the universal alkahest. In the year 1257 he bought by chance an old book for two florins, which soon became his sole study. It was written with a steel instrument upon the bark of trees, and contained twenty-one, or as he himself always expressed it, three times seven leaves. The writing was very elegant and in the Latin language. Each seventh leaf contained a picture and no writing. On the first of these was a serpent swallowing rods. On the second, a cross with a serpent crucified. And on the third, the representation of a desert, in the midst of which was a fountain, with serpents crawling from side to side. It purported to be written by no less a personage than Abraham, patriarch, Jew, prince, philosopher, priest, Levite, and astrologer, and invoked curses upon any one who should cast eyes upon it, without being a sacrificer or a scribe. Nicholas Flamel never thought it extraordinary that Abraham should have known Latin, and was convinced that the characters on the book had been traced by the hands of that great patriarch himself. He was at first afraid to read it, after he became aware of the curse it contained but he got over that difficulty by recollecting that, although he was not a sacrificer, he had practised as a scribe. As he read he was filled with admiration, and found that it was a perfect treatise upon the transmutation of metals. All the processes were clearly explained, the vessels, the retorts, the mixtures, and the proper times and seasons for experiment. But, as ill luck would have it, the possession of the philosopher's stone, or prime agent in the work, was presupposed. This was a difficulty which was not to be got over. It was like telling a starving man how to cook a beefsteak, instead of giving him the money to buy one. But Nicholas did not despair, and set about studying the hieroglyphics and allegorical representations with which the book abounded. He soon convinced himself that it had been one of the sacred books of the Jews, and that it was taken from the Temple of Jerusalem on its destruction by Titus. The process of reasoning by which he arrived at this conclusion is not stated. From some expression in the treatise, he learned that the allegorical drawings on the fourth and fifth leaves enshrined the secret of the philosopher's stone, without which all the fine Latin of the directions was utterly unavailing. He invited all the alchemists and learned men of Paris to come and examine them, but they all departed as wise as they came. Nobody could make anything either of Nicholas or his pictures and some even went so far as to say that his invaluable book was not worth a farthing. This was not to be borne, and Nicholas resolved to discover the great secret by himself without troubling the philosophers. He found on the first page of the fourth leaf the picture of Mercury attacked by an old man resembling Saturn or Time. The latter had an hourglass on his head, and in his hand a scythe with which he aimed a blow at Mercury's feet. The reverse of the leaf represented a flower growing on a mountain top shaken rudely by the wind, with a blue stalk, red and white blossoms, and leaves of pure gold. Around it were a great number of dragons and griffins. On the first page of the fifth leaf was a fine garden, in the midst of which was a rose-tree in full bloom, supported against the trunk of a giant oak. At the foot of this there bubbled up a fountain of milk-white water, which, forming a small stream, flowed through the garden, and was afterwards lost in the sands. On the second page was a king, with a sword in his hand, superintending a number of soldiers who, in execution of his orders, were killing a great multitude of young children, spurning the prayers and tears of their mothers, who tried to save them from destruction. The blood of the children was carefully collected by another party of soldiers, and put into a large vessel, in which two allegorical figures of the sun and the moon were bathing themselves. For twenty-one years poor Nicholas wearied himself with the study of these pictures, but still he could make nothing of them. His wife Petronella at last persuaded him to find out some learned rabbi, but there was no rabbi in Paris learned enough to be of any service to him. The Jews met but small encouragement to fix their abode in France, and all the chiefs of that people were located in Spain. To Spain accordingly Nicholas Flamel repaired. He left his book in Paris, for fear perhaps that he might be robbed of it on the road and telling his neighbours that he was going on a pilgrimage to the shrine of St. James of Compostello, he trudged on foot towards Madrid in search of a rabbi. 
He was absent two years in that country, and made himself known to a great number of Jews, descendants of those who had been expelled from France in the reign of Philip Augustus. The believers in the philosopher's stone gave the following account of his adventures. They say that at Lyon he made the acquaintance of a converted Jew named Couchers, a very learned physician, to whom he explained the title and nature of his little book. The doctor was transported with joy as soon as he heard it named, and immediately resolved to accompany Nicholas to Paris that he might have a sight of it. The two set out together, the doctor on the way entertaining his companion with the history of his book, which, if the genuine book he thought it to be, from the description he had heard of it, was in the handwriting of Abraham himself, and had been in the possession of personages no less distinguished than Moses, Joshua, Solomon, and Esdras. It contained all the secrets of alchemy and of many other sciences, and was the most valuable book that had ever existed in this world. The doctor was himself no mean adept, and Nicholas profited greatly by his discourse, as in the garb of poor pilgrims they wended their way to Paris, convinced of their power to turn every old shovel in that capital into pure gold. But unfortunately, when they reached Orléans, the doctor was taken dangerously ill. Nicholas watched by his bedside, and acted the double part of a physician and nurse to him. But he died after a few days, lamenting with his last breath that he had not lived long enough to see the precious volume. Nicholas rendered the last honours to his body, and with a sorrowful heart, and not one sou in his pocket, proceeded home to his wife Petronella. He immediately recommenced the study of his pictures, but for two whole years he was as far from understanding them as ever. At last, in the third year, a glimmer of light stole over his understanding. He recalled some expression of his friend the doctor, which had hitherto escaped his memory, and he found that all his previous experiments had been conducted on a wrong basis. He recommenced them now with renewed energy, and at the end of the year had the satisfaction to see all his toils rewarded. On the 13th of January, 1382, says Langlais, he made a projection on mercury, and had some very excellent silver. On the 25th of April following, he converted a large quantity of mercury into gold, and the great secret was his. Nicholas was now about eighty years of age, and still a hale and stout old man. His friends say that by a simultaneous discovery of the elixir of life, he found means to keep death at a distance for another quarter of a century, and that he died in 1415 at the age of 116. In this interval he made immense quantities of gold, though to all outward appearance he was as poor as a mouse. At an early period of his change of fortune, he had, like a worthy man, taken counsel with his old wife Petronella as to the best use he could make of his wealth. Petronella replied that, as unfortunately they had no children, the best thing he could do was to build hospitals and endow churches. Nicholas thought so too, especially when he began to find that his elixir could not keep off death, and that the grim foe was making rapid advances upon him. He richly endowed the church of St. Jacques de la Boucherie, near the Rue de Marivaux, where he had all his life resided, besides seven others in different parts of the kingdom. He also endowed fourteen hospitals, and built three chapels. The fame of his great wealth and his munificent benefactions soon spread over all the country, and he was visited, among others, by the celebrated doctors of that day, Jean Gerson, Jean de Cortecois, and Pierre de Ailly. They found him in his humble apartment, meanly clad and eating porridge out of an earthen vessel, and with regard to his secret, as impenetrable as all his predecessors in alchemy. His fame reached the ears of the king, Charles the Sixth, who sent Monsieur de Cramoisy, the master of requests, to find out whether Nicholas had indeed discovered the philosopher's stone. But Monsieur de Cramoisy took nothing by his visit. All his attempts to sound the alchemist were unavailing, and he returned to his royal master no wiser than he came. It was in this year, 1414, that he lost his faithful wife Petronella. He did not long survive her, but died in the following year, and was buried with great pomp by the grateful priests of St. Jacques de la Boucherie. The great wealth of Nicholas Flamel is undoubted, as the records of several churches and hospitals in France can testify. That he practised alchemy is equally certain, as he left behind several works upon the subject. Those who knew him well, and were incredulous about the philosopher's stone, gave a satisfactory solution to, of the secret of his wealth. 
they say that he was always a miser and a usurer that his journey to spain was undertaken with very different motives from those pretended by the alchemists that in fact he went to collect debts due from jews in that country to their brethren in paris and that he charged a commission of fully cent per cent in consideration of the difficulty of collecting and the dangers of the road that when he possessed thousands he lived upon almost nothing and was the general money-lender at enormous profits to all the dissipated young men at the french court among the works written by nicholas flamel on the subject of alchemy is the philosophic summary a poem reprinted in seventeen thirty five as an appendix to the third volume of the roman de la rose he also wrote three treatises upon natural philosophy and an alchemic allegory entitled le désir désiré specimens of his writing and a facsimile of the drawings in his book of abraham may be seen in salmon's bibliothèque des philosophes chimiques the writer of the article flamel in the biographie universelle says that for a hundred years after the death of flamel many of the adepts believed that he was still alive and that he would live for upwards of six hundred years the house he formerly occupied at the corner of the rue de marivaux has been often taken by credulous speculators and ransacked from top to bottom in the hopes that gold might be found a report was current in paris not long previous to the year eighteen sixteen that some lodgers had found in the cellars several jars filled with a dark-coloured ponderous matter upon the strength of the rumour a believer in all the wondrous tales told of nicholas flamel bought the house and nearly pulled it to pieces in ransacking the walls and wainscoting for hidden gold he got nothing for his pains however and had a heavy bill to pay to restore his dilapidations george ripley while alchemy was thus cultivated on the continent of europe it was not neglected in the isles of britain since the time of roger bacon it had fascinated the imagination of many ardent men in england in the year fourteen o four an act of parliament was passed declaring the making of gold and silver to be felony great alarm was felt at that time lest any alchemist should succeed in his projects and perhaps bring ruin upon the state by furnishing boundless wealth to some designing tyrant who would make use of it to enslave his country the alarm appears to have soon subsided for in the year fourteen fifty five king henry the sixth by advice of his council and parliament granted four successive patents and commissions to several knights citizens of london chemists monks mass priests and others to find out the philosopher's stone and elixir to the great benefit said the patent of the realm and the enabling of the king to pay all the debts of the crown in real gold and silver prynne in his aurum reginae observes as a note to this passage that the king's reason for granting this patent to ecclesiastics was that they were such good artists in transubstantiating bread and wine in the eucharist and therefore the more likely to be able to effect the transmutation of baser metals into better no gold of course was ever made and the next year the king doubting very much the practicability of the thing took further advice and appointed a commission of ten learned men and persons of eminence to judge and certify to him whether the transmutation of metals were a thing to practice or no it does not appear whether the commission ever made any report upon the subject in the succeeding reign an alchemist appeared who pretended to have discovered the secret this was george ripley the canon of bridlington in yorkshire he studied for twenty years in the universities of italy and was a great favourite with pope innocent the eighth who made him one of his domestic chaplains and master of the ceremonies in his household returning to england in fourteen seventy seven he dedicated to king edward the fourth his famous work the compound of alchemy or the twelve gates leading to the discovery of the philosopher's stone these gates he described to be calcination solution separation conjunction putrefaction congelation sibation sublimation fermentation exaltation multiplication and projection to which he might have added botheration the most important process of all he was very rich and allowed it to be believed that he could make gold out of iron fuller in his worthies of england says that an english gentleman of good credit reported that in his travels abroad he saw a record in the island of malta which declared that ripley gave yearly to the knights of that island and of rhodes the enormous sum of one hundred thousand pounds sterling to enable them to carry on the war against the turks 
In his old age he became an anchorite near Boston, and wrote twenty-five volumes upon the subject of alchemy, the most important of which is the Duodecim Portarum, already mentioned. Before he died, he seems to have acknowledged that he had misspent his life in this vain study, and requested that all men, when they met with any of his books, would burn them, or afford them no credit, as they had been written merely from his opinion and not from proof, and that subsequent trial had made manifest to him that they were false and vain. Basil Valentine Germany also produced many famous alchemists in the 15th century, the chief of whom are Basil Valentine, Bernard of Treves, and the abbot Trithemius. Basil Valentine was born at Mayence, and was made prior of St. Peter's at Erfurt about the year 1414. It was known during his life that he diligently sought the philosopher's stone and that he had written some works upon the process of transmutation. They were thought for many years to be lost, but were, after his death, discovered enclosed in the stonework of one of the pillars in the abbey. They were twenty-one in number, and are fully set forth in the third volume of Langlais' History of the Hermetic Philosophy. The alchemists asserted that heaven itself conspired to bring to light these extraordinary works, and that the pillar in which they were enclosed was miraculously shattered by a thunderbolt, and that as soon as the manuscripts were liberated, the pillar closed up again of its own accord. Bernard of Treve The life of this philosopher is a remarkable instance of talent and perseverance misapplied. In the search of his chimera nothing could daunt him, Repeated disappointment never diminished his hopes, and from the age of fourteen to that of eighty-five he was incessantly employed among the drugs and furnaces of his laboratory, wasting his life with the view of prolonging it, and reducing himself to beggary in the hopes of growing rich. He was born at either Treves or Padua in the year 1406. His father is said by some to have been a physician in the latter city, and by others to have been Count of the Marches of Treves and one of the most wealthy nobles of his country. At all events, whether noble or physician, he was a rich man, and left his son a magnificent estate. At the age of fourteen he first became enamoured of the science of alchemy, and read the Arabian authors in their own language. He himself has left a most interesting record of his labours and wanderings, from which the following particulars are chiefly extracted. The first book which fell into his hands was that of the Arabian philosopher Razors from the reading of which he imagined that he had discovered the means of augmenting gold a hundredfold. For four years he worked in his laboratory, with the book of razors continually before him. At the end of that time he found that he had spent no less than eight hundred crowns upon his experiment, and had got nothing but fire and smoke for his pains. He now began to lose confidence in razors, and turned to the works of Geber. He studied him assiduously for two years, and being young, rich, and credulous, was beset by all the alchemists of the town who kindly assisted him in spending his money. He did not lose his faith in Geber, or patience with his hungry assistants, until he had lost two thousand crowns, a very considerable sum in those days. Among all the crowd of pretended men of science who surrounded him, there was but one as enthusiastic and as disinterested as himself. With this man, who was a monk of the Order of St. Francis, he contracted an intimate friendship, and spent nearly all his time. Some obscure treatises of Rupasissa and Sacrobosco having fallen into their hands, they were persuaded, from reading them, that highly rectified spirits of wine was the universal alkahest, or dissolvent, which would aid them greatly in the process of transmutation. They rectified the alcohol thirty times, till they made it so strong as to burst the vessels which contained it. After they had worked three years, and spent three hundred crowns in the liquor, they discovered that they were on the wrong track. They next tried alum and copperus, but this great secret still escaped them. They afterwards imagined that there was a marvellous virtue in all excrement, especially the human, and actually employed more than two years in experimenting upon it with mercury, salt, and molten lead. Again the adepts flocked around him from far and near to aid him with their counsels. He received them all hospitably, and divided his wealth among them so generously and unhesitatingly, that they gave him the name of the good Trevisan, by which he is still often mentioned in works that treat on alchemy. For twelve years he led this life, making experiments every day upon some new substance, and praying to God night and morning that he might discover the secret of transmutation. 
In this interval he lost his friend the monk, and was joined by a magistrate of the city of Treves, as ardent as himself in the search. His new acquaintance imagined that the ocean was the mother of gold, and that sea salt would change lead or iron into the precious metals. Bernard resolved to try, and transporting his laboratory to a house on the shores of the Baltic, he worked upon salt for more than a year, melting it, sublimating it, crystallizing it, and occasionally drinking it, for the sake of other experiments. Still the strange enthusiast was not wholly discouraged, and his failure in one trial only made him the more anxious to attempt another. He was now approaching the age of fifty, and had as yet seen nothing of the world. He therefore determined to travel through Germany, Italy, France, and Spain. Wherever he stopped he made inquiries whether there were any alchemists in the neighbourhood. He invariably sought them out, and if they were poor, relieved, and if affluent, encouraged them. At Cito he became acquainted with one Geoffrey Louvier, a monk of that place, who persuaded him that the essence of eggshells was a valuable ingredient. He tried, therefore, what could be done, and was only prevented from wasting a year or two on the experiment by the opinions of an attorney at Bergam in Flanders, who said that the great secret resulted in vinegar and copperas. He was not convinced of the absurdity of this idea until he had nearly poisoned himself. He resided in France for about five years when, hearing accidentally that one Master Henry, confessor to the Emperor Frederick III, had discovered the Philosopher's Stone, he set out for Germany to pay him a visit. He had, as usual, surrounded himself with a set of hungry dependents, several of whom determined to accompany him. He had not heart to refuse them, and he arrived at Vienna with five of them. Bernard sent a polite invitation to the confessor, and gave him a sumptuous entertainment, at which were present nearly all the alchemists of Vienna. Master Henry frankly confessed that he had not discovered the philosopher's stone, but that he had all his life been employed in searching for it, and would so continue till he found it or died. This was a man after Bernard's own heart, and they vowed with each other an eternal friendship. It was resolved at supper that each alchemist present should contribute a certain sum towards raising forty-two marks of gold, which in five days it was confidently asserted by Master Henry, would increase in his furnace, fivefold. Bernard, being the richest man, contributed the lion's share, ten marks of gold. Master Henry, five, and the others one or two apiece, except the dependents of Bernard, who were obliged to borrow their quota from their patron. The grand experiment was duly made. The golden marks were put into a crucible with a quantity of salt, copperas, aquafortis, eggshells, mercury, lead, and dung. The alchemist watched this precious mess with intense interest, expecting that it would soon agglomerate into one lump of pure gold. At the end of three weeks, they gave up the trial, upon some excuse that the crucible was not strong enough, or that some necessary ingredient was wanting. Whether any thief had put his hands into the crucible is not known, but it is alleged that the gold found therein at the close of the experiment was worth only sixteen marks, instead of the forty-two which were put there at the beginning. Bernard, though he made no gold at Vienna, made away with a very considerable quantity. He felt the loss so acutely that he vowed to think no more of the philosopher's stone. This wise resolution he kept for two months, but he was miserable. He was in the condition of the gambler, who cannot resist the fascination of the game while he has a coin remaining, but plays on with the hope of retrieving former losses. Till hope forsakes him and he can live no longer. He returned once more to his beloved crucibles, and resolved to prosecute his journey in search of a philosopher who had discovered the secret, and would communicate it to so zealous and persevering an adept as himself. From Vienna he travelled to Rome, and from Rome to Madrid. Taking ship at Gibraltar, he proceeded to Messina, and from Messina to Cyprus, from Cyprus to Greece, from Greece to Constantinople, and thence into Egypt, Palestine, and Persia. These wanderings occupied him about eight years. From Persia he made his way back to Messina and from thence into France. He afterwards passed over into England, still in search of his great chimera, and this occupied four years more of his life. He was now growing both old and poor, for he was sixty-two years of age, and had been obliged to sell a great portion of his patrimony to provide for his expenses. His journey to Persia had cost upwards of thirteen thousand crowns, about one half of which had been fairly melted in his all-devouring furnaces. 
the other half was lavished upon the sycophants that he made it his business to search out in every town he stopped at on his return to treves he found to his sorrow that if not an actual beggar he was not much better his relatives looked upon him as a madman and refused even to see him too proud to ask for favours from any one and still confident that some day or other he would be the possessor of unbounded wealth he made up his mind to retire to the island of rhodes where he might in the meantime hide his poverty from the eyes of the world here he might have lived unknown and happy but as ill luck would have it he fell in with a monk as mad as himself upon the subject of transmutation they were however both so poor that they could not afford to buy the proper materials to work with they kept up each other's spirits by learned discourses on the hermetic philosophy and in the reading of all the great authors who had written upon the subject thus did they nurse their folly as the good wife of tam o'shanter did her wrath to keep it warm after bernard had resided about a year in rhodes a merchant who knew his family advanced him the sum of eight thousand florins upon the security of the last remaining acres of his formerly large estate once more provided with funds he recommenced his labours with all the zeal and enthusiasm of a young man for three years he hardly stepped out of his laboratory he ate there and slept there and did not even give himself time to wash his hands and clean his beard so intense was his application it is melancholy to think that such wonderful perseverance should have been wasted in so vain a pursuit and that energies so unconquerable should have had no worthier field to strive in even when he had fumed away his last coin and had nothing left in perspective to keep his old age from starvation hope never forsook him he still dreamed of ultimate success and sat down a grey-headed man of eighty to read over all the authors on the hermetic mysteries from geber to his own day lest he should have misunderstood some process which it was not yet too late to recommence the alchemists say he succeeded at last and discovered the secret of transmutation in his eighty-second year they add that he lived three years afterwards to enjoy his wealth he lived it is true to this great age and made a valuable discovery more valuable than gold or gems he learned as he himself informs us just before he had attained his eighty-third year that the great secret of philosophy was contentment with our lot happy would it have been for him if he had discovered it sooner and before he became decrepit a beggar and an exile he died at rhodes in the year fourteen ninety and all the alchemists of europe sang elegies over him and sounded his praise as the good trevisan he wrote several treatises upon his chimera the chief of which are the book of chemistry the verbum de missum and an essay de natura ovi end of chapter four part three Chapter 4, Part 4 of Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Volume 1, by Charles Mackay. The Alchemist, Part 4. Trithemius. The name of this eminent man has become famous in the annals of alchemy, although he did but little to gain so questionable an honour. He was born in the year 1462, at the village of Tritheme, in the electorate of Treves. His father was John Heidenberg, a vine-grower, in easy circumstances, who, dying when his son was but seven years old, left him to the care of his mother. The latter married again very shortly afterwards, and neglected the poor boy the offspring of her first marriage. At the age of fifteen he did not even know his letters, and was besides half-starved and otherwise ill-treated by his stepfather. But the love of knowledge germinated in the breast of the unfortunate youth, and he learned to read at the house of a neighbour. His father-in-law set him to work in the vineyards, and thus occupied all his days. But the nights were his own. He often stole out unheeded when all the household were fast asleep, poring over his studies in the fields, by the light of the moon, and thus taught himself Latin and the rudiments of Greek. He was subjected to so much ill usage at home, in consequence of this love of study, that he determined to leave it. Demanding the patrimony which his father had left him, he proceeded to Treves, and assuming the name of Trithemius, 
from that of his native village of Trithim, lived there for some months under the tuition of eminent masters, by whom he was prepared for the university. At the age of twenty, he took it into his head that he should like to see his mother once more, and he set out on foot from the distant university for that purpose. On his arrival near Spanheim, late in the evening of a gloomy winter's day, it came on to snow so thickly that he could not proceed onwards to the town. He therefore took refuge for the night in a neighbouring monastery, but the storm continued several days, the roads became impassable, and the hospitable monks would not hear of his departure. He was so pleased with them in their manner of life that he suddenly resolved to fix his abode among them and renounce the world. They were no less pleased with him, and gladly received him as a brother. In the course of two years, although still so young, he was unanimously elected their abbot. The financial affairs of the establishment had been greatly neglected. The walls of the building were falling into ruin, and everything was in disorder. Trothemius, by his good management and regularity, introduced a reform in every branch of expenditure. The monastery was repaired, and a yearly surplus, instead of a deficiency, rewarded him for his pains. He did not like to see the monks idle, or occupied solely between prayers for their business and chess for their relaxation. He therefore set them to work to copy the writings of eminent authors. They laboured so assiduously that in the course of a few years their library, which had contained only about forty volumes, was enriched with several hundred valuable manuscripts, comprising many of the classical Latin authors, besides the works of the early fathers and the principal historians and philosophers of more modern date. He retained the dignity of Abbot of Spanheim for twenty-one years, when the monks, tired of the severe discipline he maintained, revolted against him, and chose another abbot in his place. He was afterwards made Abbot of St. James in Warsburg, where he died in 1516. During his learned leisure at Spanheim, he wrote several works upon the occult sciences, the chief of which are an essay on geomancy, or divinations by means of lines and circles on the ground, another upon sorcery, the third upon alchemy, and a fourth upon the government of the world by its presiding angels, which was translated into English and published by the famous William Lilly in 1647. It has been alleged by the believers in the possibility of transmutation that the prosperity of the Abbey of Spanheim, while under his superintendence, was owing more to the philosopher's stone than to wise economy. Trithemius, in common with many other learned men, has been accused of magic, and a marvellous story is told of his having raised from the grave the form of Mary of Burgundy at the intercession of her widowed husband, the Emperor Maximilian. His work on steganographia, or cabalistic writing, was denounced to the Count Palatine, Frederick the Second, as magical and devilish, and it was by him taken from the shelves of his library and thrown into the fire. Trithenius is said to be the first writer who makes mention of the wonderful story of the devil and Dr. Faustus, the truth of which he firmly believed. He also recounts the freaks of a spirit named Hoodkin, by whom he was at times tormented. The Maréchal de Ray One of the greatest encouragers of alchemy in the 15th century was Gilles de Laval, Lord of Ray and a Marshal of France. His name and deeds are little known, but in the annals of crime and folly they might claim the highest and worst preeminence. Fiction has never invented anything wilder or more horrible than his career, and were not the details but too well authenticated by legal and other documents which admit no doubt, the lover of romance might easily imagine they were drawn to please him from the stores of the prolific brain, and not from the page of history. He was born about the year 1420, of one of the noblest families of Brittany. His father dying when Gilles had attained his twentieth year, he came into uncontrolled possession, at that early age, of a fortune which the monarchs of France might have envied him. He was a near kinsman of the Montmorencys, the Roncys, and the Creons, possessed fifteen princely domains, and had an annual revenue of about three hundred thousand livres. 
Besides this, he was handsome, learned, and brave. He distinguished himself greatly in the wars of Charles the Seventh, and was rewarded by that monarch with the dignity of a marshal of France. But he was extravagant and magnificent in his style of living, and accustomed from his earliest years to the gratification of every wish and passion, and this, at last, led him from vice to vice, and from crime to crime, till a blacker name than his is not to be found in any record of human iniquity. In his castle of champ he lived with all the splendour of an eastern caliph. He kept up a troop of two hundred horsemen to accompany him wherever he went, and his excursions, for the purposes of hawking and hunting, were the wonder of all the country around. So magnificent were the caparisons of his steeds and the dresses of his retainers. Day and night his castle was open all the year round, to comers of every degree. He made it a rule to regale even the poorest beggar with wine and hippocras. Every day an ox was roasted whole in his spacious kitchens, besides sheep, pigs and poultry sufficient to feed five hundred persons. He was equally magnificent in his devotions. His private chapel at champ was the most beautiful in France and far surpassed any of those in the richly endowed cathedrals of Notre-Dame in Paris, of Amiens, of Bouvard, or of Rouen. It was hung with cloth of gold and rich velvet. All the chandeliers were of pure gold, curiously inlaid with silver. The great crucifix over the altar was of solid silver, and the chalices and incense burners were of pure gold. He had besides a fine organ, which he caused to be carried from one castle to another on the shoulders of six men whenever he changed his residence. He kept up a choir of twenty-five young children of both sexes, who were instructed in singing by the first musicians of the day. The master of his chapel he called a bishop, who had under him his deans, archdeacons, and vicars, each receiving great salaries, the bishop four hundred crowns a year, and the rest in proportion. He also maintained a whole troop of players, including ten dancing girls, and as many ballad singers, besides morris dancers, jugglers, and montebanks of every description. The theatre on which they performed was fitted up without any regard to expense, and they played mysteries or danced the morris dance every evening for the amusement of himself and household, and such strangers as were sharing his prodigal hospitality. At the age of twenty-three he married Catherine, the wealthy heiress of the House of Tours, for whom he refurbished his castle at an expense of a hundred thousand crowns. His marriage was the signal for new extravagance, and he launched out more madly than ever he had done before, sending for fine singers or celebrated dancers from foreign countries to amuse him and his spouse, and instituting tilts and tournaments in his great courtyard almost every week for all the knights and nobles of the province of Brittany. The Duke of Brittany's court was not half so splendid as that of the Maréchal de Ray. His utter disregard for wealth was so well known that he was made to pay three times its value for everything he purchased. His castle was filled with needy parasites and panderers to his pleasures, amongst whom he lavished rewards with an unsparing hand. But the ordinary round of sensual gratification ceased at last to afford him delight. He was observed to be more absentious in the pleasures of the table, and to neglect the beauteous dancing girls, who used formerly to occupy so much of his attention. He was sometimes gloomy and reserved, and there was an unnatural wildness in his eye, which gave indications of insipid madness. Still, his discourse was as reasonable as ever. His urbanity to the guests that flocked from far and near to champ suffered no diminution and learned priests, when they conversed with him, thought to themselves that few of the nobles of France were so well informed as Gilles de Laval. But dark rumours spread gradually over the country. Murder, and if possible, still more atrocious deeds were hinted at. And it was remarked that many young children of both sexes suddenly disappeared, and were never afterwards heard of. One or two had been traced to the castle of champ and had never been seen to leave it. But no one dared to accuse openly so powerful a man as the Maréchal de Ray. Whenever the subject of the lost children was mentioned in his presence, 
he manifested the greatest astonishment at the mystery which involved their fate, and indignation against those who might be guilty of kidnapping them. Still, the world was not wholly deceived. His name became as formidable to young children as that of the devouring ogre in fairy tales, and they were taught to go miles round rather than pass under the turrets of champ Tochet. In the course of a few years, the reckless extravagance of the marshal drained him of all his funds, and he was obliged to put up some of his estates for sale. The Duke of Brittany entered into a treaty with him for the valuable seniority of Ingrand, but the heirs of Gilles implored the interference of Charles the Seventh to stay the sale. Charles immediately issued an edict, which was confirmed by the provincial parliament of Brittany, forbidding him to alienate his paternal estates. Gilles had no alternative but to submit. He had nothing to support his extravagance, but his allowance as a marshal of France, which did not cover the one-tenth of his expenses. A man of his habits and character could not retrench his wasteful expenditure and live reasonably. He could not dismiss without a pang his horsemen, his jesters, his morris dancers, his choristers and his parasites, or confine his hospitality to those who really needed it. Notwithstanding his diminished resources, he resolved to live as he had lived before, and turn alchemist, that he might make gold out of iron, and be still the wealthiest and most magnificent among the nobles of Brittany. In pursuance of this determination, he sent to Paris, Italy, Germany and Spain, inviting all the adepts in the science to visit him at champ Tochet. The messengers he dispatched on this mission were two of his most needy and unprincipled dependents, Gilles de Sillé and Roger de Briffel. The latter, the obsequious panderer to his most secret and abominable pleasures, he had entrusted with the education of his motherless daughter a child but five years of age, with permission that he might marry her at the proper time to any person he choose, or to himself if he liked it better. This man entered into the new plans of his master with great zeal, and introduced him to one Prolati, an alchemist of Padua, and a physician of Poitia, who was addicted to the same pursuits. The marshal caused a splendid laboratory to be fitted up for them, and the three commenced the search for the philosopher's stone. They were soon afterwards joined by another pretended philosopher, named Anthony Palermo, who aided in their operations for upwards of a year. They all fared sumptuously at the marshal's expense, draining him of the ready money he possessed, and leading him on from day to day, with the hope that they would succeed in the object of their search. From time to time new aspirants from the remotest parts of Europe arrived at his castle, and for months he had upwards of twenty alchemists at work, trying to transmute copper into gold, and wasting the gold which was still his own in drugs and elixirs. But the Lord of Ray was not a man to abide patiently their lingering processes. Pleased with their comfortable quarters, they jogged on from day to day, and would have done so for years had they been permitted but he suddenly dismissed them all, with the exception of the Italian Prolati and the physician of Poitia. These he retained to aid him to discover the secret of the Philosopher's Stone by a bolder method. The Poitiesan had persuaded him that the devil was the great depository of that and all other secrets, and that he would raise him before Gilles, who might enter into any contract he pleased with him. Gilles expressed his readiness and promised to give the devil anything but his soul, or do any deed that the arch-enemy might impose upon him. Attended solely by the physician, he proceeded at midnight to a wild-looking place in a neighbouring forest. The physician drew a magic circle around them on the sward, and muttered for half an hour an invocation to the evil spirit to arise at his bidding, and disclose the secrets of alchemy. Gilles looked on with intense interest, and expected every moment to see the earth open, and deliver to his gaze the great enemy of mankind. At last the eyes of the physician became fixed, his hair stood on end, and he spoke, as if addressing the fiend. But Gilles saw nothing except his companion. At last the physician fell down on the sward, as if insensible. Gilles looked calmly on to see the end. After a few minutes the physician arose, and asked him if he had not seen how angry the devil looked. Gilles replied that he had seen nothing. 
upon which his companion informed him that Balzabub had appeared in the form of a wild leopard, growled at him savagely, and said nothing, and that the reason why the marshal had neither seen nor heard him was that he hesitated in his own mind as to devoting himself entirely to the service. De Ray owed that he had indeed misgivings, and inquired what was to be done to make the devil speak out and unfold his secret. The physician replied that some person must go to Spain and Africa to collect certain herbs which only grew in those countries, and offered to go himself, if de Ray would provide the necessary funds. De Ray at once consented, and the physician set out on the following day with all the gold that his dupe could spare him. The marshal never saw his face again. But the eager lord de champ could not rest. Gold was necessary for his pleasures, and unless by supernatural aid, he had no means of procuring any further supplies. The physician was hardly twenty leagues on his journey, before Gilles resolved to make another effort, to force the devil to divulge the art of gold-making. He went out alone for that purpose, but all his conjurations were of no effect. Balzabub was obstinate, and would not appear. Determined to conquer him if he could, he unbosomed himself to the Italian alchemist, Prolati. The latter offered to undertake the business, upon condition that de Rays did not interfere in the conjurations, and consented besides to furnish him with all the charms and talismans that might be required. He was further to open a vein in his arm, and sign with his blood, a contract that he would work the devil's will in all things, and offer up to him the sacrifice of the heart, lungs, hands, eyes, and blood of a young child. The grasping monomaniac made no hesitation, but agreed at once to the disgusting terms proposed to him. On the following night, Prolati went out alone, and after having been absent for three or four hours, returned to Gilles, who sat anxiously awaiting him. Prolati then informed him that he had seen the devil in the shape of a handsome youth of twenty. He further said that the devil desired to be called Baron in all future invocations, and had shown him a great number of ingots of pure gold, buried under a large oak in the neighbouring forest, all of which, and as many more as he desired, should become the property of the Maréchal de Ray, if he remained firm, and broke no condition of the contract. Prelati further showed him a small casket of black dust, which would turn iron into gold, but as the process was very troublesome, he advised that they should be contented with the ingots they found under the oak tree, and which would more than supply all the wants that the most extravagant imagination could desire. They were not, however, to attempt to look for the gold till a period of seven times seven weeks, or they would find nothing but slates and stones for their pains. Gilles expressed the utmost chagrin and disappointment, and at once said that he could not wait for so long a period. If the devil were not more prompt, Prelati might tell him that the Maréchal de Ray was not to be trifled with, and would decline all further communication with him. Prelati at last persuaded him to wait seven times seven days. They then went at midnight with picks and shovels to dig up the ground under the oak, where they found nothing to reward them but a great quantity of slates marked with hieroglyphics. It was now Prelati's turn to be angry, and he loudly swore that the devil was nothing but a liar and a cheat. The marshal joined cordially in the opinion, but was easily persuaded by the cunning Italian to make one more trial. He promised at the same time that he would endeavour on the following night to discover the reason why the devil had broken his word. He went out alone accordingly, and on his return informed his patron that he had seen Baron, who was exceedingly angry that they had not waited the proper time ere they looked for the ingots. Baron had also said that the Maréchal de Ray could hardly expect any favours from him at a time when he must know that he had been meditating a pilgrimage to the Holy Land to make atonement for his sins. The Italian had doubtless surmised this from some incautious expression of his patron, for de Ray frankly confessed that there were times when, sick of the world and all its pomps and vanities, he thought of devoting himself to the service of God. In this manner the Italian lured on from month to month his credulous and guilty patron, 
extracting from him all the valuables he possessed, and only waiting a favourable opportunity to decamp with his plunder. But the day of retribution was at hand for both. Young girls and boys continued to disappear, in the most mysterious manner, and the rumours against the owner of Champ Toche grew so loud and distinct that the church was compelled to interfere. Representations were made by the Bishop of Nantes to the Duke of Brittany that it would be a public scandal if the accusations against the Maréchal de Ray were not inquired into. He was arrested accordingly in his own castle, along with his accomplice Prelati, and thrown into a dungeon at Nantes to await his trial. The judges appointed to try him were the Bishop of Nantes, Chancellor of Brittany, the Vicar of the Inquisition in France, and the celebrated Pierre Le Hopital, the President of the Provincial Parliament. The offences laid to his charge were sorcery, sodomy, and murder. Gilles, on the first day of his trial, conducted himself with the utmost insolence. He braved the judges on the judgment seat, calling them simoniacs and persons of impure life, and said he would rather be hanged by the neck like a dog without trial than plead either guilty or not guilty before such contemptible miscreants. But his confidence forsook him as the trial proceeded, and he was found guilty on the clearest evidence of all the crimes laid to his charge. It was proved that he took insane pleasure in stabbing the victims of his lust, and in observing the quivering of their flesh and the fading lustre of their eyes as they expired. The confession of Prelati first made the judges acquainted with this horrid madness, and Gilles himself confirmed it before his death. Nearly a hundred children of the villages around his two castles of Champtoche and Mashku had been missed within three years, the greater part, if not all, of whom were immolated to the lust or the cupidity of this monster. He imagined that he thus made the devil his friend, and that his recompense would be the secret of the philosopher's stone. Gilles and Prelati were both condemned to be burned alive. At the place of execution they assumed the air of penitence and religion. Gilles tenderly embraced Prelati, saying, Farewell, friend Francis. In this world we shall never meet again, but let us place our hopes in God. We shall see each other in paradise. Out of consideration for his high rank and connections, the punishment of the marshal was so far mitigated that he was not burned alive like Prelati. He was first strangled and then thrown into the flames. His body, when half consumed, was given over to his relatives for internment, while that of the Italian was burned to ashes and then scattered to the winds. Note 39. For full details of this extraordinary trial, see Lobonau's Nova History de Bretagne and D'Argentaire's work on the same subject. The character and life of Gilles de Ray are believed to have suggested the famous Bluebeard of the nursery tale. Jacques Coeur This remarkable pretender to the secret of the Philosopher's Stone was contemporary with the last mentioned. He was a great personage at the court of Charles the Seventh and in the events of his reign played a prominent part. From a very humble origin, he rose to the highest honours of the state, and amassed enormous wealth by peculation and plunder of the country which he should have served. It was to hide his delinquencies in this respect, and to divert attention from the real source of his riches, that he boasted of having discovered the art of transmuting the inferior metals into gold and silver. His father was a goldsmith in the city of Borges, but so reduced in circumstances towards the latter years of his life that he was unable to pay the necessary fees to procure his son's admission into the guild. Young Jacques became, however, a workman in the royal mint of Borges in 1428, and behaved himself so well and showed so much knowledge of metallurgy that he attained rapid promotion in that establishment. He had also the good fortune to make the acquaintance of the fair Agnes Sorel, by whom he was patronised and much esteemed. Jacques had now three things in his favour, ability, perseverance, and the countenance of the king's mistress. Many a man succeeds with but one of these to help him forward, and it would have been strange indeed if Jacques Coeur, who had them all, should have languished in obscurity. 
While still a young man, he was made master of the mint, in which he had been a journeyman, and installed at the same time into the vacant office of Grand Treasurer of the Royal Household. He possessed an extensive knowledge of finance, and turned it wonderfully to his own advantage as soon as he became entrusted with extensive funds. He speculated in articles of the first necessity, and made himself popular by buying up grain, honey, wines, and other produce, till there was a scarcity, when he sold it again at enormous profit. Strong in the royal favour, he did not hesitate to oppress the poor by continual acts of forestalling a monopoly. As there is no enemy so bitter as the estranged friend, so of all the torrents and tramplers upon the poor, there is none so fierce and reckless as the upstart that sprang from their ranks. The offensive pride of Jacques Coeur to his inferiors was the theme of indignant reproach in his own city, and his cringing humility to those above him was as much an object of contempt to the aristocrats into whose society he thrust himself. But Jacques did not care for the former, and to the latter he was blind. He continued his career till he became the richest man in France, and so useful to the king that no important enterprise was set on foot until he had been consulted. He was sent in 1446 on an embassy to Genoa, and in the following year to Pope Nicholas V. In both these missions he acquitted himself to the satisfaction of his sovereign, and was rewarded with a lucrative appointment, in addition to those which he already held. In the year 1449, the English in Normandy, deprived of their great general, the Duke of Bedford, broke the truce with the French king, and took possession of a small town belonging to the Duke of Brittany. This was the signal for the recommencement of a war, in which the French regained possession of nearly the whole province. The money for this war was advanced, for the most part, by Jacques Coeur. When Rouen yielded to the French, and Charles made his triumphal entry into that city, accompanied by Dunois and his most famous generals, Jacques was among the most brilliant of his cortege. His chariot and horses vied with those of the king in the magnificence of their trappings, and his enemies said of him that he publicly boasted that he alone had driven out the English, and that the valour of the troops would have been nothing without his goal. Dunois appears, also, to have been partly of the same opinion. Without disparaging the courage of the army, he acknowledged the utility of the able financier, by whose means they had been fed and paid, and constantly afforded him his powerful protection. When peace returned, Jacques again devoted himself to commerce, and fitted up several galleys to trade with the Genoese. He also brought large estates in various parts of France, the chief of which were the baronies of saint fago Meneton, Solon, Maubranche, Mion, saint geran de vaux and saint anne de Boussy, the earldoms or counties of La Palace, Champagnel, Beaumont, and villeneuve la gonnet and the Marquisate of Toucy. He also procured for his son, Jean Coeur, who had chosen the church for his profession, a post no less distinguished than that of Archbishop of Bourges. Everybody said that so much wealth could not have been honestly acquired, and both rich and poor longed for the day that should humble the pride of the man, whom the one class regarded as an upstart, and the other as an oppressor. Jacques was somewhat alarmed at the rumours that were afloat respecting him, and of dark hints that he had debased the coin of the realm, and forged the king's seal to an important document, by which he had defrauded the state of very considerable sums. To silence these rumours, he invited many alchemists from foreign countries to reside with him, and circulated a counter-rumour, that he had discovered the secret of the philosopher's stone. He also built a magnificent house in his native city, over the entrance of which he caused to be sculptured the emblems of that science. Some time afterward he built another, no less splendid, at Montpellier, which he inscribed in a similar manner. He also wrote a treatise upon the hermetic philosophy, in which he pretended that he knew the secret of transmuting metals. But all these attempts to disguise his numerous acts of peculation proved unavailing, and he was arrested in 1452, and brought to trial on several charges. Upon one only, which the malice of his enemies invented to ruin him, was he acquitted, which was that he had been accessory to the death by poison 
of his kind patroness, Agnes Sorel. Upon the others he was found guilty, and sentenced to be banished the kingdom, and to pay the enormous fine of four hundred thousand crowns. It was proved that he had forged the king's seal, that in his capacity of master of the mint of Borges, he had debased, to a very great extent, the gold and silver coin of the realm, and that he had not hesitated to supply the Turks with arms and money to enable them to carry on war against their Christian neighbours, for which service he had received the most magnificent recompenses. Charles the Seventh was deeply grieved at his condemnation, and believed to the last that he was innocent. By his means the fine was reduced, within a sum which Jacques Kerr could pay. After remaining for some time in prison, he was liberated, and left France with a large sum of money, part of which, it was alleged, was secretly paid him by Charles out of the produce of his confiscated estates. He retired to Cyprus, where he died about 1460, the richest and most conspicuous personage of the island. The writers upon alchemy all claim Jacques Coeur as a member of their fraternity, and treat as false and libelous the more rational explanation of his wealth, which the records of his trial afford. Pierre Borel, in his Antiquities Golioses, maintains the opinion that Jacques was an honest man, and that he made his gold out of lead and copper, by means of the philosopher's stone. The alchemic adepts in general were of the same opinion, but they found it difficult to persuade even his contemporaries of the fact. Posterity is still less likely to believe it. End of chapter 4, part 4「Chapter 4, Part 5 of Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Volume 1 by Charles McKay. The Alchemists, Part 5 Inferior Adepts of the 14th and 15th Centuries Many other pretenders to the secrets of the Philosopher's Stone appeared in every country in Europe during the 14th and 15th centuries. The possibility of transmutation was so generally admitted that every chemist was more or less an alchemist. Germany, Holland, Italy, Spain, Poland, France and England produced thousands of obscure adepts who supported themselves in the pursuit of their chimera by the more profitable resources of astrology and divination. The monarchs of Europe were no less persuaded than their subjects of the possibility of discovering the philosopher's stone. Henry the Sixth and Edward the Fourth of England encouraged alchemy. In Germany, the emperors Maximilian, Rudolf, and Frederick the Second devoted much of their attention to it, and every inferior potentate within their dominos imitated their example. It was a common practice in Germany among the nobles and petty sovereigns to invite an alchemist to take up his residence among them, that they might confine him in a dungeon till he made gold enough to pay millions for his ransom. Many poor wretches suffered perpetual imprisonment in consequence. A similar fate appears to have been intended by Edward II for Raymond Lully, who, Upon the pretense that he was thereby honoured, was accommodated with apartments in the Tower of London. He found out in time the trick that was about to be played him, and managed to make his escape, some of his biographers say, by jumping into the themes and swimming to a vessel that lay waiting to receive him. In the 16th century, the same system was pursued, as will be shown more fully in the life of Seton the Cosmopolite. 
The following is a catalogue of the chief authors upon alchemy who flourished during this epoch and whose lives and adventures are either unknown or are unworthy of more detailed notice. John Dunstan, an Englishman, lived in 1315 and wrote two treatises on the philosopher's stone. Richard, or as some call him Robert, also an Englishman, lived in 1330 and wrote a work entitled Correctorium Alchemiae, which was much esteemed till the time of Paracelsus. In the same year lived Peter of Lombardy, who wrote what he called a complete treatise upon the hermetic science, an abridgment of which was afterwards published by Lacini, a monk of Calabria. In 1330, the most famous alchemist of Paris was one Odomar, whose work, the Practica Magistri, was for a long time a handbook among the brethren of the science. John de Rupecissa, a French monk of the order of Saint Francis, flourished in 1357 and pretended to be a prophet as well as an alchemist. Some of his prophecies were so disagreeable to Pope Innocent VI that the pontiff determined to put a stop to them by locking up the prophet in the dungeons of the Vatican. It is generally believed that he died there, though there is no evidence of the fact. His chief works are The Book of Light, The Five Essences, The Heaven of Philosophers, and his grand work the Confectione Lapidis. He was not thought a shining light among the adepts. Ortholani was another pretender, of whom nothing is known, but that he exercised the arts of alchemy and astrology at Paris shortly before the time of Nicolas Flamel. His work on the practice of alchemy was written in that city in 1358, Isaac of Holland wrote, it is supposed, about this time, and his son also devoted himself to the science. Nothing worth repeating is known of their lives. Boerhaave speaks with commendation of many passages in their works, and Paracelsus esteemed them highly. The chief are the Triplici Ordine Elixiris et Lapidis Theoria, printed at Bern in 1608, and Mineralia Opera, Seu de Lapide Philosophico, printed at Middleburg in 1600. They also wrote eight other works upon the same subject. Kofsky, a Pole, wrote an alchemical treatise entitled The Tincture of Minerals about the year 1488. In this list of authors, a royal name must not be forgotten. Charles VI of France, one of the most credulous princes of the day, whose court absolutely swarmed with alchemists, conjurers, astrologers and quacks of every description, made several attempts to discover the philosopher's stone, and thought he knew so much about it that he determined to enlighten the world with a treatise. It is called the royal work of Charles VI of France and the treasure of philosophy. It is said to be the original from which Nicolas Flamel took the idea of his Désir Désiré. Langlet du Fresnoy says it is very allegorical and utterly incomprehensible. For a more complete list of the hermetic philosophers of the 14th and 15th centuries, the reader is referred to the third volume of Langlet's history, already quoted. Progress of the infatuation during the 16th and 17th centuries Present state of the science during the 16th and 17th centuries, the search for the philosopher's stone was continued by thousands of enthusiastic and the credulous. But a great change was introduced during this period. The eminent men who devoted themselves to the study totally changed its aspect 
and refer to the possession of the one rue stone and elixir, not only the conversion of the base into the precious metal, but the solution of all the difficulties of other sciences. They pretended that by its means man would be brought into closer communion with his maker, that disease and sorrow would be banished from the world, and that the millions of spiritual beings who walk the earth unseen would be rendered visible and become the friends, companions and instructors of mankind. In the 17th century, more especially, these poetical and fantastic doctrines excited the notice of Europe, and from Germany, where they had been first disseminated by Rosencruz, spread into France and England, and ran away with the sound judgment of many clever but too enthusiastic searchers for the truth. Paracelsus D. and many others of less note were captivated by the grace and beauty of the new mythology, which was arising to adorn the literature of Europe. Most of the alchemists of the 16th century, although ignorant of the Rosicrucians as a sect, were, in some degree, tinctured with their fanciful tenets. But before we speak more fully of these poetical visionaries, it will be necessary to resume the history of the hermetic folly and a trace of the gradual change that stole over the dreams of the adepts. It will be seen that the infatuation increased rather than diminished as the world grew older. Augurello Among the alchemists who were born in the 15th and distinguished themselves in the 16th century, the first in point of date is John Aurelio Augurello. He was born at Rimini in 1441 and became professor of the Belles Lettres at Venice and Trevisa. He was early convinced of the truth of the hermetic science and used to pray to God that he might be happy enough to discover the philosopher's stone. He was continually surrounded by the paraphernalia of chemistry and expanded all his wealth in the purchase of drugs and metals. He was also a poet, but of less merit than pretentious. His Chrysopeia, in which he pretended to teach the art of making gold, he dedicated to Pope Leo X in the hope that the pontiff would reward him handsomely for the compliment. But the Pope was too good a judge of poetry to be pleased with the worse than the mediocrity of his poem, and too good a philosopher to approve of the strange doctrines which it inculcated. He was, therefore, far from gratified at the dedication. It is said that when Augurello applied to him for a reward, the Pope, with great ceremony and much apparent kindness and cordiality, drew an empty purse from his pocket and presented it to the alchemist, saying that since he was able to make gold, the most appropriate present that could be made him was a purse to put it in. This curvy reward was all that the poor alchemist ever got, either for his poetry or his alchemy. He died in a state of extreme poverty in the eighty-third year of his age. Cornelius Agrippa This alchemist has left a distinguished reputation. The most extraordinary tales were told and believed of his powers. He could turn iron into gold by his mere word. All the spirits of the air and demons of the earth were under his command and bound to obey him in everything. He could raise from the dead the forms of the great men of other days and make them appear in their habit as they lived to the gaze of the curious who had courage enough to abide their presence. He was born at Cologne in 1486 and began at an early age the study of chemistry and philosophy. By some means or other, which have never been very clearly explained, he managed to impress his contemporaries with a great idea of his wonderful attainments. At the early age of twenty, so great was his reputation as an alchemist that the principal adepts of Paris wrote to Cologne, 
inviting him to settle in France and aid them with his experience in discovering the philosopher's stone. Honors poured upon him in thick succession, and he was highly esteemed by all the learned men of his time. Melanchthon speaks of him with respect and commendation. Erasmus also bears testimony in his favor, and the general voice of his age proclaimed him a light of literature and an ornament to philosophy. Some men, by dint of excessive egotism, managed to persuade their contemporaries that they are very great men indeed. They publish their acquirements so loudly in people's ears, and keep up their own praises so incessantly, that the world's applause is actually taken by storm. Such seems to have been the case with Agrippa. He called himself a sublime theologian, an excellent jurisconsult and an able physician, a great philosopher and a successful alchemist. The world at last took him at his word, and thought that a man who talks so big must have some merit to recommend him. That he was, indeed, a great trumpet which sounded so obstreperous a blast. He was made secretary to the Emperor Maximilian, who conferred upon him the title of Chevalier, and gave him the honorary command of regiment. He afterwards became professor of Hebrew and the Belles Lettres at the University of Dole in France, but quarrelling with the Franciscan monks upon some knotty points of divinity, he was obliged to quit the town. He took refuge in London, where he taught Hebrew and cast nativities for about a year. From London he proceeded to Pavia and gave lectures upon the writings, real or supposed, of Hermes Trismegistus, and might have lived there in peace and honour had he not again quarrelled with the clergy. By their means his position became so disagreeable that he was glad to accept an offer made him by the magistracy of Metz to become the syndic and advocate general. Here again his love of disputation made him enemies. The theological wiseacres of that city asserted that Saint Anne had three husbands, in which opinion they were confirmed by the popular belief of the day. Agrippa needlessly ran foul of this opinion, or prejudice as he called it, and thereby lost much of his influence. Another dispute more creditable to his character occurred soon after, and sank him for ever in the estimation of the medicines, humanly taking the part of a young girl who was accused of witchcraft. His enemies asserted that he was himself a sorcerer, and raised such a storm over his head that he was forced to fly the city. After this he became physician to Louisa de Savoy, mother of King Francis I. This lady was curious to know the future, and required her physician to cast her nativity. Agrippa replied that he would not encourage such idle curiosity. The result was, he lost her confidence, and was forthwith dismissed. If it had been through his belief in the worthlessness of astrology that he made his answer, we might admire his honest and fearless independence. But when it is known that, at the very same time, he was in the constant habit of divination and fortune-telling, and that he was predicting splendid success in all his undertakings to the constable of Bourbon, we can only wonder at his thus estranging a powerful friend through mere petulance and perversity. He was about this time invited both by Henry the Eighth of England and Margaret of Austria, governess of the Low Countries, to fix his residence in their dominus. He chose the service of the latter, by whose influence he was made historiographer to the Emperor Charles V. Unfortunately for Agrippa, he never had stability enough to remain long in one position and offended his patrons by his relentless and presumption. After the death of Margaret he was imprisoned at Brussels on a charge of sorcery. He was released after a year, 
and quitting the country experienced many vicissitudes. He died in great poverty in 1534, aged 48 years. While in the service of Margaret of Austria, he resided principally at Lovien, in which city he wrote his famous work on the vanity and nothingness of human knowledge. He also wrote to please his royal mistress a treatise upon the superiority of the female sex, which he dedicated to her in token of his gratitude for the favours she had heaped upon him. The reputation he left behind him in these provinces was anything but favourable. A great number of the marvellous tales that are told of him relate to this period of his life. It was said that the gold which he paid to the traders with whom he dealt always looked remarkably bright, but invariably turned into pieces of slate and stone in the course of four and twenty hours. Of this spurious gold he was believed to have made large quantities by the aid of the devil, who, it would appear from this, had but a very superficial knowledge of alchemy, and much less than the Marquis de Reyes gave him credit for. The Jesuit Delirio, in his book on magic and sorcery, relates a still more extraordinary story of him. One day, Agrippa, left his house at Luvian, and intending to be absent for some time, gave the key of his study to his wife, with strict orders that no one should enter it during his absence. The lady herself, strange as it may appear, had no curiosity to pry into her husband's secrets, and never once thought of entering the forbidden room but a young student who had been accommodated with an attic in the philosopher's house burned with a fierce desire to examine the study hoping perchance that he might purloin some book or implement which would instruct him in the art of transmuting metals the youth being handsome eloquent and above all highly complimentary to the charms of the lady she was persuaded without much difficulty to hand him the key, but gave him strict orders not to remove anything. The student promised implicit obedience and entered Agrippa's study. The first object that caught his attention was a large grimoire, or book of spells, which lay open on the philosopher's desk. He sat himself down immediately and began to read. At the first word he uttered, he fancied he heard a knock at the door. He listened, but all was silent. Thinking that his imagination had deceived him, he read on, when immediately a louder knock was heard, which so terrified him, that he started to his feet. He tried to say, come in, but his tongue refused its office, and he could not articulate a sound. He fixed his eyes upon the door, which slowly opening disclosed a stranger of majestic form, but scowling features who demanded sternly why he was summoned. I did not summon you, said the trembling student. You did, said the stranger, advancing angrily, and the demons are not to be invoked in vain. The student could make no reply, and the demon enraged that one of the uninitiated should have summoned him out of mere presumption, seized him by the throat and strangled him. When Agrippa returned, a few days afterwards, he found his house beset with devils. Some of them were sitting on the chimney pots, kicking up their legs in the air, while others were playing at leapfrog on the very edge of the parapet. His study was so filled with them that he found it difficult to make his way to his desk. When, at last, he had elbowed his way through them, he found his book open and the student lying dead upon the floor. He saw immediately how the mischief had been done, and dismissing all the inferior imps, asked the principal demon how he could have been so rash as to kill the young man. The demon replied that he had been needlessly invoked by an insulting youth and could do no less than kill him for his presumption. Agrippa reprimanded him severely, 
and ordered him immediately to reanimate the dead body and walk about with it in the market place for the whole of the afternoon the demon did so the student revived and putting his arm through that of his unearthly murderer walked very lovingly with him in sight of all the people at sunset the body fell down again cold and lifeless as before and was carried by the crowd to the hospital it being the general opinion that he had expired in a fit of apoplexy his conductor immediately disappeared when the body was examined marks of strangulation were found on the neck and prints of the long clothes of the demon on various parts of it these appearances together with a story which soon obtained currency that the companion of the young man had vanished in a cloud of flame and smoke opened people's eyes to the truth the magistrates of Luvian instituted inquiries and the result was that Agrippa was obliged to quit the town. Other authors besides the Livrio relate similar stories of this philosopher. The world in those days was always willing enough to believe in tales of magic and sorcery and when, as in Agrippa's case, the alleged magician gave himself out for such and claimed credit for the wonders he worked it is not surprising that the age should have allowed its pretensions it was dangerous posting which sometimes led to the stake or the gallows and therefore was thought to be not without foundation paulus jovius in his eulogia doctorum virorum says that the devil in the shape of a large black dog attended agrippa wherever he went thomas nash in his adventures of jack wilton relates that at the request of lord Surrey, erasmus and some other learned men agrippa called up from the grave many of the great philosophers of antiquity among others tully whom he caused to re-deliver his celebrated oration for oscius he also showed lord Surrey, when in germany an exact resemblance in a glass of his mistress the fair geraldine she was represented on a couch weeping for the absence of her lover lord Surrey made a note of the exact time at which he saw this vision and ascertained afterwards that his mistress was actually so employed at the very minutes to thomas lord cromwell agrippa represented king harry the eighth hunting in wisdor park with the principal lords of his court and to please the emperor charles v he summoned king david and king solomon from the tomb now they in his apology for the great man who had been falsely suspected of magic takes a great deal of pains to clear agrippa from the imputation cast upon him by delirio paus jominus and other such ignorant prejudiced scribblers such stories demanded a refutation in the days of now they, but they may now be safely left to decay in their own absurdity that they should have attached to however to the memory of a man who claimed the power of making iron obeying him when he told it to become gold and who wrote such a work as that upon magic which goes by his name is not at all surprising paracelsus this philosopher called by now there the zenith and rising sun of all the alchemists was born at Einsiedeln, near Zurich, in the year of 1493. His true name was Hoenim, to which, as he himself informs us, were prefixed the baptismal names of Aurelius Theoprasus Pombastes Paracelsus. The last of these he chose for his common designation while he was yet a boy, and rendered it before he died one of the most famous in the annals of his time his father who was a physician educated his son for the same pursuit the latter was an apt scholar and made great progress by chance the work of isaac hollandus fell into his hands and from that time he became smitten with the mania of the philosopher's stone all his thoughts henceforth were devoted to metallurgy and he travelled into Sweden that he might visit the mines of that country. 
and examine the oaths while they yet lay in the bowels of the earth. He also visited three Themis at the monastery of Spanheim, and obtained instruction from him in the science of alchemy. Continuing his travels, he proceeds through Prussia and Austria into Turkey, Egypt, and Tartary, and thence, returning to Constantinople, learn, as he boasts, the art of transmutation, and became possessed of the elixir vitae. He then established himself as a physician in his native Switzerland at Zurich, and commenced writing works upon alchemy and medicine, which immediately fixed the attention of Europe. Their great obscurity was no impediment to their fame, for the less the author was understood, the more the demonologists, fanatics, and philosopher's stone hunters seemed to appreciate him. His fame as a physician kept pace with that which he enjoyed as an alchemist, owing to his having effected some happy cures by means of mercury and opium, drugs unceremoniously condemned by his professional brethren. In the year 1526 he was chosen professor of physics and natural philosophy in the University of Basel, where his lectures attracted vast numbers of students. He denounced the writings of all former physicians as tending to mislead, and publicity burned the works of Galen and Avicenna as quacks and impostors. He exclaimed in presence of the admiring and half-bewildered crowd who assembled to witness the ceremony that there was more knowledge in his shoe strings than in the writings of these physicians. Continuing the same strain, he said that all the universities in the world were full of ignorant quacks, but that he, Paracelsus, overflowed with wisdom. You will all follow my new system, said he, with furious gesticulations. Avicenna, Galen, Rezis, Montagnana, Meme, you will all follow me. Ye professors of Paris, Montpellier, Germany, Cologne, and Vienna, and all ye that dwell on the Rhine and the Danube, ye that inhabit the isles of the sea, and ye also Italians, Dalmatians, Athenians, Arabians, Jews, ye will all follow my doctrines, for I am the monarch of medicine. But he did not long enjoy the esteem of the good citizen of Basel, it is said that he indulged in wine so freely and not unfrequently to be seen in the streets in a state of intoxication. This was ruinous for a physician, and his good fame decreased rapidly. His ill fame increased in still greater proportion, especially when he assumed the airs of a sorcerer. He boasted of the legends of spirits and his command, and of one especially which he kept in prison in the hilt of his sword. Wetteress, who lived twenty-seven months in his service, relates that he often threatened to invoke a whole army of demons, and show him the great authority which he could exercise over them. He let it be believed that the spirit in his sword had custody of the elixir of life, by means of which he could make any one life to be as old as the antediluvians. He also boasted that he had a spirit at his common, called Azoth, whom he kept in prison in a jewel, and in many of the old portraits he is represented with a jewel inscribed with the word Azoth in his hand. If a sober prophet has little honor in his own country, a drunken one has still less. Paracelsus found it at last convenient to quit Basel and establish himself in Strasbourg. The immediate cause of his change of residence was as follows. A citizen lay at the point of death and was given over by all the physicians of the town. As a last resource, Paracelsus was called in, to whom the sick man promised a magnificent recompense if, by his means, he were cured. Paracelsus gave him two small pills, which the man took and rapidly recovered. When he was quite well, Paracelsus sent for his fee, but the citizen had no great opinion of the value of a cure which had been so speedily effected. 
he had no notion of paying a handful of gold for two pills, although they had saved his life, and he refused to pay more than the usual fee for a single visit. Paracelsus brought an action against him and lost it. This result so exasperated him that he left Basel in high dungeon. He resumed his wandering life and travelled in Germany and Hungary, supporting himself as he went on the credulity and infatuation of all classes of society. He cast nativities, told fortunes, aided those who had money to throw away upon the experiment to find the philosopher's stone, prescribed remedies for cows and pigs, and aided in the recovery of stolen goods. After residing successfully at Nuremberg, Augsburg, Vienna and Middle Lane, he retired in the year of 1541 to Salzburg and died in a state of abject poverty in the hospital of that town. If this strange charlatan found hundreds of admirers during his life, he found thousands after his death. A sect of Paracelsists sprang up in France and Germany to perpetuate the extravagant doctrines of their founder upon all the sciences and upon alchemy in particular. The chief leaders were Bodestein and Dornius. The following is a summary of his doctrine founded upon the supposed existence of the philosopher's stone. It is worth preserving from its very absurdity and is altogether unparalleled in the history of philosophy. First of all, he maintained that the contemplation of the perfection of deity sufficed to procure all wisdom and knowledge, that the Bible was the key to the theory of all diseases, and that it was necessary to search in the Apocalypse to know the signification of magic medicine. The man who blindly obeyed the will of God, and who succeeded in identifying himself with the celestial intelligences, possessed the philosopher's stone. He could cure all diseases and prolong life as many centuries as he pleased, it being by the very same means that Adam and the antediluvian patriarchs prolonged theirs. Life was an emanation from the stars, the sun governed the heart, and the moon the brain. Jupiter governed the liver, Saturn the gall, Mercury the lungs, Mars the bile, and Venus the loins. In the stomach of every human being there dwelt a demon or intelligence that was a sort of alchemist in his way, and mixed in their due proportions in his crucible the various elements that were sent into that grand laboratory, the belly. He was proud of the title of magician and boasted that he kept up a regular correspondence with Galen from hell and that he often summoned Avicenna from the same regions to dispute with him on the false notions he had promulgated respecting alchemy, and especially regarding portable gold and the elixir of life. He imagined that gold could cure ossification of the heart, and, in fact, all diseases, if it were gold which had been transmuted from an inferior metal by means of the philosopher's stone, and if it were applied under certain conjunctions of the planets, the mere list of the works in which he advanced these frantic imaginings, which he called a doctrine, would occupy several pages. George Agricola This alchemist was born in the province of Misnia in 1494. His real name was Bauer, meaning a husbandman, which, in accordance with the common fashion of his age, he latinized into Agricola. From his early youth he delighted in the visions of the hermetic science. Ere uh, he was sixteen, he longed for the great elixir which was to make him life for seven hundred years, and for the stone which was to procure him wealth to cheer him in his multiplicity of days. He published a small treatise upon the subject at Cologne in 1531, which obtained him the patronage of the celebrated Maurice Duke of Saxony. After practicing for some years as a physician at Joachimstal in Bohemia, he was employed by Maurice as a superintendent of the silver mines of Chemnitz. He led a happy life among the miners, making various experiments in alchemy while deep in the bowels of the earth. 
he acquired a great knowledge of metals, and gradually got rid of his extravagant notions about the philosopher's stone. The miners had no faith in alchemy, and they converted him to their way of thinking, not only in that, but in other respects. From their legends he became firmly convinced that the bowels of the earth were inhabited by good and evil spirits, and that fire damp and other explosions sprang from no other causes than the mischievous propensities of the latter. He died in the year 1555, leaving behind him the reputation of a very able and intelligent man. End of chapter 4, part 5 Recorded by Daniele, October 2008Chapter 4, Part 6 of Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shanna in Washington, D.C. Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Volume 1, by Charles Mackay. The Alchemists, Part 6. Dennis the Care. Autobiography, written by a wise man who was once a fool, is not only the most instructive, but the most delightful of reading. Dennis the Care, an alchemist of the sixteenth century, has performed this task, and left a record of his folly and infatuation in pursuit of the philosopher's stone, which well repays perusal. He was born in the year 1510, of an ancient family in Guinea and was early sent to the university of bordeaux under the care of a tutor to direct his studies unfortunately his tutor was a searcher for the grand elixir and soon rendered his pupil as mad as himself upon the subject with this introduction we will allow denis lecaire to speak for himself and continue his narrative in his own words i received from home says he the sum of two hundred crowns for the expenses of myself and master but before the end of the year all our money went away in the smoke of our furnaces. My master at the same time died of a fever, brought on by the parching heat of our laboratory, from which he seldom or never stirred, and which was scarcely less hot than the arsenal of Venice. His death was the more unfortunate for me, as my parents took the opportunity of reducing my allowance and sending me only sufficient for my board and lodging, instead of the sum I required to continue my operations in alchemy. To meet this difficulty and get out of leading strings, I returned home at the age of twenty-five, and mortgaged part of my property for four hundred crowns. This sum was necessary to perform an operation of the science, which had been communicated to me by an Italian at Toulouse, and who, as he said, had proved its efficacy. I retained this man in my service, that we might see the end of the experiment. I then, by means of strong distillations, tried to calcinate gold and silver, but all my labor was in vain. The weight of the gold I drew out of my furnace was diminished by one half since I put it in, and my four hundred crowns were very soon reduced to two hundred and thirty. I gave twenty of these to my Italian, in order that he might travel to Milan, where the author of the receipt resided and asked him the explanation of some passages which we thought obscure. I remained at Toulouse all the winter, in the hope of his return, but I might have remained there till this day if I had waited for him, for I never saw his face again. In the succeeding summer there was a great plague which forced me to quit the town. I did not, however, lose sight of my work. I went to Cahors, where I remained six months, and made the acquaintance of an old man, who was commonly known to the people as the philosopher a name which in country places is often bestowed upon people whose only merit is that they are less ignorant than their neighbors i showed him my collection of alchemical receipts and asked his opinion upon them he picked out ten or twelve of them merely saying that they were better than the others when the plague ceased i returned to toulouse and recommenced my experiments in search of the stone I worked to such effect that my four hundred crowns were reduced to one hundred and seventy. 
that I might continue my work on a safer method, I made acquaintance in 1537 with a certain abbe who resided in the neighborhood. He was smitten with the same mania as myself, and told me that one of his friends, who had followed to Rome in the retinue of Cardinal d'Armagnac, had sent him from the city a new receipt which could not fail to transmute iron and copper, but which would cost two hundred crowns. I provided half this money, and the abbe the rest, and we began to operate at our joint expense. As we required spirits of wine for our experiments, I bought a ton of excellent vending and yuck, I extracted the spirit and rectified it several times. We took a quantity of this, into which we put four marks of silver and one of gold that had been undergoing the process of calcination for a month. We put this mixture cleverly into a sort of horn-shaped vessel with another to serve as a retort, and placed the whole apparatus upon our furnace to produce congelation. This experiment lasted a year, but, not to remain idle, we amused ourselves with many other less important operations. We drew quite as much profit from these as from our great work. The whole of the year 1537 passed over without producing any change whatever. In fact, we might have waited till doomsday for the congelation of our spirits of wine. However, we made a projection with it upon some heated quicksilver, but all was in vain. Judge of our chagrin, especially of that of the abbe, who had already boasted to all the monks of his monastery that they had only to bring the large pump which stood in a corner of the cloister, and he would convert it into gold. But this ill luck did not prevent us from persevering. I once more mortgaged my paternal lands for four hundred crowns, the whole of which I determined to devote to a renewal of my search for the great secret. The abbe contributed the same sum, and with these eight hundred crowns I proceeded to Paris, a city more abounding with alchemists than any other in the world, resolved never to leave it until I had either found the philosopher's stone or spent all my money. This journey gave the greatest offense to all my relations and friends, who, imagining that I was fitted to be a great lawyer, were anxious that I should establish myself in that profession. For the sake of quietness I pretended at last that such was my object. After travelling for fifteen days, I arrived in Paris on the ninth of January, 1539. I remained for a month almost unknown, but I had no sooner begun to frequent the amateur of the science, and visited the shops of the furnace-makers, than I had the acquaintance of more than a hundred operative alchemists, each of whom had a different theory and a different mode of working. Some of them preferred cementation, others sought the universal alkahest or dissolvent, and some of them boasted the great efficacy of the essence of emery. Some of them endeavored to extract mercury from other metals, to fix it afterwards, and, in order that each of us should be thoroughly acquainted with the proceedings of the others, we agreed to meet somewhere every night and report progress. We met sometimes at the house of one, and sometimes in the garret of another, not only on weekdays, but on Sundays and the great festivals of the church. Ah, one used to say, if I had the means of recommencing this experiment, I should do something. Yes, said another, if my crucible had not cracked, I should have succeeded before now. While a third exclaimed, with a sigh, If I had but a round copper vessel of sufficient strength, I would have fixed mercury with silver. There was not one among them who had not some excuse for his failure. But I was deaf to all their speeches. I did not want to part with my money to any of them, remembering how often I had been the dupe of such promises. A Greek at last presented himself, and with him I worked a long time uselessly upon nails made of cinnabar or vermilion. I was also acquainted with a foreign gentleman newly arrived in Paris, and often accompanied him to the shops of the goldsmiths to sell pieces of gold and silver, the produce, as he said, of his experiments. I stuck closely to him for a long time, in the hope that he would impart his secret. He refused for a long time, but acceded at last on my earnest entreaty, and I found that it was nothing more than an ingenious trick. I did not fail to inform my friend the abbe, whom I had left at Toulouse, of all of my adventures, and sent him, among other matters, a relation of the trick by which this gentleman pretended to turn lead into gold. The abbe still imagined that I should succeed at last, and advised me to remain another year in Paris, where I had made so good a beginning. I remained there three years. 
but notwithstanding all my efforts i had no more success than i had had elsewhere i had just got to the end of my money when i received a letter from the abbe telling me to leave everything and join him immediately at toulouse i went accordingly and found that he had received letters from the king in Navarre, grandfather of henry the fourth this prince was a great lover of philosophy full of curiosity and had written to the abbe that i should visit him at pau and that he would give me three or four thousand crowns if i would communicate the secret i had learned from the foreign gentleman the abbe's ears were so tickled with the four thousand crowns that he let me have no peace night or day until he had fairly seen me on the road to pau i arrived at that place in the month of may one thousand five hundred and forty two i worked away and succeeded according to the receipt i had obtained when i had finished to the satisfaction of the king he gave me the reward that i expected although he was willing enough to do me further service he was dissuaded from it by the lords of his court even by many of those who had been most anxious that i should come he sent me then about my business with many thanks saying that if there was anything in his kingdom which he could give me such as the produce of confiscations or the like he should be most happy i thought i might stay long enough for these prospective confiscations and never get them at last and i therefore determined to go back to my friend the abbe i learned that on the road between pau and toulouse there resided a monk who was very skilful in all matters of natural philosophy on my return i paid him a visit he pitied me very much and advised me with much warmth and kindness of expression not to amuse myself any longer with such experiments as these which were all false and sophistical but that i should read the good books of the old philosophers where i might not only find the true matter of the science of alchemy but learn also the exact order of operations which ought to be followed i very much approved of this wise advice but before i acted upon it i went back to the abbe of toulouse to give him ale account of the eight hundred crowns which we had had in common and at the same time share with him such reward as i had received from the king of navarre if he was little satisfied with the relation of my adventures since our first separation he appeared still less satisfied when i told him i had formed a resolution to renounce the search for the philosopher's stone the reason was that he thought me a good artist for our eight hundred crowns there remained but one hundred and seventy-six when i quitted the abbe i went to my own house with the intention of remaining there till i had read all the old philosophers and of them proceeding to paris i arrived in paris on the day after all saints of the year one thousand five hundred and forty-six and devoted another year to the assiduous study of great authors among others the turbo philosophorum of the good trevisan the remonstrance of nature to the wandering alchemist by jean de mont and several other of the best books but as i had no right principles i did not well know what course to follow at last i left my solitude not to see my formal acquaintance the adepts and operators but to frequent the society of true philosophers among them i fell into still greater uncertainties being in fact completely bewildered by the variety of operations which they showed me spurred on nevertheless by a sort of frenzy or inspiration i threw myself into the works of raymond lully and of arnold de villeneuve the reading of these and the reflections i made upon them occupied me for another year when i finally determined on the course i should adopt i was obliged to wait however until i had mortgaged another very considerable portion of my patrimony this business was not settled until the beginning of lent one thousand five hundred and forty nine when i commenced my operations i laid in a stock of all that was necessary and began to work the day after easter it was not however without some disquietude and opposition from my friends who came about me one asking me what i was going to do and whether i had not already spent money enough upon such follies another assured me that if i bought so much charcoal i should strengthen the suspicion already existing that i was a coiner of base money another advised me to purchase some place in the magistracy, as i was already a doctor of laws my relations spoke in terms still more annoying to me and even threatened that if i continued to make such a fool of myself 
they would send a posse of police officers into my house and break all of my furnaces and crucibles into atoms. I was wearied almost to death with this continued persecution, but I found comfort in my work and in the progress of my experiment, to which I was very attentive and which went on bravely from day to day. About this time there was a dreadful plague in Paris which interrupted all intercourse between man and man, and left me as much to myself as I could desire. I soon had the satisfaction to remark the progress in succession of the three colors which, according to the philosophers, always prognosticate the approaching perfection of the work. I observed them distinctly one after the other. The next year, being Easter Sunday, 1550, I made the great trial. Some common quicksilver, which I put into a small crucible on the fire, was, in less than an hour, converted into very good gold. You may judge how great was my joy, but I took care not to boast of it. I returned thanks to God for the favor he had shown me, and prayed that I might only be permitted to make such use of it as would redound to his glory. On the following day I went towards Toulouse to find the abbe, in accordance with a mutual promise, that we should communicate our discoveries to each other. On my way I called in to see the sage monk who had assisted me with his counsels, but I had the sorrow to learn that they were both dead. After this I would not return to my own home, but retired to another place, to await one of my relations, whom I had left in charge of my estate. I gave him orders to sell all that belonged to me, as well as movable as immovable, to pay my debts with the proceeds, and divide all the rest among those in any way related to me who might stand in need of it in order that they might enjoy some share of the good fortune which had befallen me. There was a great deal of talk in the neighborhood about my precipitate retreat, the wisest of my acquaintance imagining that, broken down and ruined by my mad expenses, I sold my little remaining property that I might go and hide my shame in distant countries. My relative already spoken of rejoined me on the 1st of July, after having performed all the business I had entrusted him with we took our departure together to see a land of liberty. We first retired to Lausanne in Switzerland, when, after remaining there for some time, we resolved to pass the remainder of our days in some of the most celebrated cities of Germany, living quietly and without splendor. Thus ends the story of Denis Zacare, as written by himself. He was not been so candid at its conclusion as at its commencement, and has left the world in doubt as to his real motives for pretending that he had discovered the philosopher's stone it seems probable that the sentence he puts into the mouths of his wisest acquaintances was the true reason of his retreat that he was in fact reduced to poverty and hid his shame in foreign countries nothing further is known of his life and his real name has never yet been discovered he wrote a work on alchemy entitled the true natural philosophy of metals. End of chapter four, part six. Recording by Jeanne in Washington, D.C. Chapter four, part seven of Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Morgan Scorpion. Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Volume 1, by Charles Mackay. The Alchemists, Part 7. Dr. D. and Edward Kelly. John D. and Edward Kelly claim to be mentioned together, having been so long associated in the same pursuits, and undergone so many strange vicissitudes in each other's society. D. was altogether a wonderful man, and had he lived in an age when folly and superstition were less rife, he would, with the same powers which he enjoyed, have left behind him a bright and enduring reputation. He was born in London in the year 1527, and very early manifested a love for study. At the age of fifteen he was sent to Cambridge, and delighted so much in his books that he passed regularly eighteen hours every day among them. Of the other six he devoted four to sleep and two for refreshment. 
Such intense application did not injure his health, and could not fail to make him one of the first scholars of his time. Unfortunately, however, he quitted the mathematics and the pursuit of true philosophy, to indulge in the unprofitable reveries of the occult sciences. He studied alchemy, astrology, and magic, and thereby rendered himself obnoxious to the authorities at Cambridge. To avoid persecution, he was at last obliged to retire to the University of Louvain, the rumours of sorcery that were current respecting him rendering his longer stay in England not altogether without danger. He found at Louvain many kindred spirits who had known Cornelius Agrippa while he resided among them, and by whom he was constantly entertained with the wondrous deeds of that great master of the Hermetic Mysteries. From their conversations he received much encouragement to continue the search for the Philosopher's Stone, which soon began to occupy nearly all his thoughts. He did not long remain on the continent, but returned to England in 1551, being at that time in the twenty-fourth year of his age. By the influence of his friend Sir John Cheek, he was kindly received at the court of King Edward the Sixth, and rewarded, it is difficult to say for what, with a pension of one hundred crowns. He continued for several years to practice in London as an astrologer, casting nativities, telling fortunes, and pointing out lucky and unlucky days. During the reign of Queen Mary he got into trouble, being suspected of heresy, and charged with attempting Mary's life by means of enchantments. He was tried for the latter offence and acquitted, but was retained in prison on the former charge and left to the tender mercies of Bishop Bonner. He had a very narrow escape from being burned in Smithfield, but he somehow or other contrived to persuade that fierce bigot that his orthodoxy was unimpeachable, and was set at liberty in 1555. On the accession of Elizabeth a brighter day dawned upon him. During her retirement at Woodstock, her servants appeared to have consulted him as to the time of Mary's death, which circumstance no doubt first gave rise to the serious charge for which he was brought to trial. They now came to consult him more openly as to the fortunes of their mistress, and Robert Dudley, the celebrated Earl of Leicester, was sent by command of the Queen herself to know the most auspicious day for her coronation. So great was the favour he enjoyed that some years afterwards Elizabeth condescended to pay him a visit at his house in Mortlake to view his museum of curiosities, and when he was ill sent her own physician to attend upon him. Astrology was the means whereby he lived, and he continued to practice it with great assiduity. But his heart was in alchemy. The philosopher's stone and the elixir of life haunted his daily thoughts and his nightly dreams. The Talmudic mysteries, which he had also deeply studied, impressed him with the belief that he might hold converse with spirits and angels, and learn from them all the mysteries of the universe. Holding the same idea as the then obscure sect of the Rosicrucians, some of whom he had perhaps encountered in his travels in Germany, he imagined that, by means of the Philosopher's Stone, he could summon these kindly spirits at his will. By dint of continually brooding upon the subject, his imagination became so diseased that he at last persuaded him that an angel appeared to him, and promised to be his friend and companion as long as he lived. He relates that, one day in November 1582, while he was engaged in fervent prayer, the window of his museum looking towards the west suddenly glowed with a dazzling light, in the midst of which, in all his glory, stood the great angel Uriel. Awe and wonder rendered him speechless, but the angel smiling graciously upon him gave him a crystal of a convex form, and told him that whenever he wished to hold converse with the beings of another sphere, he had only to gaze intently upon it, and they would appear in the crystal, and unveil to him all the secrets of futurity. Note 41. The crystal alluded to appears to have been a black stone or a piece of polished coal. The following account of it is given in the supplement to Granger's biographical history. The black stone into which Dee used to call his spirits was in the collection of the Earls of Peterborough, from whence it came to Lady Elizabeth Germain. It was next the property of the late Duke of Argyle, and is now Mr. Walpole's. It appears upon examination to be nothing more than a polished piece of cannel coal, but this is what Butler means when he says, Kelly did all his feats upon the devil's looking-glass, a stone. Thus saying, the angel disappeared. Dee found from experience of the crystal that it was necessary that all the faculties of the soul should be concentrated upon it, otherwise the spirits did not appear. 
he found that he could never recollect the conversations he had with the angels. He therefore determined to communicate the secret to another person who might converse with the spirit while he, D, sat in another part of the room, and took down in writing the revelations which they made. He had at this time in his service as his assistant one Edward Kelly, who like himself was crazy upon the subject of the philosopher's stone. There was this difference, however, between them, that while Dee was more of an enthusiast than an impostor, Kelly was more of an impostor than an enthusiast. In early life he was a notary, and had the misfortune to lose both his ears for forgery. This mutilation, degrading enough in any man, was destructive to a philosopher. Kelly, therefore, lest his wisdom should suffer in the world's opinion, wore a black skull-cap, which fitting close to his head and descending over both his cheeks, not only concealed his loss, but gave him a very solemn and oracular appearance. So well did he keep his secret that even Dee, with whom he lived so many years, appears never to have discovered it. Kelly, with this character, was just the man to carry on any piece of roguery for his own advantage, or to nurture the delusions of his master for the same purpose. No sooner did Dee inform him of the visit he had received from the glorious Uriel, than Kelly expressed such a fervour of belief that Dee's heart glowed with delight. He set about consulting his crystal forthwith, and on the 2nd of December, 1581, the spirits appeared, and held a very extraordinary discourse with Kelly, which Dee took down in writing. The curious reader may see this farrago of nonsense among the Harleian manuscripts in the British Museum. The later consultations were published in a folio volume, in 1659, by Dr. Merrick Cosabon, under the title of a true and faithful relation of what passed between Dr. John Dee and some spirits, tending, had it succeeded, to a general alteration of most states and kingdoms in the world. Note 42. Lily the astrologer, in his life, written by himself, frequently tells of prophecies delivered by the angels in a manner similar to the angels of Dr. Dee. He says, the prophecies were not given vocally by the angels, but by inspection of the crystal in types and figures, or by apparition the circular way, where, at some distance, the angels appear, representing by forms, shapes, and creatures what is demanded. It is very rare, yea, even in our days, quoth that Weisaker, for any operator or master to hear the angels speak articulately, for when they do speak, it is like the Irish, much in the throat. The fame of these wondrous colloquies soon spread over the country, and even reached the continent. Dee, at the same time, pretended to be in possession of the elixir vitae, which he stated he had found among the ruins of Glastonbury Abbey in Somersetshire. People flocked from far and near to his house at Mortlake to have their nativities cast, in preference to visiting astrologers of less renown. They also longed to see a man who, according to his own account, would never die. Altogether he carried on a very profitable trade, but spent so much in drugs and metals to work out some peculiar process of the transmutation, that he never became rich. About this time there came into England a wealthy Polish nobleman, named Albert Lasky, Count Palatine of Suratz. His object was principally, he said, to visit the court of Queen Elizabeth, the fame of whose glory and magnificence had reached him in distant Poland. Elizabeth received this flattering stranger with the most splendid hospitality, and appointed her favourite Leicester to show him all that was worth seeing in England. He visited all the curiosities of London and Westminster, and from thence proceeded to Oxford and Cambridge, that he might converse with some of the great scholars whose writings shed lustre upon the land of their birth. He was very much disappointed at not finding Dr. Dee among them, and told the Earl of Leicester that he would not have gone to Oxford if he had known that Dee was not there. The Earl promised to introduce him to the great alchemist on their return to London, and the Pole was satisfied. A few days afterwards, the Earl and Lasky, being in the antechamber of the Queen, awaiting an audience of Her Majesty, Dr. D. arrived on the same errand, and was introduced to the Pole. Note 43. Albert Lasky, son of Yaroslav, was Palatine of Suratz and afterwards of Sendomir, and chiefly contributed to the election of Henry of Valois, the third of France, to the throne of Poland, and was one of the delegates who went to France in order to announce to the new monarch his elevation to the sovereignty of Poland. After the deposition of Henry, Albert Lasky voted for Maximilian of Austria. 
In 1583 he visited England, where Queen Elizabeth received him with great distinction. The honours which were shown him during his visit to Oxford, by the especial command of the Queen, were equal to those rendered to sovereign princes. His extraordinary prodigality rendered his enormous wealth insufficient to def defray his expenses, and he therefore became a zealous adept in alchemy, and took from England to Poland with him two known alchemists. Count Valerian Krasinski's historical sketch of the Reformation in Poland. An interesting conversation ensued, which ended by the stranger inviting himself to dine with the astrologer at his house at Mortlake. D. returned home in some tribulation, for he found he had not money enough, without pawning his plate, to entertain Count Lasky and his retinue in a manner becoming their dignity. In this emergency he sent off an express to the Earl of Leicester, stating frankly the embarrassment that he laboured under, and praying his good offices in representing the matter to Her Majesty. Elizabeth immediately sent him a present of twenty pounds. On the appointed day Count Lasky came, attended by a numerous retinue, and expressed such open and warm admiration of the wonderful attainments of the host, that Dee turned over in his own mind how he could bind irretrievably to his interests a man who seemed so well inclined to become his friend. Long acquaintance with Kelly had imbued him with all the roguery of that personage, and he resolved to make the Pole pay dearly for his dinner. He found out before many days that he possessed great estates in his own country, as well as great influence, but that an extravagant disposition had reduced him to temporary embarrassment. He also discovered that he was a firm believer in the philosopher's stone and the water of life. He was therefore just the man upon whom an adventurer might fasten himself. Kelly thought so too, and both of them set to work to weave a web, in the, in the meshes of which they might firmly entangle the rich and credulous stranger. They went very cautiously about it, first throwing out obscure hints of the stone and the elixir, and finally of the spirits, by means of whom they could turn over the pages of the book of futurity, and read the awful secrets inscribed therein. Lasky eagerly implored that he might be admitted to one of their mysterious interviews with Uriel and the angels, but they knew human nature too well to accede at once to the request. To the Count's entreaties they only replied by hints of the difficulty or impropriety of summoning the spirits in the presence of a stranger, or of one who might perchance have no other motive than the gratification of a vain curiosity. But they only meant to whet the edge of his appetite by this delay, and would have been very sorry indeed if the Count had been discouraged. To show how exclusively the thoughts of both Dee and Kelly were fixed upon their dupe at this time, it is only necessary to read the introduction to their first interview with the spirits, related in the volume of Dr. Cosabon. The entry made by D. under the date of the 25th of May, 1583, says, that when the spirit appeared to them, I, John D., and E. K., Edward Kelly, sat together conversing of that noble Polonian, Albertus Lasky, his great honour here with us obtained, and his great liking among all sorts of the people. No doubt they were discussing how they might make the most of the noble Polonian, and concocting the fine story with which they afterwards excited his curiosity, and drew him firmly within their toils. Suddenly, said Dee, as they were thus employed, there seemed to come out of the oratory a spiritual creature, like a pretty girl of seven or nine years of age, attired on her head, with her hair rolled up before and hanging down behind, with a gown of silk, of changeable red and green, and with a train. She seemed to play up and down, and seemed to go in and out behind the books, and she seemed to go between them. The books displaced themselves, and made way for her. With such tales as these, they lured on the pole from day to day, and at last persuaded him to be a witness of their mysteries. Whether they played any optical delusions upon him, or whether by the force of a strong imagination he deluded himself, does not appear, but it's certain it is that he became a complete tool in their hands and consented to do whatever they wished. Kelly, at these interviews, placed himself at a certain distance from the wondrous crystal, and gazed intently upon it, while Dee took his place in a corner, ready to set down the prophecies as they were uttered by the spirits. In this manner they prophesied to the Pole that he should become the fortunate possessor of the Philosopher's Stone, that he should live for centuries, and be chosen King of Poland, in which capacity he should gain many great victories over the Saracens, and make his name illustrious over the earth. For this purpose it was necessary, however, that Lasky should leave England, and take, with, and take them with him, together with their wives and families. 
that he should treat them all sumptuously, and allow them to want for nothing. Lasky at once consented, and very shortly afterwards they were all on the road to Poland. It took them upwards of four months to reach the Count's estates in the neighbourhood of Krakow. In the meantime they led a pleasant life, and spent money with an unsparing hand. When once established in the Count's palace, they commenced the great hermetic op operation of transmuting iron into gold. Lasky provided them with all necessary materials, and aided them himself with his knowledge of alchemy. But somehow or other, the experiment always failed at the very moment it ought to have succeeded, and they were obliged to recommence operations on a grander scale. But the hopes of Lasky were not easily extinguished. Already, in idea, the possessor of countless millions, he was not to be cast down from, for fear of present expenses. He thus continued from day to day, and from month to month, till he was at last obliged to sell a portion of his deeply mortgaged estates to find ailment for the hungry crucibles of Dee and Kelly, and the no less hungry stomachs of their wives and families. It was not till ruin stared him in the face that he awoke from his dream of infatuation, too happy even then to find that he had escaped utter beggary. Thus restored to his senses, his first thought was how to rid himself of his, of his expensive visitors. Not wishing to quarrel with them, he proposed that they should proceed to Prague, well furnished with letters of recommendation to the Emperor Rudolf. Our alchemists too plainly saw that nothing more was to be made of the almost destitute Count Lasky. Without hesitation, therefore, they accepted the proposal, and set out forthwith to the imperial residence. They had no difficulty on their arrival at Prague in obtaining an audience of the Emperor. They found him willing enough to believe that such a thing as the Philosopher's Stone existed, and flattered themselves that they had made a favourable impression upon him. But for some cause or other, perhaps the look of low cunning and quackery upon the face of Kelly, the Emperor conceived no very high opinion of their abilities. He allowed them, however, to remain for some months at Prague, feeding themselves upon the hope that he would employ them. But the more he saw of them, the less he liked them, and when the Pope's nuncio represented to him that he ought not to countenance such heretic magicians, he gave orders that they should quit his dominions within four and twenty hours. It was fortunate for them that so little time was given them, for, had they remained six hours longer, the nuncio had received orders to procure a perpetual dungeon or the stake for them. Not knowing well whether to direct their steps, they resolved to return to Krakow, where they had still a few friends. But by this time the funds they had drawn from Lasky were almost exhausted, and they were many days obliged to go dinnerless and supperless. They had great difficulty to keep their poverty a secret from the world, but they managed to bear privation without murmuring, from a conviction that if the fact were known it would militate very much against their pretensions. Nobody would believe that they were possessors of the Philosopher's Stone if it were once suspected that they did not know how to procure bread for their subsistence. They still gained a little by casting nativities, and kept starvation at arm's length, till a new dupe, rich enough for their purposes, dropped into their toils in the shape of a royal personage. Having procured an introduction to Stephen, King of Poland, they predicted to him that the Emperor Rudolf would shortly be assassinated, and that the Germans would look to Poland for his successor. As this prediction was not precise enough to satisfy the king, they tried their crystal again, and a spirit appeared who told them that the new sovereign of Germany would be Stephen of Poland. Stephen was credulous enough to believe them, and was once present when Kelly held his mystic conversations with the shadows of his crystal. He also appeared to have furnished them with money to carry on their experiments in alchemy, but he grew tired at last of their broken promises and their constant drains upon his pocket, and was on the point of discarding them with disgrace, when they met another dupe, to whom they eagerly transferred their services. This was Count Rosenberg, a nobleman of large estates at Trebona in Bohemia. So comfortable did they find themselves in the palace of this munificent patron, that they remained nearly four years with him, fearing sumptuously, and having an almost unlimited command of his money. The Count was more ambitious than avaricious. He had wealth enough, and did not care for the Philosopher's Stone on account of the gold, but of the length of days it would bring him. They had their predictions accordingly, already framed to suit his character. They prophesied that he should be chosen King of Poland, and promised, moreover, that he should live for five hundred years to enjoy his dignity, provided always that he found them sufficient money to carry on their experiments. But now, 
while fortune smiled upon them, while they revelled in the rewards of successful villainy, retributive justice came upon them in a shape they had not anticipated. Jealousy and mistrust sprang up between the two confederates, and led to such violent and frequent quarrels that Dee was in constant fear of exposure. Kelly imagined himself a much greater personage than Dee, measuring most likely by the standard of impudent roguery, and was displeased that on all occasions and from all persons Dee received the greater share of honour and consideration. He often threatened to leave Dee to shift for himself, and the latter, who had degenerated into the mere tool of his more daring associate, was distressed beyond measure at the prospect of his desertion. His mind was so deeply imbued with superstition that he believed the rhapsodies of Kelly to be in no great measure derived from his intercourse with angels, and he knew not where in the whole world to look for a man of depth and wisdom enough to succeed him. As their quarrels every day became more and more frequent, Dee wrote letters to Queen Elizabeth to secure a favourable reception on his return to England, whither he intended to proceed if Kelly forsook him. He also sent her a round piece of silver which he pretended he had made of a portion of brass cut out of a warming-pan. He afterwards sent her the warming-pan also that she might convince herself that the piece of silver corresponded exactly with the hole which was cut into the brass. While thus preparing for the worst, his chief desire was to remain in Bohemia with Count Rosenberg, who treated him well, and reposed much confidence in him. Neither had Kelly any great objection to remain, but a new passion had taken possession of his breast, and he was laying deep schemes to gratify it. His own wife was ill-favoured and ill-natured. Dee's was comely and agreeable, and he longed to make an exchange of partners without exciting the jealousy or, or shocking the morality of Dee. This was a difficult matter, but to a man like Kelly, who was as deficient in rectitude and right feeling as he was of impudence and ingenuity, the difficulty was not insurmountable. He had also deeply studied the character and the foibles of Dee, and he took his measure accordingly. The next time they consulted the spirits, Kelly pretended to be shocked at their language, and refused to tell Dee what they had said. Dee insisted, and was informed that they were henceforth to have their wives in common. Dee, a little startled, inquired whether the spirits might not mean that they were to live in common harmony and good will. Kelly tried again, with apparent reluctance, and said these spirits insisted upon a literal interpretation. The poor fanatic Dee resigned himself to their will, but it suited Kelly's purpose to appear coy a little longer. He declared that the spirits must be spirits not of good but of evil, and refused to consult them any more. He thereupon took his departure, saying he would never return. Dee, thus left to himself, was in sore trouble and distress of mind. He knew not on whom to fix as the successor to Kelly for consulting the spirits, but at last chose his son Arthur, a boy of eight years of age. He consecrated him to this service with great ceremony, and impressed upon the child's mind the dignified and awful nature of the duties he was called upon to perform. But the poor boy had neither the imagination, the faith, nor the artifice of Kelly. He looked intently upon the crystal, as he was told, but he could see nothing and hear nothing. At last, when his eyes ached, he said he could see a vague indistinct shadow, but nothing more. Dee was in despair. The deception had been carried on so long that he was never so happy as when he fancied he was holding converse with superior beings, and he cursed the day that had put estrangement between him and his dear friend Kelly. This was exactly what Kelly had foreseen, and when he thought the doctor had grieved sufficiently for his absence, he returned unexpectedly and entered the room where the little Arthur was in vain endeavouring to distinguish something in the crystal. Dee, in entering this circumstance in his journal, ascribes this sudden return to a miraculous fortune and a divine fate, and goes on to record that Kelly immediately saw the spirits which had re remained invisible to little Arthur. One of these spirits reiterated the previous command, that they should have their wives in common. Kelly bowed his head and submitted, and Dee, in all humility, consented to the arrangement. This was the extreme depth of the wretched man's degradation. In this manner they continued to live for three or four months, when, new quarrels breaking out, they separated once more. This time their separation was final. Kelly, taking the elixir which he had found in Glastonbury Abbey, proceeded to Prague, forgetful of the abrupt mode in which he had previously been expelled from that city. Almost immediately after his arrival he was seized by the order of the Emperor Rudolf and thrown into prison. 
he was released after some months' confinement, and continued for five years to lead a vagabond life in Germany, telling fortunes at one place and pretending to make gold at another. He was a second time thrown into prison on a charge of heresy and sorcery, and he then resolved, if he ever obtained his liberty, to return to England. He soon discovered that there was no prospect of this, and that his imprisonment was likely to be for life. He twisted his bedclothes into a rope one stormy night in February 1595, and let himself down from the window of his dungeon, situated at the top of a very high tower. Being a corpulent man, the rope gave way, and he was precipitated to the ground. He broke two of his ribs and both his legs, and was otherwise so much injured that he expired a few days afterwards. D for a while had more prosperous fortune. The warming pan he had sent to Queen Elizabeth was not without effect. He was rewarded soon after Kelly had left him with an invitation to return to England. His pride, which had been sorely humbled, sprung up again to its pristine dimensions, and he set out from Bohemia with a train of attendants becoming an ambassador. How he procured the money does not appear, unless from the liberality of the rich Bohemian Rosenberg, or perhaps from his plunder. He travelled with three coaches for himself and his family, and three wagons to carry his baggage. Each coach had four horses, and the whole train was protected by a guard of four-and-twenty soldiers. This statement may be doubted, but it is on the authority of Dee himself, who made it on oath before the commissioners appointed by Elizabeth to inquire into his circumstances. On his arrival in England he had an audience of the Queen, who received him kindly as far as words went, and gave orders that he should not be molested in his pursuits of chemistry and philosophy. A man who boasted of the power to turn baser metals into gold could not, thought Elizabeth, be in want of money, and she therefore gave him no more substantial marks of her approbation than her countenance and protection. Thrown thus unexpectedly upon his own resources, Dee began in earnest to search for the philosopher's stone. He worked incessantly amongst his furnaces, retorts, and crucibles, and almost poisoned himself with the deleterious fumes. He also consulted his miraculous crystal, but the spirits appeared not to him. He tried one Bartholomew to supply the, pa the place of the invaluable Kelly, but he being a man of some little probity, and of no imagination at all, the spirits would not hold any communication with him. Dee then tried another pretender to philosophy, of the name of Hickman, but had no better fortune. The crystal had lost its power since the departure of its great high priest. From this quarter, then, Dee could get no information on the stone or elixir of the alchemists, and all his efforts to discover them by other means were not only fruitless but expensive. He was soon reduced to great distress, and wrote piteous letters to the Queen praying relief. He represented that after he left England with Count Lasky, the mob had pillaged his house at Mortlake, accusing him of being a necromancer and a wizard, and had broken all his furniture, burned his library, consisting of four thousand rare volumes, and destroyed all the philosophical instruments and curiosities in his museum. For this damage he claimed compensation, and furthermore stated that as he had come to England by the Queen's command, she ought to pay the expenses of his journey. Elizabeth sent him small sums of money at various times, but D, still continuing his complaints, a commission was appointed to inquire into his circumstances. He finally obtained a small appointment as Chancellor of St. Paul's Cathedral, which he exchanged in 1595, for the wardship of the college at Manchester. He remained in this capacity to 1602 or 1603, when his strength and intellect beginning to fail him, he was compelled to resign. He retired to his old dwelling at Mortlake, in a state not far removed from actual want, supporting himself as a common fortune-teller, and being often obliged to sell or pawn his books to procure a dinner. James I was often applied to on his behalf, but he refused to do anything for him. It may be said to the discredit of the king that the only reward he would grant the indefatigable Stowe in his days of old age and want was the royal permission to beg. But no one will blame him for neglecting such a quack as John Dee. He died in 1608, in the eighty-first year of his age, and was buried at Mortlake. End of chapter 4, part 7《Chapter Four, Part Eight of Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Volume One. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Volume 1, by Charles McKay. The Alchemists, Part 8. The Cosmopolitan. Many disputes have arisen as to the real name of the alchemist who wrote several works under the above designation. The general opinion is that he was a Scotsman named Sutton, and that by a fate very common to alchemists who boasted too proudly of their powers of transmutation, he ended his days miserably in a dungeon, into which he was thrown by a German potentate, until he made a million of gold to pay his ransom. By some he has been confounded with Michael Sendivog, or Sendivogius, a Pole, a professor of the same art, who made a great noise in Europe at the commencement of the seventeenth century. Lenglet du Fresnoy, who is in general well informed with respect to the alchemists, inclines to the belief that these personages were distinct, and gives the following particulars of the cosmopolite, extracted from George Morhoff in his Epistola ad Langolorum and other writers. About the year 1600, one Jacob Hassan, a Dutch pilot, was shipwrecked on the coast of Scotland. A gentleman named Alexander Seaton put off in a boat and saved him from drowning, and afterwards entertained him hospitably for many weeks at his house on the shore. Hausen saw that he was addicted to the pursuits of chemistry, but no conversation on the subject passed between them at the time. About a year and a half afterwards, Hausen, being then at home at Enkhuysen in Holland, received a visit from his former host. He endeavored to repay the kindness that had been shown him, and so great a friendship arose between them that Sutton, on his departure, offered to make him acquainted with the great secret of the philosopher's stone. In his presence the Scotsman transmuted a great quantity of base metal into pure gold, and gave it him as a mark of his esteem. Sutton then took leave of his friend and travelled into Germany. At Dresden he made no secret of his wonderful powers, having, it is said, performed transmutation successfully before a great assemblage of the learned men of that city. The circumstance coming to the ears of the Duke or Elector of Saxony, he gave orders for the arrest of the alchemist. He caused him to be imprisoned in a high tower, and set a guard of forty men to watch that he did not escape, and that no strangers were admitted to his presence. The unfortunate Seton received several visits from the elector, who used every art of persuasion to make him divulge his secret. Seton obstinately refused either to communicate his secret, or to make any gold for the tyrant, on which he was stretched upon the rack to see if the argument of torture would render him more tractable. The result was still the same. Neither hope or reward, nor fear of anguish, could shake him. For several months he remained in prison, subjected alternately to a sedate and violent regimen, till his health broke, and he wasted away almost to a skeleton. There happened at that time to be in Dresden a learned Pole, named Michael Sendivogius, who had wasted a good deal of his time and substance in the unprofitable pursuits of alchemy. He was touched with pity for the hard fate, and admiration for the intrepidity of Sutton, and determined, if possible, to aid him in escaping from the clutch of his oppressor. He requested the elector's permission to see the alchemist, and obtained it with some difficulty. He found him in a state of great wretchedness, shut up from the light of day in a noisome dungeon, and with no better couch or fare than those allotted to the worst of criminals. Sutton listened eagerly to the proposal of escape, and promised the generous Pole that he would make him richer than an eastern monarch, if by his means he were liberated. Sendivogius immediately commenced operations. He sold some property which he possessed near Krakow, and with the proceeds led a merry life in Dresden. He gave the most elegant suppers, to which he regularly invited the officers of the guard, and especially those who did duty at the prison of the alchemist. He insinuated himself at last into their confidence, and obtained free ingress to his friend as often as he pleased. Pretending that he was using his utmost endeavors to conquer his obstinacy and worm his secret out of him. When their project was ripe, a day was fixed upon for the grand attempt, 
and Sendivogius was ready with a post-chariot to convey him with all speed into Poland. By drugging some wine which he presented to the guards of the prison, he rendered them so drowsy that he easily found means to scale a wall unobserved, with Sutton, and effect his escape. Sutton's wife was in a chariot waiting him, having safely in her possession a small packet of a black powder, which was, in fact, the philosopher's stone, or ingredient for the transmutation of iron and copper into gold. They all arrived in safety at Krakow, but the fame of Sutton was so wasted by torture of body and starvation, to say nothing of the anguish of mind he had endured, that he did not long survive. He died in Krakow in 1603, or 1604, and was buried under the cathedral church of that city. Such is the story related of the author of the various works which bear the name of the Cosmopolite. A list of them may be found in the third volume of the History of the Hermetic Philosophy. Sendivogius On the death of Sutton, Sendivogius married his widow, hoping to learn from her some of the secrets of her deceased lord in the art of transmutation. The ounce of black powder stood him, however, in better service, for the alchemists say that by its means he converted great quantities of quicksilver into the purest gold. It is also said that he performed this experiment successfully before the Emperor Rudolf II at Prague, and that the Emperor, to commemorate the circumstance, caused a marble tablet to be affixed to the wall of the room in which it was performed, bearing this inscription, Facia hoc quispium alius, quod fecit sendivogius polonus, M. Dresnoers, secretary to the Princess Mary of Gonzaga, Queen of Poland, writing from Warsaw in 1651, says that he saw this tablet, which existed at that time, and was often visited by the curious. The afterlife of Sendivogius is related in a Latin memoir of him by one Berdowski, his steward, and is inserted by Pierre Borel in his Treasure of Gaulish Antiquities. The Emperor Rudolf, according to this authority, was so well pleased with his success that he made him one of his counselors of state, and invited him to fill a station in the royal household and inhabit the palace. But Sendivogius loved his liberty, and refused to become a courtier. He preferred to reside on his own patrimonial estate of Gravarna, where, for many years, he exercised the princely hospitality. His philosophic powder, which, his steward says, was red and not black, he kept in a little box of gold, and with one grain of it he could make five hundred ducats, or a thousand rix dollars. He generally made his projection upon quicksilver. When he traveled, he gave this box to his steward, who hung it round his neck by a gold chain next to his skin. But the greatest part of the powder he used to hide in a secret place cut into the step of his chariot. He thought that, if attacked at any time by robbers, they would not search such a place as that. When he anticipated any danger, he would dress himself in his valet's clothes, and, mounting the coach-box, put the valet inside. He was induced to take these precautions, because it was no secret that he possessed the philosopher's stone, and many unprincipled adventurers were on the watch for an opportunity to plunder him. A German prince, whose name Bordowski had not thought to fit to chronicle, served him a scurvy trick, which ever afterwards put him on his guard. This prince went on his knees to Sendivogius, and entreated him in the most pressing terms to satisfy his curiosity, by converting some quicksilver into gold before him. Sendivogius, wearied by his importunity, consented upon a promise of inviolable secrecy. After his departure, the prince called a German alchemist named Mulefens, who resided in his house, and told him all that had been done. Mulefels entreated that he might have a dozen mounted horsemen at his command, that he might instantly ride after the philosopher, and either rob him of all his powder, or force from him the secret of making it. The prince desired nothing better. Mulefels, being provided with twelve men, well mounted and armed, pursued Sendivogius in hot haste. He came up with him at a lonely inn by the roadside, just as he was sitting down to dinner. 
He at first endeavored to persuade him to divulge his secret, but finding this of no avail, he caused his accomplices to strip the unfortunate Sendivogius, and tie him naked to one of the pillars of the house. He then took from him his golden box, containing a small quantity of the powder, a manuscript book on the philosopher's stone, a golden medal with its chain presented to him by the Emperor Rudolph, and the rich cap ornamented with diamonds of the value of one hundred thousand rix dollars. With this booty he decamped, leaving Sendivogia still naked and firmly bound to the pillar. His servants had been treated in a similar manner, but the people of the inn released them all as soon as the robbers were out of sight. Sendivogius proceeded to Prague, and made his complaint to the emperor. An express was instantly sent off to the prince, with orders that he should deliver up Mulefels and all his plunder. The prince, fearful of the emperor's wrath, caused three large gallows to be erected in his courtyard, on the highest of which he hanged Mulefels, with another thief on each side of him. He thus perpetuated the emperor, and got rid of an ugly witness against himself. He sent back at the same time the bejeweled hat, the medal and chain, and the treatise upon the philosopher's stone, which had been stolen from Sendivogius. As regarded the powder, he said he had not seen it, and knew nothing about it. This adventure made Sendivogius more prudent. He would no longer perform the process of transmutation before any strangers, however highly recommended. He pretended also to be very poor, and sometimes lay in bed for weeks together, that people might believe he was suffering from some dangerous malady, and could not, therefore, by any possibility, be the owner of the philosopher's stone. He would occasionally coin false money, and pass it off as gold, preferring to be esteemed a cheat, rather than a successful alchemist. Many other extraordinary tales are told of this personage by his steward Bradowski, but they are not worth repeating. He died in 1636, aged upwards of 80, and was buried in his own chapel at Gravarna. Several works upon alchemy have been published under his name. End of chapter 4, part 8. Recording by Jeanne in Washington, D.C.